I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you're not speaking. Slide two, please. For media and press, the FDA press contact is April Grant. Her email is currently displayed. Slide three, please. My name is Dr. Benjamin Lebwall, and I will be chairing this meeting. I will now call the May 19th, 2023 Gastrointestinal Drugs Advisory Committee meeting to order. Dr. Jessica Su is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting and will begin with introductions. Good morning. My name is Jessica Su and I am the acting designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. We'll begin with our standing committee members and first is Dr. Assis. Hello, my name is David Assis. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine and Hepatologist at Yale School of Medicine. Thank you. Next is Dr. Chang. I am Lynn Chang, a Professor of Medicine, Gastroenterologist at UCLA. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Coffey. Hi, I'm Chris Coffey. I'm a Professor of Biostatistics at the University of Iowa. Thank you. Ms. Hugic. Excuse me, Ms. Hugic. Good morning. I'm Joy McVeigh Hugic, and I'm the consumer representative in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you. Dr. Lebwall. Benjamin Lebwall, Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at Columbia University. Thank you. Dr. Manon. Uh, Peter Manon, uh, Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Thank you. And Dr. Solga. Hi, it's Steve Solga. I'm an associate professor of clinical medicine and a transplant hepatologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. We also have our committee's industry representative, Dr. Albrecht. Good morning. My name is Helmut Albrecht. I'm currently the chief scientific officer at Alitair Pharmaceuticals and the president at H2A Associates, a pharmaceutical uh, development consulting company. Thank you. Next, we have our temporary voting members, and we'll begin with Dr. Zaja. Mark Zajer, adjunct professor of medicine and hepatologist from Emory University. Thank you. Dr. Floyd. Dr. Floyd. Hi, good morning. James Floyd, uh, physician epidemiologist from the University of Washington. Thank you. Next is Dr. Heller. Hi, Theo Heller, uh, senior clinical investigator and hepatologist at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you. Next, Dr. Hunsberger. Uh, Sally Hunsberger, biostatistician at NIAD uh, NIH. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Lee. Good morning, Brian Lee, uh, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Transplant Hepatologist at University of Southern California. Thank you. And Dr. Marr. Good morning, Jackie Marr, Professor of Medicine and Gastroenterology, University of California, San Francisco. Thank you. Dr. Raquela. Yes, uh, I'm Jorge Raquela. Um, the Professor of Medicine, Mayo Clinic in Arizona, Transplant Hepatologist. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Schwartzat? I am Jennifer Schwartzat. I'm the patient representative. Thank you. And Dr. Wilson? Yeah. Peter Wilson, Professor of Medicine, Endocrinology, Preventive Cardiology, Emory University. Thank you. We'll now move on to our FDA participants. First, we have Dr. Anania. I apologize. It, it sounds like... Um, our review division team may be having some audio issues. 
in the great room. Uh, it'll be just a moment um, while they resolve that. Dr. Frank Ennia, Acting Director, Division of Division of Hepatology and Nutrition at FDA. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Mehta. Dr. Ruby Mehta, Clinical Team Leader, Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. Thank you. And Dr. Hayashi. Dr. Hayashi, Drug-Induced Liver Injury Team Lead, Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. Thank you. And Dr. Stewart? Charmaine Stewart, Hepatologist in Division of Hepatology and Nutrition, Clinical Reviewer. Thank you. And Dr. Hager. Rebecca Hager, Statistical Team Leader, Office of Biostatistics. Thank you. And I'll return the floor to you, Dr. LeBlanc. Thank you. For topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Thus, as a gentle reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topic during breaks or lunch. Thank you. Dr. Sa will read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Lebois. The Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, is convening today's meeting of the Gastrointestinal Drugs Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees, or SGEs, or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by but not limited to those found at 18 USC section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 USC section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweighs their potential financial conflict of interest, or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, Members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for purposes of 18 USC Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves discussion of new drug application, or NDA, 212833, a acid, or OCA, 25 milligram oral tablets, submitted by Intercept Pharmaceuticals Incorporated for the treatment of pre-serotic liver fibrosis due to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH. This is a particular matters meeting during which specific matters related to Intercept Pharmaceuticals Incorporated's NDA will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, conflict of interest waivers have been issued in accordance with 18 USC section 208B3 to Drs. Benjamin Lebwal, David Assis, and Jacqueline, Jacqueline Marr. Dr. Lebwal's waiver involves his investment holdings in the healthcare sector mutual fund. Dr. Assis's waiver involves his employer's research contract for a study funded by Intercept Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, a party to the matter. 
Dr. Mars Weber involves her investment holdings in the healthcare sector mutual fund and her employer's research contract for a study funded by Intercept Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, a party to the matter. The waivers allow these individuals to participate fully in today's deliberations. FDA's reasons for issuing the waivers are described in the waiver documents, which are posted on FDA's website at www.fda.gov backslash advisory dash committees backslash committees dash and dash meeting dash materials backslash human dash drug dash advisory dash committees. Copies of the waivers may also be obtained by submitting a written request to the agency's Freedom of Information Division at 5630 Fishers Lane, room 1035 in Rockville, Maryland, 20857. Or requests may be sent via fax to 301-827-9267. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements that they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Helmut Albrecht is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Albrecht's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Albrecht is employed by H2A Associates, LLC. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you. Dr. Lebois? We will now proceed with FDA introductory remarks from Dr. Ruby Mehta. Thank you, Dr. Lavoie. Good morning to the advisory committee members, FDA colleagues, patient groups, applicant, and members of the audience. My name is Ruby Mehta, and I'm a clinical team leader in the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. On behalf of the agency, I would like to welcome you to the Gastrointestinal Diseases Advisory Committee meeting, where we will discuss the resubmission of new drug application for obertagolic acid for the treatment of adult patients with pre liver fibrosis due to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. I will now provide some brief opening remarks to begin our meeting. For the remainder of the meeting, I will refer to obertagolic acid by the acronym OCA, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis as NASH, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease by the acronym NAFLD, and drug-induced liver injury by the acronym DILI. NASH is a severe form of NAFLD and can be progressive. Histologically, NASH is characterized by the presence of fat, inflammation, and hepatocyte ballooning. NASH patients are at risk of progressing to fibrosis, cirrhosis, liver decompensation events, and may require liver transplant. Increasing fibrosis is associated with mortality. Liver-related outcomes occur at a higher rate in NASH subjects with advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. NAFLD and NASH progress slowly. NASH is associated with type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and obesity. Patients with NASH are more likely to die from cardiovascular disease or non-hepatic malignancy than from liver-related events. In the United States, estimated prevalence of NASH is about 17 million people. And of these, 6 to 8 million people are expected to have NASH with stage 2 or 3 fibrosis. Currently, there are no FDA-approved pharmacological treatments for NASH in the U.S., and NASH remains an unmet medical need. OCA is a synthetic bile acid and a derivative of quinodeoxycholic acid and functions as agonist at the Farnesoid X receptor. The Farnesoid X receptor is a nuclear receptor and regulates bile acid biosynthesis. It influences the metabolic pathways, including glucose and lipid regulation. OCA promotes cholesterol saturation in the bile, thereby promoting gallstone formation. In the diet-induced fatty liver disease mouse model, OCA-treated mice demonstrated improvement in liver inflammation and fibrosis. 
The applicant has proposed the treatment indication as OCA for the treatment of adult patients with pre serotic liver fibrosis due to NASH. The proposed dosage regimen for which the applicant is seeking approval is OCA 25 milligram. The proposed approval pathway is accelerated approval based on histological surrogate endpoint. Switching gears, I will now discuss briefly the two regulatory pathways for drug approval. Traditional approval considers how a patient feels, functions, or survives, or it is based on a validated surrogate endpoint, such as systolic blood pressure. Accelerated approval allows for earlier approval of drugs to fulfill an unmet medical need for serious or life-threatening condition. Accelerated approval can be based on a surrogate endpoint. For this application, we will be discussing accelerated approval pathway, and my colleague, Dr. Hager, will discuss the regulatory pathway in more detail. In 2018, FDA posted a draft guidance for the industry developing drugs for treatment in non serotic NASH with liver fibrosis. FDA has accepted the following surrogate endpoints as reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit in NASH with stage 2 or 3 fibrosis. And these endpoints were pre specified in the phase 3 trial by the applicant. The first is improvement of fibrosis by one or more stage and no worsening of NASH. The second is resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis. An applicant can demonstrate efficacy on either or both endpoints to support an accelerated approval. I will now provide a brief regulatory history of OCA intended to treat NASH. The opening IND was submitted in 2010 under which a phase two double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial, also known as the Flint trial, was conducted by the NASH Clinical Research Network. The trial enrolled whole spectrum of NASH population, including definite NASH and indeterminate NASH, and fibrosis stages ranging from zero to four. The primary endpoint differed from the ones discussed on the previous slide. Based on the efficacy results of NASH trial, the applicant received breakthrough resignation in January 2015. Breakthrough resignation confers the advantage of obtaining intensive guidance for efficient drug development. The phase three trial, which is the focus of today's discussion, was initiated in 2015. In June 2017, the FDA communicated a safety issue when a patient enrolled in phase two trial died due to multi-organ failure soon after developing severe cholestatic liver injury. This led to safety amendment in phase three protocol. A stringent drug-induced liver injury algorithm requiring close monitoring and daily evaluation and triggers for treatment interruption and discontinuation were pre-specified. The safety amendment also allowed for drug discontinuation for liver decompensation and other safety issues, for example, intercurrent illness were specified. In summary, there were challenges during the drug development program requiring major protocol amendment. The applicant submitted the new drug application in September 2019, seeking approval for the treatment of adult patients with pre serotic liver fibrosis due to NASH. Following the application review, the agency determined that the potential benefit of drugs, drug based on assessment of surrogate endpoint, did not outweigh the risks. We issued a complete response letter. A complete response letter is a regulatory do document that notifies the applicant that the submission cannot be approved in its current form and describes the deficiencies identified during the review. I will now describe in the next two slides the reason for complete response. Regarding the efficacy assessment for the original NDA review, OCA 25 milligram met the surrogate endpoint of one stage reduction in fibrosis with no worsening of NASH. There was a statistically significant treatment difference between OCA 25 milligram relative to placebo of 11.1%. OCA 25 milligram failed to meet the second surrogate endpoint of NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis. OCA 10 milligram failed to meet either surrogate endpoint. Safety concerns identified in the complete response letter that occurred in greater number of OCA-treated subjects relative to placebo included 
serious drug-induced liver injury as a result, including one case requiring liver transplant, polylithiasis and related complications, acceleration of conversion to diabetes or prediabetes in normal glycemic subjects, and hastening of loss of glycemic control in diabetic subjects, worsening of LDL cholesterol that did not spontaneously resolve and required initiation or intensification of statin therapy, and pruritus requiring symptomatic treatment, treatment interruption, or OC discontinuation. In the complete response letter, the agency encouraged the applicant to complete the ongoing pivotal trial before resubmitting the NDA. That is, to complete the clinical outcomes portion of the trial so that benefits could be weighed against the risks. However, because of the breakthrough designation and unmet medical need, FDA remained open to reviewing the current resubmission based on histopathologic endpoints or surrogate endpoint along with additional safety data. FDA recommended reanalysis of histopathology utilizing a consensus read approach due to a higher rate of pathologist discordance in the original submission. You will hear from my colleague, Dr. Hager, that the assessment of efficacy on histology has largely remained unchanged from the original submission. The safety data available in the resubmission now includes, one, safety information in additional subjects, and two, additional information on subjects included in the original submission. This additional safety information has resulted in more precise estimates of the risk concerns identified in the ori original submission. Today we are asking your expert scientific advice regarding the benefits and risks of OCA 25 milligram for the treatment of NASH patients with stage two or three fibrosis. In your deliberations, we would like you to discuss some of the key topics listed here. Although OCA 25 milligram has modest efficacy on histopathology as a surrogate endpoint for the treatment of NASH with stage two or three fibrosis, the extent of clinical benefit is unknown. Safety remains a major concern with serious risks associated with OCA 25 milligram use. One of the most concerning risks is DILI, which has a long latency period, and then there are concerns surrounding the feasibility of mitigating DILI in clinical practice. You will hear a discussion of DILI from Dr. Hayashi. It is also important to consider how healthcare practitioners will manage additional safety concerns that will require additional monitoring and additional medical therapies. Another challenge is to identify appropriate subset of NASH population that is stage two or three fibrosis. Subjects with cirrhosis, NASH cirrhosis should not be given OCA because OCA failed to demonstrate efficacy in NASH cirrhosis. Therefore, there is no benefit with OCA treatment. Moreover, with increasing fibrosis, OCA-associated adverse events also increase, potentially related to higher intrahepatic expo OCA exposure. Because of the unfavorable benefit risk profile of OCA in cirrhotic NASH subjects, once OCA treatment is initiated, patients must undergo periodic assessment to detect progression to cirrhosis so that OCA can be discontinued in a timely manner. Because there is no reasonable expectation of benefit that could be balanced against the potential risks. Identifying the time point at which the patient transitions from a pre cirrhotic stage three fibrosis to stage four fibrosis may be challenging. Non-invasive tests or NITs are available for use in the clinical practice. However, NITs are not accurate in distinguishing between stage three fibrosis and cirrhosis. The benefit risk profile of OCA 25 milligram in patients with NASH and stage two and three fibrosis still remains concerning. Before I conclude my opening remarks, I would like to share the questions which we will be asking you to discuss this afternoon. I will go over them now, and Dr. Anania will present these questions again during, during the charge to the committee. Discussion question one. Discuss the strength of available efficacy data on the histopathologic endpoint, a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, 
in NASH patients with stage 2 or 3 fibrosis treated with OCA 25 mg. 2. Based on the data presented concerning cholestatic delay in OCA treated patients, discuss whether periodic liver enzyme monitoring could mitigate the risk of delay. 2. The frequency of such monitoring. And 3. What stopping criteria should be developed to aid clinicians' decision to discontinue treatment? The next two questions are voting question. 1. Given the available efficacy and safety data, do the benefits of OCA 25 mg outweigh the risks in NASH patients with stage 2 or 3 fibrosis? Vote yes, no, or abstain. Provide your rationale for your vote. Second voting question. Clinical outcome events in patients enrolled in trial 747303 will continue to be captured to evaluate clinical benefit in support of a future application for traditional approval. At present, which of the following would you recommend? A, approval of OCA 25 milligram at this time under the accelerated approval pathway based on efficacy data on histologic surrogate endpoint and available clinical safety data. Or B, defer approval until clinical outcome data from trial 747303 are submitted and reviewed, at which time the traditional approval pathway could be considered. Select either A or B or abstain. Provide the rationale for your vote. Thank you for your attention. I will now turn the meeting back to Dr. Lapwal to proceed with today's meeting. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages all participants, including the applicant's non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the applicant, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honoraria, and interests in the applicant, including equity interests and those based on the outcome of the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentation to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. We will now proceed with Intercept Pharmaceuticals presentation. Good morning. My name is Dr. Michelle Berry. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and President of Research and Development at Intercept Pharmaceuticals, and I will introduce our beta-cholic acid program this morning. Before we begin, I'd like to offer my sincere appreciation to the hundreds of clinical investigators, staff, and to the thousands of participating patients who have made our OCA for NASH fibrosis program possible. After my introduction, Dr. Chris Cowdley will speak to the medical need. Dr. Rohit Lumba will address the use of non-invasive tests to diagnose and monitor NASH. Dr. Tom Kaposa will provide an overview of the efficacy of OCA. Dr. Singita Sani will review OCA's safety profile. And Dr. Arun Sanyal will provide his clinical perspective. Four additional experts will be available to address your questions. They have been compensated for their time, but have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. We first evaluated a beta-cholic acid, OCA, in primary biliary cholangitis, a rare cholestatic liver disease. OCA is a synthetic bile acid and a potent FXR agonist with confirmed antifibrotic effect. In 2016, FDA granted OCA accelerated approval as Ocaliva in PBC, and it has been approved in over 40 countries. The five or 10 milligram dose is consistent with exposures achieved with 25 milligrams in NASH. Ocaliva was initially indicated across the entire spectrum of PBC, including decompensated cirrhosis. In 2021, our label was updated after hepatic safety events were reported in patients with advanced liver disease. We contraindicated patients with clinically significant portal hypertension or decompensation and added stopping rules to the label. 
we have since shown a significant decrease in the number of hepatic events reported. We have also been able to restrict prescribers to hepatologists and gastroenterologists who care for patients with PBC. We've accumulated more than 30,000 patient years of experience in patients with PBC, and through that long-term real-world experience, we have demonstrated improved transplant-free survival with OCA. Just prior to the PBC approval in 2016, the Flint study in NASH reported out with the first evidence of an antifibrotic benefit in NASH, recognized by the FDA with breakthrough therapy designation. We worked closely with the FDA to design study 303 as a single registrational trial in pre-serotic NASH. A second study, study 304, was conducted in patients with compensated cirrhosis due to NASH. Although the efficacy endpoint was not achieved, the safety from study 304 is important as there were no irreversible cases of liver injury in patients with cirrhosis taking OCA 25 milligrams. The combined programs in PBC and NASH have provided a robust safety database of 40,000 patient years through clinical trials and post-marketing data. Our proposed indication is for the treatment of adults with pre serotic liver fibrosis due to NASH with a recommended oral dosage of 25 milligrams once daily. Patients with cirrhosis, portal hypertension, or hepatic decompensation are contraindicated. OCA is not a perfect drug. It has safety concerns that require monitoring and management by specialists, hepatologists and gastroenterologists, which we have recommended and successfully implemented in PBC. We propose non-invasive tests be used for patient identification, for monitoring of safety, and to identify patients with progression to cirrhosis. We have also proposed enhanced pharmacovigilance and stopping rules for safety or disease progression, and we'll continue to work with the agency on details. The goal of therapy in NASH is to prevent progression to cirrhosis. Continued progression of fibrosis results in cirrhosis, the natural history of disease. An ideal antifibrotic response would show reversal of fibrosis by a full stage. This degree of change in fibrosis has resulted in lower rates of hepatic outcome events and mortality. Although these responses are correlated with improved outcomes, it is also clear that halting or stabilizing fibrosis is a success. A patient with stage three fibrosis who can remain at stage three without progressing to cirrhosis is a success. Study 303 was designed together with the FDA to determine the proportion of subjects who can avoid progression to cirrhosis. The study has been fully enrolled since September 2019 and is anticipated to require at least another three years to accumulate the outcomes needed for full approval. The composite event endpoint that will determine if fewer patients on OCA 25 milligrams are progressing to cirrhosis is events-driven. We anticipate a majority of this composite endpoint will be comprised of progression to cirrhosis on the month 48 or end of study biopsy or by assessment of non-invasive tests. In December 2018, FDA issued draft guidance for development of therapeutics for NASH. Fibrosis is considered the strongest predictor of adverse clinical outcomes, including all cause and liver-related death. The ultimate goal of NASH treatment is to slow, halt, or reverse disease progression and improve clinical outcomes. Because of the slow progression of NASH and the time required to accrue clinical endpoints, the FDA recommends histologic improvements in liver biopsies as surrogate endpoints reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. The efficacy discussion today is focused on the 18-month liver biopsy, the pre-specified interim analysis population of 931 subjects agreed with the FDA. Improved fibrosis stage at month 18 is capturing those patients least likely to progress to cirrhosis, those with a reversal of disease, 
but does not capture those with halting or slowing of progression. The month 18 interim analysis pre-specified two alternate primary endpoints based on histology and an agreement with the agency. Importantly, study success required only one of these two primary endpoints to be met. The fibrosis primary endpoint assessed the proportion of patients with an improvement of at least one full stage in fibrosis with no worsening of steatohepatitis, which was mandated by the FDA as no worsening in any of the three NAFLD activity score parameters. I'd like to address three main topics highlighted by FDA, starting with FDA's characterization of OCA's efficacy as modest with uncertainty regarding the translation to clinical outcomes. Although we have alignment that statistical significance can be discussed only for the pre-specified ITT old population of 931 patients, FDA's briefing book has included an 8.6 treatment effect from the post hoc ITT histology population who were included only for assessments of safety and outcomes. FDA questions whether the 13% treatment difference on the primary fibrosis endpoint is clinically meaningful. The regulatory endpoint underestimates the clinical benefit observed in patients on OCA 25 milligrams. It requires a full stage reversal of fibrosis without worsening of NASH within 18 months and excludes patients who were able to halt or stabilize disease progression. Non-invasive tests show improvements in hepatocellular injury in OCA patients without the full stage in fibrosis improvement on histology. Subjects receiving OCA 25 milligrams are providing evidence that we are achieving the goal of therapy to halt, slow, or reverse the progression of fibrosis. The second issue we will address is hepatic safety. We have seen cases of liver injury in the first 12 months after drug initiation. Two cases cited by the FDA as irreversible provide the basis of the 18-fold higher rate of events as a reason to not approve OCA for NASH. We will review our mitigation proposals, which likely would have avoided these two cases of hepatic injury. As I illustrated earlier, Intercept has successfully implemented contraindications, monitoring paradigms, and ability to interrupt dosing of OCA in PBC with these same specialists, with a significant decrease in the rate of hepatic safety events. And finally, we believe that most gastroenterologists and hepatologists do have the expertise to monitor and manage disease progression and potential DILI. The final issue for today, we believe appropriate patients can be identified for treatment with OCA using non-invasive tests. Multiple guidelines have now been published demonstrating the utility of non-invasive tests to identify and manage patients with fibrosis due to NASH without liver biopsy. Specific monitoring implemented in study 303 and proposed for labeling recommends visits at one month every three months for the first 12 to 18 months of therapy and every six months thereafter. Drug holidays would be mandatory for acute illness, hospitalizations, or investigations of potential liver injury. Stopping rules for permanent discontinuation would be mandated in patients with evidence of progression to, of disease by non-invasive tests or clinical signs and symptoms. We've seen the GI treating community successfully and safely adopt new treatment paradigms, which Dr. Sanya will address. Today you will hear that OCA has demonstrated a positive benefit risk that fulfills the requirements for accelerated approval. First, patients with pre serotic fibrosis due to NASH are facing a life-threatening disease with no available therapy that is able to be diagnosed and monitored using non-invasive tests. Second, OCA has demonstrated a clinically meaningful, dose-dependent antifibrotic benefit that has been confirmed by two independent biopsy reading methodologies in study 303. The regulatory primary endpoint underestimates benefit. Third, we now know fibrosis stage is the single strongest predictor of liver-specific and all-cause mortality 
in individuals living with NASH. Thus, halting or reversing fibrosis are both reasonably likely to reduce outcomes. Study 303 is fully enrolled and progressing toward clinical outcomes. And finally, OCA safety and tolerability are well characterized. Our proposed USPI provides guidance on patient monitoring with routine tests that would allow hepatologists and gastroenterologists to safely prescribe OCA. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Chris Cowdley. Thank you, Dr. Berry. My name is Chris Cowdley. I'm director of the Liber Institute Northwest and professor at Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine, Washington State University. I've conducted research in and cared for patients with NASH for more than 25 years. I am being compensated for my time, but have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. NASH is a serious liver disease. As I will discuss shortly, there is high morbidity and mortality, and it is now the second leading cause of liver transplant in the United States. In addition, we know NASH is on the rise due to its associated comorbidities, including obesity and other cardiovascular risk factors. The estimated number of cases of NAFLD is expected to increase to 128 million by 2040. And similarly, the number of cases of NASH, the more serious form of NAFLD, is expected to increase to 39 million during the same time period. NASH is a progressive disease. As shown in this figure, 30% of NAFLD patients progress to NASH, which affects 26 million Americans. As highlighted in yellow, Stages two and three are indicative of clinically significant fibrosis, and 8 million Americans fall into this category. 2.5 million Americans will further progress to stage four for cirrhosis. Once cirrhosis develops, there's an increased risk of liver cancer, risk of decompensation of liver disease, liver transplantation, and death. Furthermore, the diagnosis of cirrhosis is accompanied with decreased quality of life, added stress due to the fear of cancer and complications, and functional impairment. Preventing progression to cirrhosis is therefore critically important, and patients with clinically significant fibrosis represent the optimum population for intervention. It is now very clear that it is fibrosis stage and not NASH that predicts mortality and liver outcomes. This was shown in the landmark paper by Hagstrom, was confirmed in a recent large systematic review and meta-analysis by Eng, and more importantly, in the prospective study of outcomes from the NASH Clinical Research Network. In the retrospective cohort study, we see a stepwise increase in overall mortality risk as fibrosis stage progresses from F0 to F1, F2, and F3, with a remarkably increased risk in patients with F4 fibrosis or cirrhosis, shown in the black dotted line. A recent meta-analysis by Taylor et al. depicts the risk ratio for all cause mortality on the left, liver-related mortality in the middle, and liver events on the right, comparing patients with F0 versus F2 in yellow, F0 versus F3 in red, and F0 versus F4 in black. All three risk categories increase by fibrosis stage. However, the increase is even more dramatic as patients move through each stage for liver-related mortality and events. This is largely due to liver-related risks becoming more frequent compared to cardiovascular risks in patients with F2 or higher fibrosis. Even more compelling are prospective data from the NASH CRN confirming the increased risk of decompensation and all-cause mortality by fibrosis stage of F2 or higher. Therefore, our treatment goal is to reverse or halt progression of clinically significant fibrosis. And we now have emerging data confirming that reversal of fibrosis reduces the rate of hepatic events and death. Shown here is a combined analysis of over, over 1,100 patients with compensated cirrhosis due to NASH from two large randomized placebo-controlled studies of investigational agents. Although these therapies were not effective, the data show the impact of fibrosis regression during the median 16 months of follow-up, 69 events occurred in patients without fibrosis improvement compared with only two events in patients whose fibrosis had improved. 
This represents a greater than six-fold reduction in liver-related events and death. As I previously discussed, we have known for some time that increasing fibrosis stage is associated with worsening outcomes. And more importantly, we now see that reversal of fibrosis stage is also associated with improvement in outcomes. As I mentioned, our goal is to intervene in patients with clinically significant fibrosis to prevent progression to cirrhosis by halting or reversing fibrosis stage. Unfortunately, 20 to 25% of patients with F3 fibrosis will progress rapidly to cirrhosis within two and a half to four years without effective therapy. This would predict 23,000 deaths per year among those who have cirrhosis. Despite the urgency of the unmet need in NASH, we currently have limited management options for our patients. Lifestyle modification aimed at weight loss is recommended as first-line therapy. However, very few patients successfully achieve the 10% weight loss needed to improve fibrosis. Bariatric surgery may be an option for individuals who meet criteria, but it is a major surgery with associated risks. Liver transplantation is an option of last resort. However, many patients are not candidates for transplant due to multiple comorbidities, and there is a high incidence of recurrence of NASH post-transplantation. Finally, while some therapies such as GLP-1 analogs are currently being used in the absence of FDA-approved therapies, none have definitively been shown to reverse clinically significant fibrosis, which we know is the most important predictor of adverse liver outcomes. In summary, clinically significant fibrosis leads to adverse liver outcomes. NASH alone without fibrosis is not associated with adverse liver outcomes. We now see that reversal of fibrosis improves outcomes. Therefore, there is an urgent, unmet need for an effective antifibrotic therapy that can reverse or halt progression of fibrosis in patients with NASH. If such a therapy were available today, it would meaningfully improve the lives of my patients. Thank you very much. I'd like to now hand off to Dr. Lumba. Thank you, Dr. Cowdley. I'm Rohit Lumba, Director of NAFLDE Research Center and Professor of Medicine at the University of California at San Diego. I'm being compensated for my time, but have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. I will discuss the current practice guidance for non-invasive tests, also known as the NITs, and how they are already used in clinical practice. I will also discuss some new data addressing the specific question of non-invasive identification of patients with pre fibrosis due to NASH with high specificity. NITs have been routinely used by hepatologists and gastroenterologists to risk stratify patients for treatment, identify patients who have cirrhosis, and monitor disease progression. I serve on the ASLD NAFLD Practice Guidance Writing Committee, and we recently updated the guidance on clinical assessment and management of NAFLD using NITs. NITs are preferred over liver biopsy by both patients and their providers. They're easily accessible and thus allow for serial or frequent monitoring. The ASLD practice guidance recommends a sequential NID approach for risk stratification. For example, to identify low-risk patients who do not need referral or high-risk patients likely to have cirrhosis. We first use FIB4, which is calculated using ALT, AST, platelets, and H. Specificity is increased with the use of a second NIT, such as a transient elastography on a fiber scan machine or a blood test called ELF. This allows us to appropriately risk stratify our patients as either low or high risk, leaving only a small number of patients who require additional testing, such as MRE, MRI, or liver biopsy. This sequential NID approach is also endorsed in guidelines published by several professional societies, including the ASLD, AACE, ACG, and the AGA. I would now like to show you how an NIT-based algorithm can be applied to identify patients with stage two or stage three fibrosis within a population of patients with NASH across all stages of fibrosis based upon a recent analysis. We believe that the population to which this NIT algorithm was applied includes the majority of patients suspected to have 
stage two or stage three fibrosis due to NASH. I will describe on the next slide the results of this analysis, which has been accepted for a presentation at EASL and is based upon data from approximately 6,000 patients screened in two phase three studies. As shown on the left, the approach requires FIP4 between 1.3 and 2.67, followed by either a fibro scan or ELF inclusive of the upper and lower bound cutoffs as shown on the slide. Furthermore, patients with low platelets, low albumin, or a high conjugated bilirubin are excluded. This NID algorithm has a high specificity of 91% for identifying stage two or stage three fibrosis with a high positive predictive value. Of note, this approach enriches for patients with stage three, which represents 65% of the identified patients. Thus, this algorithm can reliably identify patients with pre cirrhotic fibrosis due to NASH. As Dr. Cowley showed you, fibrosis stage predicts mortality in patients with NASH when assessed by liver biopsy. Here we show that NITs such as FIB4, ELF, and transient elastography are also independent predictors of mortality. This reinforces the utility of NITs in risk stratification and once again, underscores the urgent need for a treatment that can halt, reverse, or slow the progression of fibrosis due to NASH. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to turn the podium over to Dr. Tom Kaposa. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lumba. Good morning. My name is Tom Kaposa. I'm a hepatologist and an executive director of clinical research at Intercept Pharmaceuticals, and I will present our efficacy data today. Our NASH clinical development program has shown treatment with OCA 25 milligrams results in clinically meaningful antifibrotic effects. This benefit was first established in Flint, a phase two study, and now confirmed twice in our pivotal phase three study 303 using two different biopsy read methodologies. The goal of therapy is to slow, halt, or reverse disease progression. As such, the regulatory primary fibrosis endpoint underestimates benefit. OCA 25 milligrams not only meets the primary fibrosis endpoint of reversal at 18 months, but also attenuates fibrosis progression, as well as improves non-invasive tests in patients with no change in fibrosis stage. This antifibrotic effect is highly likely to lead to clinical benefit because we now know that liver fibrosis is the strongest predictor of clinical outcomes in NASH. To set the stage for how efficacy was assessed, I'd like to review the NASH Clinical Research Network or CRN scoring system for evaluating biopsies. There are two major domains. On the left, the NAFLD activity score or NAS reflects the degree of steatohepatitis. The NAS is the sum of three parameters which grade hepatic steatosis, lobular inflammation, and hepatocellular ballooning. On the right, the fibrosis score characterizes the degree of fibrosis and is based on a five point ordinal scale from zero to four. Stages two and three are consistent with what we are referring to as pre serotic fibrosis due to NASH. Turning now to study 303, eligible patients had to have biopsy confirmed steatohepatitis and pre serotic fibrosis due to NASH with a fibrosis stage of two or three as scored by the central pathologist and a NAFLD activity score of at least four with at least one point in each of the three parameters to identify sufficient baseline steatohepatitis. In addition, there were several notable exclusion criteria, including significant weight fluctuations during the three months prior to study entry, a current or recent history of significant alcohol consumption, other known chronic liver disease, or the presence of cirrhosis, and any recent history of a significant atherosclerotic cardiovascular event within one year of study entry. Study 303 was fully enrolled in September 2019 and is an ongoing randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. The pre-specified month 18 interim analysis for accelerated approval is shown in the gray box. Patients with NASH and fibrosis stage two or three were randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one fashion to placebo shown in dark gray, OCA-10 in light blue, or OCA-25 milligrams in teal green. The 25 milligram dose for study 303 was carried forward based on the results from the phase two Flint trial. The study treatment duration for the interim analysis was 18 months. The clinical outcome portions of the tr trial are ongoing as the study is event-driven. 
As presented by Dr. Berry, the month 18 interim analysis pre-specified two primary endpoints based on histology. In agreement with the FDA and consistent with their current draft guidance, study success required only one of these two primary endpoints be met. The fibrosis primary endpoint assessed the proportion of patients with an improvement by at least one full stage in fibrosis with no worsening in NASH, and as mandated by the FDA was defined as no worsening in any of the three NAS parameters. This definition is the most stringent interpretation of the regulatory fibrosis endpoint. The steatohepatitis primary endpoint reflects the proportion of patients with resolution of NASH with no worsening of fibrosis. As I noted earlier, study 303 is ongoing with the primary end of study endpoint, a composite of clinical outcome events, including all cause mortality, liver transplantation, hepatic decompensation, or any progression to cirrhosis. Here we see the disposition for the 931 patients included in the original month 18 interim analysis, referred to as the ITT old population. This is the same population analyzed for both the original central read and the new consensus read. Placebo is shown on the left, OCA 10 in the middle, and OCA 25 milligrams on the right. The overall discontinuation rate was similar across the three treatment groups. A numerically greater number of OCA 25 treated patients discontinued due to an adverse event, while a greater number of those in placebo and OCA 10 withdrew consent. Of the original 931 who remained ongoing in the study shown along the bottom, a small percentage discontinued treatment, but agreed to remain in the study to be followed for clinical outcomes. At baseline, patient characteristics including age, sex, race, ethnicity, BMI, and the presence of type 2 diabetes were balanced across the treatment groups. Baseline clinical characteristics were also balanced across the treatment groups and are reflective of our target population for treatment. More than half of the patients were read as fibrosis stage 3, and as expected, there was a significant degree of NASH disease activity, as shown by the NAS and liver biochemistries. As discussed by Dr. Lumba, transient elastography, FIB4, and ELF are non-invasive biomarkers of fibrosis, and these were also consistent with our target population. Turning to the month 18 interim analysis, scoring of the liver biopsies for the original NDA was performed centrally in a blinded manner by two pathologists with expertise in NASH. Concerns were raised about interreader discordance, most evident on the NAS parameters, and this led to potential uncertainty with respect to the positive efficacy results. After subsequent discussions with the agency, it was agreed that Intercept would reread and reanalyze the same biopsies using a consensus method approach in alignment with the updated recommendations for NASH clinical trials. Now, before I review our primary endpoint results, I'd like to highlight a few key statistical considerations. The strategy to control for multiplicity for the pre-specified month 18 interim analysis only applies to the original submission of 931 patients in the ITT old population using the central read methodology. The consensus read methodology confirms the efficacy results of the original reads. However, reported p-values are nominal. And the ITT histology population is only supportive as it was not pre-specified. Importantly, for all primary endpoint analyses, patients with missing biopsies were treated as non-responders. Here are the results of the fibrosis primary endpoint from the month 18 interim analysis. The original central method is on the left and the consensus method is on the right. As you can see, the results of the two analyses are highly consistent. OCA 25 milligrams met the pre-specified interim analysis primary endpoint for accelerated approval. We see a dose-dependent antifibrotic response with both reading methods with a statistically significant p-value for the OCA 25 milligram group from the original central read which was confirmed with the consensus read approach. Both analyses showed a doubling of the treatment effect for OCA 25 milligrams compared to placebo with an 11.1 to 12.8% treatment difference. Looking at the steatohepatitis primary endpoint, the results are again consistent across both methods where the proportion of responders in both OCA doses was numerically higher than placebo. However, the treatment effect from the original interim analysis was not statistically significant for OCA. Of note, I will only show the consensus method for histology results for the remainder of my presentation, as it is now the recommended approach for NASH clinical trials. Here we show the antifibrotic benefit of OCA 25 milligrams was generally consistent across key baseline demographics, 
As you can see, the point estimates for OCA25 are all to the right of one for age, sex, race, and ethnicity. Here we show the treatment effect was also seen across disease characteristics of note, such as BMI, diabetes status, and statin use. Overall, the response to OCA25 milligrams was consistent across these subgroups. Since, the fibrosis, since fibrosis is the best predictor of clinical outcomes, I'd now like to review the fibrosis results of OCA25 independent of NASH. For reference, the primary regulatory endpoint is on the left with missing biopsies considered non-responders. In the middle for the same ITT old population, now independent of NASH, 30% of patients achieved at least a full stage of improvement in fibrosis with a treatment difference of 14%. And on the right, in patients with biopsies available at both baseline and month 18, we see 37% of patients on OCA with improvement in fibrosis and a treatment difference of 17%. Now let's look at the same patient shown on the right by fibrosis stage at baseline. For baseline fibrosis stage two, the treatment difference for OCA 25 milligrams is 11%. For baseline fibrosis stage three, the treatment difference doubles to 22%. The treatment difference is particularly important because these patients are at the highest near-term risk of progression to cirrhosis. Now recall that the regulatory primary fibrosis endpoint only captures reversal of fibrosis by at least one full stage. However, the goal of therapy in NASH is not only to reverse progression, but also to slow or halt progression. Therefore, a patient who stabilizes and does not progress towards cirrhosis is a success. Shown here is the proportion of patients that did not progress on OCA. On the left, we see fewer patients who worsened fibrosis stage on OCA 25 milligrams compared to placebo, indicative of halting of progression. And on the right, we see a greater proportion of patients with at least one full stage of improvement in fibrosis, indicative of reversal. Collectively, we see less progression and more reversal, again, suggesting the antifibrotic benefit of OCA 25 milligrams is underestimated by the primary regulatory endpoint. Next, let's look at the group with no change in histologic fibrosis stage at month 18. As we would expect after only 18 months, many of the patients with available biopsies at baseline and post baseline remained in the same histologic fibrosis stage. With NITs, we see evidence of a benefit with OCA beyond histologic stage. Improvements in liver stiffness as measured by transient elastography are shown on the left, and improvements in ALT are shown on the right. Despite being counted as non-responders in the regulatory primary fibrosis endpoint at month 18, more patients on OCA are moving in the right direction towards clinical benefit. Turning back to the overall ITT old population, here we show the least squares mean change from baseline liver stiffness. On the left, at month 18, OCA 25 milligrams improved liver stiffness by an LS mean of 1.6 kilopascals compared to a one kilopascal worsening in placebo. On the right, at month 48, treatment with OCA 25 milligram also shows improvement in liver stiffness, specifically by an LS mean reduction of 2.2 kilopascals. This dose-dependent trend of improvement in liver stiffness at month 18 and at month 48 is again supportive of OCA's antifibrotic activity. Lastly, looking at ALT in the overall ITT population, at month 18, there is an LS mean reduction of 31 units per liter from baseline for OCA 25 milligrams, with a mean treatment difference of 17 units per liter over placebo. And at month 48, the pattern of ALT reduction is consistent. In addition, as shown in our briefing document, a similar pattern of reduction was observed for AST and GGT. Overall, this demonstrates an additional beneficial effect of OCA on hepatocellular injury at month 18 and at month 48. In summary, we have shown a statistically significant antifibrotic effect for OCA 25 milligrams in the original analysis on a stringent regulatory endpoint of fibrosis improvement by greater than or equal to one stage with no worsening in any of the NAFLD activity score components. A 12 to 13% treatment effect at month 18 was confirmed by the consensus method. This is clinically meaningful because fibrosis stage is the strongest predictor of clinical outcomes. The regulatory primary fibrosis endpoint underestimates the overall benefit because in addition to reversing fibrosis, the goal of therapy is also to slow the progress of or halt disease progression. We have shown that fewer patients on OCA 25 milligram have worsening of fibrosis stage at 18 months. 
And NIT suggests not only a positive impact on fibrosis, but also a positive impact on hepatocellular injury in patients with no change in fibrosis stage. The totality of data show a clear antifibrotic effect of OCA 25 milligrams, which is likely to predict clinical benefit. I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. Sangeet Dasani. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Sangeet Dasani, Vice President for Clinical Development at Intercept Pharmaceuticals, and I will present our safety data. I will cover a description of the safety population, the overall safety profile for OCA, key safety topics as noted here, our risk management plan, and finally, an overall summary of our safety findings. Let's start with the safety population and the overall safety profile. The safety population includes pooled data from 2,860 patients across three long-term placebo control studies in patients with pre-serotic NASH and provides the most comprehensive assessment for safety. The ongoing study 303 as seen on the left contributes the majority of the patients with approximately 90% of safety exposure and therefore, we will present safety data from study 303 in this presentation. The new safety data set now has long-term exposure up to six years, which represents a three-fold increase since the original NDA submission. With a median exposure of 39 months and approximately 700 patients with four or more years of exposure to OCA, this data set allows an adequate characterization of OCA safety profile. Consistent with good pharmacovigilance practice, data for all adverse events is treatment emergent, meaning onset date after initiation of investigational product, referred to as IP, up to 30 days from last dose of IP. For cardiovascular events, data is presented for on study, meaning with onset date after initiation of IP up to the data snapshot. As Dr. Cowdley shared earlier, Patients with NASH have many comorbidities related to metabolic syndrome. Consistent with this observation, 90% of patients in study 303 met criteria for metabolic syndrome at baseline, which requires use of multiple concomitant medications. These are important when interpreting the safety findings. Throughout my presentation, we will show placebo data on the left, OCA 10 milligrams in the middle, and OCA 25 milligrams on the right. Type 2 diabetes, Obesity, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia are each reported in over half of all patients. In addition, 12% of patients reported a history of cardiac disorder, and 20% reported a history of gallstones or renal disorder. Most patients across all treatment groups, including placebo, reported an adverse event, as shown in the summary table. A higher proportion of patients in the OCA 25 milligram group experienced an adverse event which led to discontinuation, which was mostly due to pruritus. Of note, these data reflect a median exposure of 39 months. I will cover serious adverse events and deaths in more detail shortly. Pruritus is a well-characterized adverse drug reaction of OCA. The study 303 protocol mandated IP discontinuation for grade three pruritus. And importantly, analyses for patient-reported outcomes showed similar scores in patients with or without pruritus, indicating that it did not negatively impact quality of life. Here we see the most frequently reported serious adverse events by system organ and class and preferred term, where the rate was higher in the OCA 25 milligram group compared to placebo. SAEs were reported in 22% patients in the placebo group compared to 26% in the OCA 25 milligram group. The higher proportion of serious adverse events in the OCA 25 milligram group was related to acute kidney injury, cholecystitis, pruritus, UTI, and diabetes events, which I will cover in more detail later in the presentation. Here are the adverse events leading to death, summarized for on treatment plus 30 days. With approximately 8,000 patient years of exposure, a total of 27 deaths were reported, including 8, 9, and 10 in the placebo OCA-10 and OCA-25 milligram groups, respectively. Of note, there was no clear treatment-related pattern for underlying etiology. Off-treatment adverse events leading to death, i.e., which occurred more than 30 days from last dose of IP, are shown here. And again, no clear treatment-related pattern for etiology was observed. 
For the remainder of my presentation, I will focus on key safety topics. These events were selected based on OCA's mechanism of action, underlying comorbidities in patients with fibrosis due to NASH, as well as our prior experience with OCA in PVC. Before I review each safety topic in detail, I'd like to provide an overall snapshot for these events, focusing on risk difference between OCA 25 milligrams and placebo. Rates for each event are shown on the left, with risk difference for OCA 25 milligram compared to placebo shown on the right. Pruritus, dyslipidemia, and gallstone-related events are the most common adverse events, and all three are described as an adverse drug reaction in our proposed label. No increase in risk was observed for hyperglycemia, urolithiasis, or pancreatitis based on the updated data. The FDA briefing document notes risk of dysglycemia with OCA, which I will review in detail during my discussion of hyperglycemia events. Adjudicated data are shown here for the three safety events for which detailed, blinded, independent adjudication committees were organized. Rates for hepatic, cardiovascular, and acute kidney injury events were low overall, but higher in the OCA 25 milligram group compared to placebo. I will describe our proposed risk management plan for these important events later in my presentation. Turning now to our detailed review, I'll start with hepatic safety. As Dr. Berry noted, study 303 was initiated in late 2015. In 2017, a safety amendment was implemented following two serious hepatic events. One fatal event was reported in the long-term extension phase of study 209, a phase two study which included patients with cirrhosis, and one event resulted in a liver transplant in a patient enrolled in study 303. Although not referenced in the FDA's briefing document, Intercept and FDA collaborated on a safety amendment based on standard clinical and lab criteria. This was implemented in study 303 and led to a marked decrease in potential hepatic safety events, especially severe events. Of note, 50% of patients in study 303 were randomized after the 2017 amendment. Here we see the protocol specified monitoring measures pre and post 2017 amendment. In the post amendment period, the protocol was revised to add instructions for patients and investigators to promptly recognize signs and symptoms suggestive of potential liver injury and specific thresholds for liver lab tests to monitor for potential injury. The drug was to be promptly interrupted if liver injury was suspected and permanently discontinued if a patient was found to have portal hypertension. This specific guidance allowed us to prospectively assess the impact of focused monitoring on the incidence of hepatic safety events. Importantly, the monitoring frequency used in study 303 is also proposed in our label. Before I review the adjudicated hepatic safety results, it is important to note three points. All events were reviewed by the Independent Hepatic Safety Adjudication Committee, comprised of six DILI experts in a blinded manner, following the DILI network methodology. DILI was defined as a liver injury caused by a medication or an herb, leading to abnormal liver tests or abnormal liver dysfunction with reasonable exclusion of other etiologies. Each event was adjudicated for severity and relatedness to IP. Unlikely relatedness was defined as a probability of relationship to IP less than 24%, possible as 25 to 49%, probable as 50 to 74%, and highly likely as 75 to 100%. Of note, FDA's briefing document mentions re-adjudication of the 12 cases in an unblinded manner. It is important to characterize DILI in the setting of chronic progressive liver disease. Thresholds for fatal events based on Heist law may not be meaningful or appropriate to assess DILI in the setting of chronic progressive liver disease. And lastly, considering that specific monitoring for liver injury was only introduced with the 2017 amendment, the post-amendment exposure adjusted incidence rates are the most appropriate and inform our proposed label. Turning now to the adjudicated results. Here we show the impact of the 2017 safety amendment on adjudicated hepatic events. 
Data for patients with an adjudicated event pre-amendment are shown on the left and post-amendment on the right. As seen in this table, the pre-amendment period on the left included 400 patient years of safety follow-up compared to more than 2,300 patient years of exposure in the post-amendment period. As shown in the yellow box, following incorporation of the safety amendment, the incidence rate for moderate and higher severity and more than possibly related adjudicated hepatic events in the OCA 25 milligram group decreased from 1.5 pre-amendment to an exposure adjusted incidence rate of 0.13 in the post-amendment period. This represents a tenfold reduction in the exposure adjusted incidence for patients with a moderate or higher related event in the OCA 25 milligram group, a notable finding considering five to six fold increase in patient years of follow-up in the post amendment period. All three cases in the OCA 25 milligram group post amendment were reversible with interruption of OCA. Now I would like to address the clinically significant moderate and higher severity and related cases described in the FDA's briefing document. This table shows eight of the 12 cases re-adjudicated by the FDA in an unblinded manner in table 12 of the FDA's briefing document. The cases are in order of time to onset as shown in the last column. In most cases, the Hepatic Safety Adjudication Committee and FDA's assessment for relatedness were consistent. In the three cases highlighted in yellow, the independent blinded assessment of relatedness by the Hepatic Safety Adjudication Committee was more conservative compared to FDA's unblinded assessment, reflecting the rigor of the blinded Hepatic Safety Adjudication Committee. And no case was assessed as highly likely by either the Hepatic Safety Adjudication Committee or the FDA. In the black outline is case number one, a patient who underwent a liver transplant. This event occurred prior to the 2000 safety amendment and was one of the two events I highlighted earlier as leading to the amendment. As you can see, potential liver injury events occurred within the first year of treatment, and this informed the monitoring guidance in our proposed label. Apart from the liver transplant, which occurred pre-amendment, all of the seven other cases were reversible with interruption of OCA. There were four late onset events shaded in yellow at the bottom of the table. All four of these events were gallstone related with two each in the OCA 10 milligram and OCA 25 milligram. One fatal event of ascending cholangitis was reported in a 60 year old female patient who had diabetes and cholelithiasis at baseline and had been on OCA therapy for more than 18 months. Her month 18 liver biopsy showed progression to cirrhosis. Two months after her month 18 biopsy, she was hospitalized with acute right upper quadrant abdominal pain and elevated liver enzymes. An MRCP showed complete obstruction. Unfortunately, there was a prolonged delay of three to four days in addressing the acute obstruction via an ERCP, and OCA was not stopped during this hospitalization. This review of the clinically significant hepatic cases leaves, leaves us with two serious events one transplant in a patient prior to the 2017 amendment, which could have been mitigated with post-amendment guidance to promptly interrupt investigational product in acute illness, and one fatal case of ascending cholangitis in the OCA 25 milligram group over more than 2,000 patient years of exposure. Our proposed label contraindicates initiating OCA in the setting of biliary obstruction and instructs prompt interruption of OCA in the setting of symptomatic gallstone disease, actions which will allow avoidance of adverse outcomes related to gallstones. Further, evidence of progression to cirrhosis on the month 18 biopsy would have been another reason to permanently discontinue OCA in this patient per our proposed label. Now turning to gallstone related events. These are more common in patients with NASH compared to the general population, with 20% patients reporting a history of gallstones and 25% of patients reporting a history of cholecystectomy. Cholelithiasis was the most common gallstone-related adverse event. 2.5% of patients in the OCA 25 milligram group reported a serious gallstone-related event, which was most commonly cholecystitis. In OCA patients who underwent a cholecystectomy, OCA was safely resumed in the majority of cases 
with no further adverse events related to gallstones. Importantly, the relative risk for gallstone-related adverse events with OCA 25 milligram versus placebo was similar in patients with known gallstones, no gallstones, or gallstone status not reported at baseline. Here we see events related to pancreatitis. No difference was observed between OCA groups and placebo, including biliary pancreatitis. One fatal event of hemorrhagic pancreatitis resulting from a post-procedure complication of ERCP was reported in a placebo patient. Now we will turn to cardiovascular safety. Considering the background risk for cardiovascular disease in this population, as well as the known effect of FXR agonism on lipids, a comprehensive assessment for cardiovascular safety, including adjudication of cardiovascular events was performed. This comprehensive evaluation showed an initial increase in LDL and hemoglobin A1C, which attenuated over time. No changes in systolic blood pressure or heart rate were observed. Cardiovascular safety was further evaluated through rigorous assessment of independently adjudicated MACE. And no imbalance was observed in adjudicated MACE events between placebo and OCA groups. Based on these data, there is no clear signal for an excess cardiovascular risk with OCA. Labeling will recommend that all patients are managed to target parameters for existing clinical guidelines. After a transient increase with OCA at month one, LDL levels decrease to near baseline levels by month 18, regardless of initiating a statin. Of note, more than 60% patients had an LDL greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter at baseline, a threshold likely to require management with a lipid lowering agent. In a separate analysis evaluating overall time averaged LDL over a median 39 months, a difference of nine milligrams per deciliter was observed for the pooled OCA doses versus placebo. Study 209 was a phase two study designed and conducted to evaluate the impact of adding lipid lowering therapy to OCA. Data from the study is shown on the left panel. The increase in LDL with OCA was rapidly managed by addition of a torvastatin 10 milligrams daily at week four, and LDL levels returned to below baseline levels within four weeks of adding a torvastatin. On the right panel, we see data for patients from study 303 who initiated a statin. 34% patients on OCA 25 milligram and 17% patients on placebo initiated a statin which led to a decrease in LDL to baseline levels by month 12. Now turning to hyperglycemia. Rates for hyperglycemia adverse events were similar between OCA and placebo using a broad set of preferred terms. As shown here, the rate for clinically significant events of diabetic ketoacidosis were low and balanced and no hyperosmolar event was reported. The serious cases of diabetes and diabetes inadequate control reflected patients with diabetes at baseline who were hospitalized for glycemic management. Here we see the mean change in hemoglobin A1C for patients with baseline diabetes on the left, impaired glycemia at baseline in the middle, and normal glycemia at baseline on the right. After an early increase of 0.3% in hemoglobin A1C in patients with diabetes at baseline as shown on the left panel, no clinically significant difference was observed between the treatment groups over the 48-month follow-up period. In patients with impaired glucose control at baseline in the middle, a mean increase in hemoglobin A1C of 0.1% was observed for the OCA 25 milligram group with no difference from placebo from month 18 and later time points. As noted by FDA in its briefing document, the impact of this early transient treatment-related dysglycemia on the clinical course of patients is unknown. And finally, in patients with normal glucose control at baseline on the far right, no difference was observed between the placebo and OCA groups. We will now review data for cardiovascular events to inform any impact on cardiovascular outcomes. Here we see results for adjudicated base. A broad scope of triggers and all hospitalizations for potential cardiovascular events were reviewed by an independent cardiovascular committee. While the number of adjudicated events is small, a similar distribution was observed between the placebo and OCA 25 milligram groups for core base, which included non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke and cardiovascular death, 
four-point mace, which adds unstable angina, and five-point mace, which adds hospitalization for heart failure. Now looking at MACE analyses stratified by 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. As shown on the bottom panel, rates for MACE were higher in the higher risk strata as expected. However, there was no difference between the placebo and OCA groups. Next, I will review renal events. Adjudicated acute kidney injury events were low overall, and there was no clear signal for acute kidney injury. Given the background risk, labeling recommends monitoring of renal function. I will now describe our overall recommendations for risk management, as well as our safety conclusions. Starting with our comprehensive risk management plan for hepatic safety. The first pillar is identifying the appropriate patients for treatment. Patients with minimal fibrosis who are unlikely to benefit are excluded. Additionally, Patients at higher risk for a hepatic safety event, as shown here, are contraindicated. And importantly, treatment with OCA will be restricted to gastroenterologists and hepatologists. We anticipate that 70% of the potential prescribers for NASH are the same GIs and hepatologists who are already known to us through our work in PBC. The second pillar is rigorous education for both patients and prescribers. This will specify prompt interruption of OCA for any acute intercurrent illness or hospitalization, stopping rules for safety concerns or futility, and outreach through a specialty pharmacy. The final pillar is to monitor and manage hepatic safety. Our proposed label recommends monitoring of liver tests at initiation of OCA at month one, every three months for the first 18 months of treatment, and every six months thereafter. I would now like to provide, provide more detail about drug interruption and stopping rules. As shown on the left panel, our proposed label instructs prompt interruption of OCA for any acute intercurrent illness, hospitalization, signs and symptoms of hepatic impairment, or abnormal lab parameters as noted here. This is common practice with numerous medications indicated for chronic use. On the right are stopping rules for permanent discontinuation of OCA based on safety as well as futility. OCA should be permanently discontinued for liver injury without alternate etiology, progression to cirrhosis, or clear evidence of worsening fibrosis. We have three proofs of concept for this approach. First, our experience from study 303 2017 safety amendment as discussed earlier, Second, as Dr. Berry mentioned, a separate study, study 304, was conducted in a more advanced population of more than 900 patients with compensated cirrhosis, and we saw no severe or irreversible hepatic safety event over the 18-month follow-up period. Third, when the PBC label was updated in 2021 to contraindicate patients with more advanced cirrhosis, we saw the number of hepatic reports, including serious reports, decline. We are confident that the totality of these measures will help manage risk of hepatic safety events in the post-market setting for NASH. In terms of risk for gallstone-related events, the label contraindicates use of OCA in patients with symptomatic gallstone disease, as well as interruption of OCA during treatment in symptomatic gallstone-related events until managed, which is consistent with existing clinical guidelines. Given the comorbidities in this patient population, Lipids, glycemic markers, and renal function should be managed for existing clinical guidelines. We have also proposed additional measures which have been successfully employed for PBC, which has more than 30,000 patient years of exposure with OCA. These include prescribing by GI and hepatology practices who manage patients with chronic liver disease, education of these prescribers, patient information and education, and finally, a specialty pharmacy network. In addition, we have also proposed enhanced pharmacovigilance activities for NASH, which include patient support programs, a website for safety information, and a patient registry, which will allow us to monitor safety of OCA in the post-market setting. We look forward to collaborating with the FDA to continue to develop an effective and comprehensive risk mitigation plan. In conclusion, 
OCA has a well-characterized safety profile based on large placebo-controlled long-term exposure data. The profile is consistent with OCA's mechanism of action and background comorbid comorbidities in patients with NASH. Most of the observed events are known and commonly managed by gastroenterologists and hepatologists. Rigorous, comprehensive assessments have shown that safety can be managed with existing practice guidelines. Thank you. And I will now turn the presentation to Dr. Arun Sanyal. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Arun Sanyal. I'm a professor of medicine at VCU School of Medicine. Today, I would like to share my perspective, both as a clinician and as an investigator who has been treating and studying NASH for over two decades. I am being compensated for my time, but have no financial interest in the outcome of today's meeting. Let me start by speaking to the situation that I face in my clinic every day. I am seeing more and more patients with NASH present with clinically significant fibrosis. With only diet and lifestyle modifications and no approved therapies, they often progress to cirrhosis and eventually decompensate, necessitating evaluation for liver transplant. However, liver transplant is not an option for the majority of patients, underscoring the urgent need for therapeutics to prevent progression to cirrhosis and its associated complications. Here is a typical patient example. This is a 55-year-old woman who I first saw in my clinic 10 years ago. She had a background history of diabetes, coronary artery disease, and heart failure. Despite multiple weight loss attempts, she had progressive increase in liver stiffness to about 14 kilopascals. We performed a liver biopsy that showed NASH with stage three fibrosis. In the absence of approved therapies, I was left to wait and see how she would progress, knowing that she had a 25% likelihood of progressing to cirrhosis in two to four years. Unfortunately, two years later, almost on cue, she presented with thrombocytopenia, a further increase in liver stiffness to 25 kilopascals, and a decline in EGFR to 55. She had clearly progressed to cirrhosis and given her comorbidities, would not be a great candidate for liver transplantation when she decompensates. Let's discuss what this means for the patient and also talk about missed opportunities for intervention. As shown by Dr. Cowdley earlier, increasing fibrosis stage is the strongest predictor of hepatic decompensation and all-cause mortality. Hepatic decompensation is the result of portal hypertension which is linked to fibrosis burden. Now that my patient has cirrhosis, that is stage four fibrosis, she has a significantly higher risk of decompensation and her risk of death has doubled even from when she had bridging F3 fibrosis. If an effective antifibrotic therapy had been available, I could have intervened earlier to reverse or halt her fibrosis progression to cirrhosis. Let's review how OCA could have helped me accomplish this treatment goal. As shown on the left, OCA 25 milligrams doubled the likelihood of fibrosis reversal using the primary regulatory endpoint analysis where patients who missed the post-treatment biopsies were considered non-responders. Furthermore, when we look at patients where both the baseline and the month 18 biopsy were available, as shown on the right, more than one third of patients on OCA OCA 25 milligrams had a one stage or greater improvement in fibrosis stage. Just as importantly, fewer patients worsened fibrosis during the same time frame. And finally, as Dr. Kaposa showed, in those patients who did not see a change in fibrosis stage, patients on OCA saw an improvement in non-invasive markers of liver injury and fibrosis compared to placebo. I find these data compelling in their totality. Let's take a closer look at patients with stage three fibrosis who are arguably at the greatest risk of progression to cirrhosis. Nearly 40% of patients with stage three fibrosis experienced a one stage or greater reversal of fibrosis with a 22% placebo corrected treatment effect. This is remarkable in a population that is one stage away from cirrhosis and thus has the greatest unmet need. Let me put this in clinical perspective. Progressive fibrosis leads to cirrhosis in NASH as shown in the by the red line. 
the development of cirrhosis and eventual decompensation has a hugely negative impact, not only on the patient, but their caregivers and healthcare systems. My goal as a hepatologist is to bend this fibrotic curve. The demonstration of fibrosis reversal by OCA provides proof that it indeed does bend, it this, bend this curve. Furthermore, the OCA-induced improvement in NITs, even in patients without a one-state change in fibrosis, indicates that OCA stabilizes the underlying liver injury. It is then logical to expect that this too should translate into reduced fibrosis progression over the long term. Having talked about the potential benefits of OCA, it is equally important to discuss the safe use and operationalization of this drug. Specifically, I would like to offer my perspective on some of the key issues raised by the FDA in their briefing document. Now, Dr. Lumba has already discussed patient selection, so I will focus on the remaining issues, starting with hepatotoxicity. First, FDA's position is that frequent liver biochemistry testing can be challenging and will require lifelong monitoring. I would point out that NASH requires lifelong management, regardless of OCA. Furthermore, I see most patients with pre-serotic fibrosis at six-month intervals. However, if more frequent visits were needed, especially during the first few years of therapy, this would not be an issue. We routinely monitor their liver enzymes at every visit. This should easily allow us to identify asymptomatic elevations of liver chemistry. The safety amendment provided guidance on monitoring and situations in which the drug must be held, such as when the liver chemistry criteria are met or during acute intercurrent illnesses. This resulted in a substantial reduction in liver-related safety events. The FDA also noted that it is difficult to distinguish DILI from typical fluctuations in liver enzymes. While small fluctuations are common in patients with NASH, they rarely represent DILI. Clinically significant elevations in liver enzymes, bilirubin or INR, above the thresholds that Dr. Sani showed are more relevant and require discontinuation of all possibly offending drugs, including OCA, until the etiology is determined. This is standard clinical practice and is a core competency of hepatologists and gastroenterologists. Finally, liver biopsies are usually not required for the management of suspected delay unless severe liver dysfunction persists despite drug discontinuation. Together, these with the multi-tiered monitoring approaches uh, shown by Dr. Sani should allow us to safely use OCA in appropriately selected patients. Next, let us consider FDA concerns about monitoring for progression to cirrhosis. I respectfully disagree that a standard schedule is infeasible as we routinely follow patients, just as I noted. Assessment of progression towards cirrhosis is a core focus assessed at every visit for every chronic liver disease. And there are a variety of well-established tools for this process. Second, with respect to the ability of NITs to detect cirrhosis, NITs are used every day for this purpose and can be supplemented by selective use of liver biopsy. Finally, I agree that hepatology and gastroenterology subspecialty expertise will be required. Many new treatment paradigms require specific drug management strategies, which have to be integrated into patient care and require new learnings. We have done this successfully before with education and training in similar scenarios that initially seemed challenging. For example, with testing for underlying hepatitis B and tuberculosis prior to initiating infliximab for IBD. We can certainly do this again. Lastly, let me address the remaining three concerns. First, majority of patients with NASH have multiple cardiometabolic comorbidities that are ideally managed in a multidisciplinary manner, requiring multiple medications for individual end organ diseases as background therapy, regardless of OCA. The increase in LDL cholesterol can be abrogated safely with statins. Second, patients with NASH already have an increased risk of gallstone disease, and we manage this routinely every day. Those with symptomatic gallstones should have gallstone disease taken care of before initiating OCA therapy. And if symptomatic gallstones develop on therapy, 
the drug should be stopped and the patient considered for cholecystectomy consistent with standard of care. Third, while patients do experience pruritus, it is generally mild and manageable. In my view, considering the range of adverse events I see every day while managing other chronic liver diseases, these adverse events are manageable. So in summary, we know the harm that will befall patients with increasing fibrosis, particularly with the development of cirrhosis. OCA has demonstrable antifibrotic benefit and is the first agent that can, be, that poten that can potentially prevent progression to cirrhosis, which could be life-saving for some. As with many new treatments, there are special monitoring considerations in order to minimize risks. However, these are well within the scope of routine GI hepatology practice and can be operationalized. I'd like to finish by sharing one final thought. Almost 30 years ago, when our clinics were filling up with patients with cirrhosis due to hepatitis C, interferon was approved as monotherapy with single digit virologic response and a daunting side effect profile. This humble first step, however, led to progressive drug development for hepatitis C, culminating in a cure for virtually everyone. Today, we stand on a similar critical threshold in time for our patients with NASH and clinically significant fibrosis, for whom prevention of cirrhosis is literally a matter of life and death. OCA is the first agent that opens a window of opportunity to accomplish this, and we simply cannot wait any longer while outcomes data are being generated. It is time to put this in the hands of treating physicians so that we can make individualized risk benefit assessments and decisions with our patients. Together, I believe these considerations provide a strong rationale for the accelerated approval of OCA now. Thank you, and I will now turn the meeting back to the committee chair. Thank you, Dr. Sanyal, and to all of those who participated uh, in the applicant presentation. We will now take clarifying questions for Intercept Pharmaceuticals. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you uh, and end your follow-up question with a, that's all for my questions, so we can move on to the next panel member. I see Dr. Uh, Raquel has a question. Yes. If you could uh, unmute. I have two questions. If, have the investigators had the opportunity to demonstrate with the measurements of hepatic hemodynamic parameters like wedge hepatic vein pressure that the decrease in one stage or more in fibrosis lead to a lower wedge hepatic vein pressure? And, and uh, parallel to that, any EGD upper endoscopy uh, demonstration that the size of varices change if they were present, although that would be a criteria of uh, exclusion. But if you have seen that in the clinical practice uh, in the evaluation of these patients. Thank you, Dr. Raquel. So that was not incorporated in this study in F2, F3 patients. We are accumulating clinical events. So any patient who did have um, progression of disease and was found to have varices, especially hospitalization for varices, would have been captured as an event, but there were not routine measures to assess the, the new emergence of varices in this patient population. So that, that's really focused more on our end of study, uh, accumulation of clinical events. Dr. Raquel, um, do you need any clarification or would that be it? Um, you know, I, the, the, I had a second question. Let me see. 
Yeah. The second question is, uh, you were, uh, you have been showing that that month 48, 48 months of on treatment, there is a significant drop in the ALT levels and other markers of necroinflammatory changes in, in the patient. Have you had the opportunity to uh, biopsy available that there is a change in the NAFLD activity score in those patients as well, that you were not able to demonstrate earlier 18 months biopsy, but in 48 months biopsy if they're available? Yes, we have been accumulating those month 48 biopsies. However, we were given strict instructions to remain focused on the month 18 interim analysis for this discussion today. Uh, because so many of the progression to cirrhosis clinical events, we anticipate will be driven initially by the histologic progression to F4. So we have not begun looking at those month 48 biopsies. But as you point out, many of these patients who are now reaching uh, year four are now undergoing those biopsies. So that is part of what we, again, would anticipate as part of our end of study analyses. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chaja, please go ahead. Mark Saja, question for Dr. Kaposa. Uh, I'd like to some, have some details on the histological results under the consensus mem uh, method of the ITT old population. Specifically, in what percentages were uh, cases agreed upon by the two pathologists? What percentage had to go to the third pathologist? And what percentage had to go to the special committee? Dr. Kaposa? Thank you. So in terms of the number of cases that had to go on to a full panel, that was actually very small in, in the, in the uh, single digits, less than 3%. The overwhelming majority of the cases in the consensus were agreed upon by the first two pathologists. And in an only a small portion did uh, they have to go on to the tiebreaker. And then, as I mentioned, on to the, uh, the full panel review. In terms of the agreement, uh, we have done some analyses and the overall agreement in the consensus approach, when we look at change in fibrosis stage uh, was approximately 56% bordering on 60%. Uh, but that's the, uh, the, the number that we can give you from the consensus uh, read method. So that percentage applies to the two pathologists initially agreeing. Well, yes, it would apply to the two pathologists, although in that small percentage, a few did go on to a full panel review. So that would be included in the, in the near 60% agreement between them in terms of fibrosis shift. Thank you. Dr. Cheng. Thank you, uh, Lin Chang. Um, I had two questions. Uh, my first question was for Dr. Lumbo on the slide, I think it was six, CC38, about the sensitivity specificity of non-invasive tests. And we know it's important to identify the proper patients for treatment and also to assess them over time. Uh, so I was just wanted to know if uh, you could comment on the fact that sensitivity is only 31% although the specificity is 91%. Uh, can you give some comments about the low sensitivity in using these non-invasive tests to identify the patients properly? Doctor, uh, thank you, Dr. Chang. Um, we completely agree. Uh, this approach really identifies patients who are at highest risk for disease progression. So even among those who have histologic stage two or stage three fibrosis, this approach identifies the patients who have impending progression to cirrhosis. Therefore, this would be the first group of patients who would be candidates for therapy. We agree there may be much larger and much broader group of patients who could potentially benefit, but initially utilizing such a conservative approach, we will only treat patients who would require this therapy and would have less likelihood of having earlier stages of fibrosis. I would also like to point out that um, there are other consensus uh, approaches that are available 
from Europe and other parts of the world, including the Bovino consensus, that may also allow us to identify patients who may have a sweet spot that is between 10 kilopascal to 15 kilopascal with a platelet count greater than 150. So this approach really identifies patients who have high specificity and have a low likelihood to have lower stages of disease. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is for Dr. Sani, and I don't see the slide number based on the, the PDF that we have, uh, but you identified these three main measures to interrupt drug treatment, uh, but you didn't really state what are you, what's the guidance to restart the treatment? Do you need to have improvement in all three areas and for some duration of time? Because I would imagine you know, that would be an important aspect of clinical management. Before Dr. Sani joins us, if I could just add from the sponsor's perspective, following up on the question to Dr. Lumba, when we did look at that implementation of those proposed non-invasive test criteria, we've been able to identify a much smaller group in the U.S. of patients who have a diagnosis of NASH and who are currently under care in a, under a hepatologist or a specialist gastroenterologist practice, that number is around 700,000 patients. So although we have recognized that the epidemiology nationwide is continuing to increase using this very specific, and as, as you point out, low sensitivity but high specificity does reduce the number of patients we would initially be targeting to around 700,000 in the U.S. Uh, Dr. Sani. Yes, so you asked the question about uh, when to restart in, in case of, uh, if I could just have slide one up, please. Um, so just to clarify, I think your question is about the left-hand panel. Um, right. Correct. Yes. So um, right. If, if a patient had any acute intercurrent illness or signs of symptoms or lab parameters, the instructions are that you interrupt drug, you assess and evaluate until, you know, those have resolved, um, and especially um, if you have increased lab parameters, the the guidance is that you look for alternate etiologies. Um, and if uh, if there is a reasonable alternate etiology, and after resolution of that acute illness or acute increase in the lab parameters, um, when there is resolution, then you can restart therapy. Um, however, as indicated on the right side of the slide. If there is increase in those liver, liver thresholds without alternate etiology, then the recommendation is to permanently discontinue therapy with OCA. Okay, so there's no um, actual parameters on the duration that there's normalization or more details on the signs or some. I just, was, just wanted to make sure that it was clear to physicians of when they could properly and safely restart treatment that's been interrupted. Right, so the the, the proposed um, label will actually provide guidance on re repeating those, you know, if a lab parameter was increased, you would repeat them um, depending on the level of increase within three to five days, um, you know, or if it's it was less severe increase, uh, you know, within a week or two weeks. So the, the guidance is really based on you restart when there is complete resolution of, of any of those three parameters. Thank you. Um, I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just as a reminder, uh, panelists and um, sponsor, please state your name before uh, speaking next. And also just keeping time, we only have about 10 minutes left for questions. So try to keep your questions and answers uh, respectful of that. Dr. Solga. This is a question. This is Steve Solga. This is a question for Dr. Sanyo. Um, I, 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 can he explain for me, please, the placebo vaccine uh, during this fish trial? Uh, it appears that quite a number of, of, of participants regressed in their fibrosis stage on placebo. I ask that because the narrative around this drug approval is one that NAFLD fatty liver is one of unrelenting progression. This has come up over and over again during the presentations. Unrelenting progression toward death. Something like analogous to untreated hepatitis C or untreated cancer. Um, but there's a lot of data uh, in the universe uh, that suggests that fatty liver is dynamic and can regress. Uh, in fact, this week's CGH 
um, has a, the, the cover of CGA says uh, this very thing. Um, and Dr. Saniel had a paper a year ago, which the sponsors of Breathing Packet mentioned about, uh, which was cited, uh, I should say, in hepatology in May of 22 that demonstrated spontaneous regression, apparently, um, in the context of the clinical trial. I'm wondering if these folks have been misclassified upon study entry, that explains the apparent regression, or whether fatty liver natural history can indeed be bidirectional. Uh, thank you, Dr. Solga. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, we should acknowledge that the disease, particularly in its earlier stages, does wax and wane in severity, both in activity as well as in fibrosis. And uh, uh, so that's part of the story. But if you take a whole population as a whole, it is the integration of uh, you know the progressions and the regressions that determine the overall trajectory. So when I said this is a disease that is progressive, that if you take the entire population over time, people more and more people are progressing, as witnessed in our transplant waiting lists. Number two, uh, in terms of your second question as to whether this is just you know biopsy variability and regression to the mean versus true waxing and waning, I suspect I can only suspect hypothesize that the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, that there is some natural waxing and waning of the disease, but there is no question samples, biopsy size, pathology reading, all of those things do sort of also impact uh, variability in histologic assessments. And that's why it is important to look at the placebo-corrected response and not just at the response, because that's the background noise that we have to account for in the tool that we're using to assess the histologic benefit. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Dr. Heller. Hi, Theo Heller. Uh, comment, half a comment and a question and a question. I think we should be careful looking at fibrosis and all-cause mortality because this may be true, true, and unrelated. The implication is that treating fibrosis will have some effect on that. It might just identify people who rapid progresses in terms of the metabolic syndrome, but not specifically for NASH. So the all-cause mortality, I think, is not quite as clear an issue. My second comment slash question is, Looking at the decline in lipids and glucose, that, and, no, and given that this is a biological pathway, is there tolerance? Do we know if the benefit is all up front or if the benefit is sustained and continued? And aligned to that with the ALT sort of be, or AST being major sort of things that we follow, I think non invasive tests are very good. I agree with Dr. Lumba that this is a way to identify people who are most at risk. But what about NITs on therapy to identify progression? Because this is a question that's been raised when patients develop cirrhosis, it should be stopped. The example of Dr. Sanyal is sort of a medical student level. Someone whose fiber scan shoots up that much and platelets drop that much is easy. But most patients are more subtle, as we all know, and as Dr. Solga implied. So my question is, have NITs been studied on therapy? Because treatment will affect many of the components. For example, the lower ALT and ST but no change in fibrosis that we were shown in the talk. An alternative explanation for this discrepancy between NITS and biopsy would be that the non-invasive tests don't always reflect disease progression because they're affected by therapy itself. And the end of my questions, thank you. Okay. Dr. Limba. Thank you, Dr. Heller. Um, this is a really important question that every hepatologist and gastroenterologist faces in their clinical practice. I don't remember the last day when I did a liver biopsy to see if my patient has progressed to cirrhosis. So every hepatologist is using these tests in their clinical practice. To that end, I would like to show the uh, slide BU1264. This is in the latest 2023 ASLD NAFLD practice guidance where a group of experts put together some clinical uh, predictors or criteria that suggest a, a high specificity for a patient who may have cirrhosis or who may have progressed to cirrhosis. So these are available uh, such as FIB4, ELF, VCT, and MR elastography to clinicians um, to see if their patient may have progressed to cirrhosis. I would also like to show now slide BU1494. 
Here, these are data to the left coming from previously published uh, randomized placebo-controlled trials in patients who had bridging fibrosis. And you can see that liver stiffness increased by five kilopascal and a 20% increase predicts progression to cirrhosis in a patient who has stage three fibrosis. So a typical patient population that would be potentially treated if obedicolic acid were, were to be approved. So you can pick by a five kilopascal rule. Now you can say, is that available to a practicing hepatologist? It is. If you look to the right is the Bovino 7 consensus where the rule of five is already being practiced routinely in clinical practice. So if we think we target a patient population that's between 10 to 15 kilopascal, if there's a five kilopascal increase, that patient has progressed their disease and requires a reassessment and potentially discontinuing therapy for a patient reaching a 20 kilopascal on a fibro scan. So potentially with these, I think we may be able to monitor our patients who may be progressing. I would also like to show slide um, where I'm we sorry, have- I'm sorry to interrupt, time. but we have a number of questions and we're actually at the top of the hour. And so what I'm gonna ask um, is that we defer um, your, your next slide um, and I'll ask the rest of the uh, panel members, we're gonna take five more minutes, short questions, short answers. Um, Dr. Coffey. Thank you. Yes, hi, um, Chris Coffey. Um, my question is primarily for Dr. Capoza on CC114. Uh, um, just to get clarity, it was mentioned a couple of times that in addition to the, the primary endpoint showing benefit for uh, improving fibrosis, that it also stabilized. But when I look at the graph on the right side, it, I, I don't see that because if you combine the no change in the improved fibrosis, you know, the, the difference for worsening are about the same. So, it, it, you know, it shifted those who hypothetically under placebo would not have improved, but improved, but didn't necessarily lead to more stabilization. So I would just ask for some clarity on that point that came up numerous times. Thank you. So we do recognize that the word stabilization can mean different things, although we, we're suggesting that patients who have stabilized their disease, it, it's more of a lack of progression. And so there, there is a small difference in the uh, patients uh, who have progressed by one stage as shown on that uh, uh, table to the right, where there is a shift in worsening and fibrosis, uh, as you see going from right to left. With, uh, with placebo at 23% and uh, OCA at 17%. In the middle, though, I think that's really where the, the, the question becomes, this group of patients with no change in their histologic fibrosis stage at a month 18 biopsy, which direction are they headed in? And I think that is really where we tried to make the point that in this group of patients, there is evidence that patients on obeticolic acid are heading in the right direction and those uh, on placebo may not be uh, heading in the right direction or at least are not changing over time. And so I think it's really about that group of patients in the middle in which direction they will head. And of course, ultimately we need a third data point to, to see which way they go and that, that would come in the month 48 biopsy. Thank you. Dr. Marr. Jackie Meyer, University of California, San Francisco. I had a question for Dr. Sani. Uh, Dr. Sani, you mentioned that uh, in order to uh, reduce any potential safety concerns regarding the medication, if it is uh, approved, that you would restrict prescriptions to individuals who are under the care of gastroenterologists and hepatologists. I can see that that would be easy to operationalize for a disease such as PBC, uh, but for a disease such as NAFLD, uh, who are uh, in which the patient population is quite large and there are a number of treating providers, I'm I'm curious how you would operationalize that decision. Yeah, so that's a very important question. So, um, as 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 I um, showed earlier, the the patient, the gastroenterologists and um, hepatologists that we uh, anticipate, you know, will be the ones who um, take care of uh, patients with 
NASH and, and would be potential users prescribing OCA for NASH. We, we are familiar with them through our work with PBC, um, completely acknowledge that for NASH, which is uh, a multidisciplinary um, team, we are very we are very much committed to educating uh, the NASH care team, which we recognize uh, needs to be a multidisciplinary care team, including their primary care physicians, um, or especially those patients who have diabetes at baseline working very closely with the endocrinologist or the primary care um, who might be um, managing their diabetes um, as well as lipids, um, et cetera. So, so we, uh, we strongly believe that we can through appropriate education, uh, educate the, the prescribers um, as well as the patients on managing um, lipids and glycemic markers. Thank you. Okay, I see that we do have more questions, but we are at time. Um, so we will now take a quick 10 minute break. Panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics uh, with other panel members during this break. We will resume at 11.15 Eastern time.
We will now proceed with the FDA presentations, starting with Dr. Rebecca Hager. It's in order. Just one second, we're having some technical difficulties. Hello, my name is Dr. Rebecca Hager, and I'm a statistical team leader at the FDA. Today, I will discuss the regulatory framework and provide an overview of Study 303, including the key efficacy results from the interim analysis of surrogate endpoints. First, I will discuss the regulatory framework for today's discussion. For a new drug to be approved for marketing in the United States, FDA must determine that the drug is safe and effective for use under the conditions prescribed, recommended, or suggested in the product's labeling. The demonstration of effectiveness requires substantial evidence that the drug will have the effect it purports or is representative to have. Key for the discussion today is that the demonstration of safety requires showing that the benefits of the drug outweigh the risks. It is important to understand the different types of outcomes and endpoints and how they relate to different regulatory pathways. A clinical outcome is an outcome that describes or reflects how an individual feels, functions, or survives. A clinical benefit is a positive therapeutic effect on this outcome that is clinically meaningful. The histologic measurements that we will be discussing today are not considered to be clinical outcomes. A surrogate endpoint is a measure that is thought to predict clinical benefit, but is not itself a measure of clinical benefit. A validated surrogate endpoint has been shown to predict a specific clinical benefit and can be used to support traditional approval. A surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit has not reached the level of evidence needed to validate it. This type of endpoint can be used to support accelerated approval. Currently, there are no validated surrogate endpoints for NASH. The reasonably likely surrogate endpoints that are discussed today were supported by epidemiologic rationale from the literature. As there are currently no approved drugs for NASH, we do not have data from interventional trials that can be used to understand the quantitative relationship between changes on the surrogate endpoint and changes in clinical outcomes. Next, I will discuss different approval pathways. A traditional approval is based on a measurement of clinical benefit or an effect on a validated surrogate endpoint. Today, we are considering accelerated approval pathway, which is based on a drug's effect on a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict a drug's clinical benefit. Drugs granted accelerated approval must meet the same statutory standards for safety and effectiveness as those that are granted traditional approval. Accelerated approval can provide patients with serious and life-threatening diseases access to new therapy sooner for conditions for which there is an unmet need for treatment. Because accelerated approval is based on the drug's effect on a surrogate endpoint, this accepts some additional uncertainty as a trade-off in providing earlier access to treatment. As a condition of the accelerated approval, FDA has required post-approval studies to verify and describe the drug's clinical benefits. In summary, there are two different types of approvals, and we are considering accelerated approval today. We will discuss study results of surrogate endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Therefore, there is less certainty that the observed treatment effect will translate into clinical benefits. Now, I will discuss study 303, which is the primary basis of efficacy and safety that we are discussing today. As the applicant presented, study 303 is an ongoing, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial which enrolled adult subjects with definite NASH. 
There is equal allocation to three treatment groups for OCA 25 milligrams, OCA, OCA 10 milligrams, or matching placebo. Efficacy was evaluated in subjects with fibrosis stage 2 or stage 3 as defined by the NASH Clinical Research Network scoring system. There was a pre-specified month 18 interim analysis of histological endpoints that was intended to support accelerated approval and is the focus of today's efficacy discussion. This study is still ongoing to evaluate clinical outcomes, which are intended to support traditional approval. Therefore, subjects from the interim analysis remain in the trial and additional subjects were enrolled. The month 48 and end of treatment biopsies are intended to evaluate progression to cirrhosis, which is a component of the clinical benefit endpoint. To maintain the integrity of the ongoing trial, the endpoint assessing clinical benefit remains blinded. As the applicant previously presented, this is the NASH CRN scoring system that was used to score histological assessments for inclusion in the study and for efficacy analyses. The month 18 interim analysis included two primary endpoints which were evaluated in subjects with fibrosis stage 2 or stage 3 at baseline. One primary endpoint is improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. The other primary endpoint is resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis. These endpoints are considered by the agency to be surrogate endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. The final analysis of study 303 will evaluate a clinical endpoint that is measured as the time to first occurrence of any of the listed adjudicated events, including death, MELT score greater than or equal to 15, liver transplant, hospitalization due to liver decompensation events, ascites, and histological progression to cirrhosis, according to the most recent version of the statistical analysis plan. This study is fully enrolled and ongoing to evaluate these outcomes. Once available, the final results that include these clinical outcomes could inform the benefit risk assessment needed for traditional approval. The applicant pre-specified a testing strategy to control the overall type 1 error rate when conducting multiple hypothesis tests for the month 18 interim analysis and the final analysis, the two different doses of OCA compared to placebo, and the two primary endpoints for the month 18 analysis. Details of this testing strategy are discussed in the FDA briefing package. The two month 18 primary endpoints were not co-primary endpoints and demonstration of statistical significance on either endpoint was considered acceptable to support an accelerated approval. Because there was a complex strategy to, to account for multiple hypothesis tests, the p-values that are presented in the AC materials should not be compared to a standard 0.05 threshold and the 95% confidence intervals cannot be used to determine statistical significance based on whether they rule out zero for a risk, risk difference or one for an odds ratio. We will present efficacy results for two different methods that were used for scoring the biopsy slides. The original NDA review focused on a central method in which a single pathologist scores are used for each subject's efficacy assessment. The NDA resubmission focused on a consensus method in which at least two of three pathologists needed to agree on a score. The results based on the consensus method were included in the resubmission because FDA had concerns about the inter and intra rater concordance of the central method during the original NDA review. As you will see when we present the results, the method of reading the slides did not affect the overall efficacy conclusions. The safety analysis population for this study includes all randomized and treated subjects up to the data cutoff of December, 20, December 31st, 2021. There are two different efficacy analysis populations. 
The ITT old population was the pre-specified efficacy analysis population for the month 18 interim analysis and included all fibrosis stage two or three subjects, according to the central read method, who were randomized by a specific time point and received at least one dose of investigational product. This data was the focus of the efficacy evaluation for the original NDA submission. ITT histology is a second larger efficacy analysis population, which includes additional subjects who are expected to have the month 18 biopsy according to protocol version eight and earlier, but had this data collected after the cutoff for the pre-specified month 18 interim analysis. Evaluations of all subjects in ITT old or all subjects in ITT histology maintain the full benefits of randomization in this blinded study. And we have confidence in the validity of comparisons between treatment arms. Removing subjects from one of those analysis populations based on post-treatment variables, for example, those who did not complete the scheduled month 18 biopsy, may lead to issues including biased results. When considering results of the efficacy analyses, statistical significance can only be discussed for the pre-specified month 18 interim analysis of the ITT old population. ITT histology is a separate interim analysis that was not pre-specified and not accounted for in the method to control the overall type one error rate. Therefore, p-values and discussion of statistical significance are not applicable for ITT histology. Results are presented for ITT histology because of its larger sample size, which provides additional precision in the estimation of the treatment effect. Now, I will discuss subject disposition and baseline histology characteristics. The briefing documents provide a summary of the subject demographics, and this table provides the disposition of trial subjects in the safety population. The applicant presented some summaries for study discontinuation, and here we present summaries about study drug discontinuation. Per the protocol, subjects who discontinue study drug are encouraged to continue in the study until study termination. There was overall a a high study drug discontinuation rate with 40.5% of subjects discontinuing treatment in the OCA 25 milligram arm and 32.3% of subjects discontinuing treatment in the placebo arm. Additionally, there is a higher rate of treatment discontinuation due to adverse events in the OCA 25 milligram arm at 22.4% compared to the placebo arm at 12%. This table presents baseline histology characteristics for the ITT histology efficacy analysis population. The first grouping of rows shows the baseline fibrosis stage as scored by the central method. Approximately 55 to 60% of subjects in ITT histology had stage three fibrosis at baseline according to the central method with the remainder having stage two fibrosis. When the slides for these same subjects were read by consensus method, some subjects were considered to not have fibrosis stage two or three. FDA considers the consensus method a more accurate way to stage fibrosis. However, the central method may be closer to what is done when determining which patients to treat in clinical practice if a biopsy is required. This table shows that some patients chosen for treatment in practice may have stage four fibrosis, which is cirrhosis. Next, I will present the efficacy results from the month 18 interim analysis of surrogate endpoints. Before I show the numeric results, here's an overview of the statistical conclusions from the month 18 interim analysis. First, the OCA 25 milligram arm demonstrated superiority to the placebo arm on one of the two primary endpoints, improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. The OCA 10 milligram arm failed to demonstrate superiority to the placebo arm on either of the two primary endpoints. Overall, 
all, the conclusions regarding the treatment effect are consistent between each of the analyses using the two histology read methods and the two month 18 analysis populations. Lastly, I will reiterate that these month 18 primary endpoints are reasonably likely surrogate endpoints. So there is uncertainty about how the magnitude of changes observed on the surrogate endpoints may translate into meaningful changes in clinical outcomes. Now I will walk through the results for the month 18 primary endpoint of improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. To orient everyone to the table, I'm going to start by presenting the results from the ITT old population, which was the pre-specified efficacy analysis population. Just over 300 subjects are in each treatment arm. The table shows two rows with results for the central method and the consensus method of reading the histological slides. The number and percentage of subjects who are responders on this endpoint are shown. Looking at the consensus read results, there was a 22.4% response rate in the OCA 25 milligram arm and a 9.6% response rate in the placebo arm. Next, I have added columns to show the risk difference between each OCA dose arm compared to placebo. The risk difference is the percentage of responders in the OCA arm minus the percentage of responders in the placebo arm. Focusing on the results for the OCA 25 milligram arm compared to placebo, the point estimate of the risk difference was 11.1% by the central method and 12.8% by the consensus method. The asterisks in the table denote the results that are statistically significant. The OCA 25 milligram arm demonstrated superiority to placebo for this endpoint and the OCA 10 milligram arm failed to demonstrate superiority to placebo. Next, I will go through the results for the ITT histology population. We can see the sample size for this population increases to just over 530 subjects per treatment arm. Looking at the percentage of responders, the results are generally consistent with the results of the ITT old population. Lastly, I have added in the columns with the risk differences for the ITT histology population. Focusing on the comparison of the OCA 25 milligram arm to placebo, the risk difference in the ITT histology population is estimated to be 8.6% with a 95% confidence interval of 4.2 to 13%. Overall, evaluating this endpoint three different ways leads to point estimates of the risk difference for OCA 25 milligrams compared to placebo, ranging from 8.6% to 12.8%. As presented in the FDA briefing document, analyses evaluating subgroups of patients uh, based on baseline factors, such as baseline fibrosis stage, resulted in generally consistent estimates of the risk difference for this primary endpoint. Now, I will briefly cover the other month 18 primary endpoint, resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis. For this month 18 primary endpoint, both OCA 25 milligrams and 10 milligrams failed to demonstrate superiority to placebo. I will not go through the details of this table, but I will point out that the point estimates for the risk difference were in the range of 2.5 to 3.7% for both OCA dose arms when compared to placebo. When evaluating no worsening of fibrosis, regardless of resolution of NASH, the estimates for the risk difference were in the similar range as those presented here for the pre-specified primary endpoint. To revisit the summary of efficacy results, the OCA 25 milligram arm demonstrated superiority to placebo on one of the two month 18 primary endpoints, which was improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. The point estimates of the risk difference range from 8.6% to 12.8%. The OCA 25 milligram arm failed to demonstrate superiority to placebo on the other primary endpoint, resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis. 
The OCA 10 milligram arm failed to demonstrate superiority to placebo on either of these two primary endpoints. Lastly, there is uncertainty in how the magnitude of change on a surrogate endpoint may translate into meaningful changes on clinical outcomes. Clinical outcomes are still being assessed in this ongoing blinded trial with the intention to later support a traditional approval. Dr. Paul Hayashi will now discuss drug-induced liver injury. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Paul Hayashi. I'm the uh, drug-induced liver injury team lead for DHN. I'll cover, oh, excuse me. I'll cover the predicted DILI fatality rate based on a lethal case associated with OCA, other cholestatic OCA-related cases in study 303, and risk mitigation challenges. I open with this slide because it goes directly to a key finding we wish to emphasize. FDA defines fatality here as death or liver transplant due to DILI. The bar graph provides the predicted DILI fatality rate per 100,000 for OCA and three other drugs. There's a dotted line near the bottom, which marks a threshold of concern. Since the early 2000s, the agency has used this threshold of greater than or equal to three per 100,000 to alert review divisions that there may be a DILI risk that threatens drug approvability. This threshold of concern was placed after several drugs were removed from the market in the 1990s for DILI deaths. And three of, the, three of those drugs are shown here, troglitazone, an oral anti-diabetes drug, Zymalogatran, an oral anticoagulant, and Bromfenac, a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. The predicted date DILI fatality rates were determined retrospectively from pre-market data after the drugs had shown unacceptable fatality rates post-market, hence the threshold of concern, which was based on these and other data analyzed at the time. Since this threshold has been put in place in the early 2000s, no drug has been removed from the market, from the U.S. market for fatal DILI. So the track record for this change has been good. OCA's predicted fatality rate, which was set by the subject who required transplant, is 15 to 30-fold higher than the threshold and 6 to 13-fold higher than the three drugs removed from the market. Of note, Zymalogatran also had a DILI fatality in its clinical trials which set the fatality rate shown. It was approved in 22 countries and removed from all 22 for fatal DILI. It never made it to the U.S. market. The applicant made reference to High's Law and hepatocellular DILI not applying to OCA cholestatic DILI. But this is irrelevant to the key point of this graph. The fundamental goal of DILI risk assessment is to prevent one primary outcome, death due to DILI, period, without stipulation on the DILI type. This is the fundamental goal because for the public, the healthcare system, the patient, the family, it will not matter which liver enzymes are leading that liver downhill. UNOS does not use liver enzymes for transplant listing, and enzymes are not part of the MELT score. In other words, a death due to cholestatic DILI carries the same weight as a death due to hepatocellular DILI. The agency sees no reason to have different fatality tolerances for different types of DILI. So, as we all assess OCA's risk and benefits, it's important to remember this context in which we deliberate, at least from a DILI perspective. This fatality rate also serves as an anchor point for our overall concerns about OCA liver injury. Therefore, much depends on this transplanted subject, and we'll spend some time discussing him. Subject three was a 63-year-old man with NASH and stage two fibrosis. He had no gallstone history. On day one, he started to OCA 25 milligrams. By day 129, he had the symptoms shown. On day 142, he self-discontinued OCA. 
On day 150, his total blue ribbon was 26, ALKFOS 399, and ALT 139. A liver biopsy suggested DILI versus bile duct obstruction. CT, MRI, and ultrasound showed a small dependent gallstone, but otherwise unremarkable biliary system. The rash was pruritus related and felt associated with MRSA bacteremia. Other evaluation testing for etiology of the liver failure did not reveal a cause, and he was listed for liver transplant with ascites and hepatic encephalopathy. By day 164, bacteremia had resolved with negative blood cultures, and he was discharged to home. On day 187, Excuse me. On, by day 164, yes, he was he was discharged by day, on, and on day 175 with a meld of 31 total blood room and 28.5. On day 187, he was readmitted and transplanted at a meld of 39 total blood room and 28.9. The differential for acute cholestatic liver injury with jaundice is not that long. Most cases are explained by bile duct obstruction, cholestasis of sepsis and infiltrating diseases. Bile duct obstruction was ruled out by three imaging modalities. Ducts dilate in acute obstruction when a bilirubin rises to 15 or 20. It would be highly unusual to not have duct dilation. ERCP was not done, even though the need to know about the bile duct is high for transplant evaluation. So presumably the transplant team felt the ducts were clear by imaging. Moreover, a transplant surgeons do a careful direct examination of the bile ducts of the biliary system before liver removal and implantation, and there was no mention of biliary issues. So with bile duct obstruction being unlikely, Dilly rose significantly on the differential based on pre-transplant liver histology. What about cholestasis of sepsis? While this may have contributed to his illness early, his liver failure worsened even after the infection had resolved and he was discharged with a MELDA-31. He was admitted 12 days later with a MELDA-39 and got transplanted the same day, suggesting he was called in and was not infected. So ongoing sex sepsis is highly unlikely, and cholestasis sepsis is not an indication for transplant. Infiltrating diseases of the liver were ruled out by biopsy, and he was not cirrhotic, so acute on chronic liver failure and NASH progression do not fit. Lastly, transplant evaluations are exhaustive, and no non-diagnosis diagnosis was found. So the FDA concluded that other diagnoses had become unlikely by the time of transplant, leaving Dilly as the most plausible explanation. So which drug? There were only two, there were only two contenders considered by the sponsors of Hepatic Safety Adjudication Committee, or HSAC, and the FDA. But the FDA felt that clofenac was much less likely compared to OCA. So why not diclofenac? When one is deciding between two drugs known to cause DILI, it comes down to two primary things. Latency, in other words, how long are patients on the drug before DILI occurs, and the pattern of injury, holostatic, mixed, or hepatocellular. These two factors are essential in defining the signature for a particular DILI. OCA and diclofenac each have their own signature, and on both parameters, this case does not fit at all with diclofenac, and on both parameters, it does fit with OCA. The published graph shows the diclofenac experience of the U.S. Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network, or DILIN. 15 of the 16 cases occurred less than, in less than five months from drug start. Only one occurred at just over six months. In contrast, case three started diclofenac 11.6 months prior to DILI onset, making it a significant outlier on latency. The red color suggests that all the DILIN cases were hepatocellular. Case three's injury was cholestatic. Based on this case series and literature review, Done through the auspices of the National Library of Medicine, liver talks concluded that the majority of cases present within two to six months, and the more severe cases tend to present earlier. The pattern of injury is almost exclusively hepatocellular, although cases presenting with mixed patterns have been reported. Case three was certainly severe, so if anything, the latency, which
would be expected to be less than five months. No cholestatic cases were found in the literature by liver tox. Indeed, if case three was fatal diclofenac liver injury, it would probably be reportable in the Dilly team's opinion. What about OCA? This published series of eight cases of OCA liver injury in patients with PBC or PSC had a 210-day mean latency plus or minus 104. OCA latency was 150 days. All these acute injuries were cholestatic. Four patients needed transplant for acute on chronic liver failure. These data and 17 other reports to the FDA prompted the agency to restrict OCA from PBC patients with decompensated cirrhosis or with compensated cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So case three fits well with OCA for both latency and injury pattern, while diclofenac is a remarkable outlier on both parameters. With no other non dilly causes, with all with other non dilly causes being unlikely and diclofenac's poor fit, the FDA concluded that this case was at least probable, if not highly likely, OCA hepatotoxicity. The same as our assessment in 2020. And as such, the dilly fatality rate was defined in this NDA, just like it was with for zymalogatrin, which was shown on my first slide. We also note that the sponsors HSAC needed, quote, considerable deliberations, end quote, as they debated between possible and probable. One reviewer wrote, quote, patient got both OCA and diclofenac and so have classified it as probable rather than definite. The patient clearly had Dilly, end quote. So we surmise that they agreed at the higher end of possible while the FDA settled at a strong probable. But still, was this case somehow spurious, a case of rare susceptibility never to be seen again? Does it stand alone without similar cases? So we looked for non-fatal but jaundice delete attributable to OCA. This is precisely what we do for a case of fatal hepatocellular delete. To start this search, we show a cholestatic scatter plot for 747-303. Post baseline peak bilirubins, are along the y-axis and peak alkphos levels along the x. OCA 25 milligram subjects are in blue, 10 milligrams in orange, and placebo in gray. There is a general shift in the active arms to the right and upper right compared to placebo, suggesting there is cholestasis and jaundice associated with OCA. The table counts for the right upper and lower quadrants confirm there, were, there are more subjects with alkphos twice normal with and without total bullet ribbon twice normal on OCA versus placebo. So there are data to suggest OCA is associated with cholestasis. But is this imbalance truly due to DILI? So next, we show the blinded assessments by the HSACs of 361 liver injury events in, in 747-303. The HSAC reviewed each event and categorized them as highly likely, probable, possible, or unlikely DILI using the Dilling consensus method and blinded the study arm. On unblinding, there was an imbalance between 25 milligram and placebo arms suggesting OCA was associated with the liver injuries. Among 199 adjudicated events in patients who received OCA, 0.5% were judged as highly likely, 3.5% is probable, and 28.6% is possible DILI. In contrast, among patients who received placebo, none were judged as highly likely, only 0.6% and 6.8% were judged as probable or possible, 92.6% were assessed as unlikely. But still, what was the clinical picture for these events? Were they like case three? Here we show 12 cases with moderate to severe liver injury associated, assessed as at least possible DILI by either the FDA or HSAC. Two to three FDA hepatologists were assigned each case and used the same Dillon scoring method as the HSAC. There are several salient points on this table. First, the FDA and HSAC consensus scores were similar. 
Second, the median latency was long at 370 days with a range of 28 to 912 days. Third, the R value, which is the ratio of the ALT to outcross elevation, suggests a cholestatic injury. An R value of less than or equal to two is considered cholestatic. Here, the median was 0 0.9. Indeed, only two of the 12 were not cholestatic. All but one subject was jaundiced, and five had bilirubin levels over 10. In particular, the subject on line two had a bilirubin rise to nearly 20 without gallstone disease and was considered probable DILI by both the FDA and the HSAC. So there were other cases of cholestatic DILI with severe jaundice, suggesting the case three did not represent a spurious event. Lastly, the four cases with gallstones as alternate diagnoses had the longest latencies, 461 to 912 days. Yet all four were still considered possible DILI by the FDA or the HSAC. I ask you to remember these four because we'll come back to them as we address risk mitigation. Can we mitigate this risk? We see three major challenges. I've mentioned the long latency, but we want to discuss the possible explanation for some of these long latencies. There are data suggesting that the frequency of liver enzyme testing would need to be more frequent than monthly, and the actions needed for the elevation in liver tests may be complex. To understand why the latencies may be long, we first show the data regarding a DILI dose response. Here again are the HSAC assessments of liver injuries in 303. We showed you the 25 milligram and placebo arms before, but here we added in the 10 milligram arm. There is a rising percentage of probable and possible DILI from 10 milligrams to 25, suggesting an increased DILI risk with higher OCA exposure. The second part of explaining the long latency involves gallstones. My colleague, Dr. Stewart, will show you that there was an increased risk of cholelithiasis and its complications with OCA versus placebo. Here we show a study suggesting that induction of fibro fibrosis growth factor 19, or FGF19, and increased cholesterol saturation index may explain the OCA-associated gallstones. 20 patients awaiting elective cholecystectomy for gallstones were randomized to 25 milligrams OCA or placebo for the three weeks prior to surgery. Several tissues, serum, and bile samples were collected at the time of surgery. The cholestatic, excuse me, cholesterol saturation index and gallbladder FGF19 expression were increased with OCA compared to placebo. FGF19 has been associated with gallbladder relaxation and mucin formation in the GI tract. All these factors would favor gallstone formation. So what does this have to do with DILI? Here we show the interaction of OCA liver injury pathways and how it may explain some of the long latencies. The OCA gallstone formation may take months to years. Over time, some will have biliary compromise, which will then lead to increased OCA exposure in the liver. Why? Because biliary, exc biliary excretion is OCA's primary route of exit. This rise in OCA exposure, even if intermittent, would then increase the risk of OCA DILI, thus explaining some of the long latencies. And if you recall, the four possible moderate to severe DILI cases with the longest latencies all had gallstones, with three of those four having documented biliary obstruction. Therefore, this pathophysiology is plausible, may explain the long latency, and would support the need for long-term surveillance. Of note, fibrosis progression may also increase hepatic OC exposure and DILI risk. There is one particular subject that may support this long latency interaction between gallstones and DILI risk. 
Subject one was not cirrhotic at baseline and had no gallstones history. She started OCA, and by day 444, she needed a laparoscopic cholecystectomy for new gallstones. Surgery was uneventful, but by day 461, she was jaundiced and OCA was stopped. ERCP showed no leak, sludge was removed, and a stent placed. However, her bilirubin continued to rise. Another ERCP four days later was normal. A serum OCA concentration happened to have been drawn that day. It was 3,950 nanograms per ml. On the right, you see the mean Cmax OCA concentration by dose and fibrosis in the hepatic impairment study. Subject 1's OCA concentration is 1.8-fold higher than the maximum seen in the eight subjects with F4 fibrosis, suggesting that the bilirubin obstruction may have led to increased OCA exposure and concurrent DILVI that led to the increased bilirubin despite successful therapeutic ERCP. The HSAC and the FDA deemed this case as possible DILVI. The right panel also raises the concern that DILVI risk will increase via OCA exposure via increased OCA exposure at, for patients developing increasing fibrosis and cirrhosis. These data suggest the intrahepatic OCA levels also tend to increase with increasing fibrosis when given the 25 milligram dose, which as I said, would increase the risk of DILI. on. How frequently would liver tests be needed? This is different from latency, which is the drug start to DILI onset. Here we are trying to capture the pace of the DILI onset regardless of latency. So we show the interval between last prior liver tests and DILI onset in red font for the five subjects with at least possible DILI and the five highest peak bilirubin levels shown in the far right column. Arguably, these are the cases we would most want to capture early. All five presented with jaundice, and three had long intervals of 60 to 67 days. So we just don't, so not much help there. We just don't know the pace of injury in those cases. However, two had short intervals of 28 and 36 days between last stable labs and DILI onset, suggesting that testing would need to be done more frequently than monthly to capture these cases. Therefore, because OCA use for NASH is likely to go on for years, patient, patients will need long-term surveillance with a high frequency of liver analyte checks. In September 2017, Study 74730 C's liver safety protocol was tightened for DILI. The major changes are shown with a phone call every two weeks, labs every six weeks, six weeks, and thresholds for repeat labs shown on the right. FDA is concerned about sustainability of such a plan over three or more years. There may be contact fatigue with a call every other week. The low thresholds for repeat testing and complexity for the clinic staff may also take a toll on adherence. Even within the study, nearly 700 repeat labs that should have been done and verified were not. The protocol changes were tested only in a subset of 747303, and effectiveness will be less in the larger post-market population treated for years. We already discussed that rather than every six weeks, blood tests may need to be every two to three weeks, adding to the burden of surveillance. And the applicant's data suggests that the DILI rate went down after these protocol changes based on study level analysis. However, there were still remarkable, clinically serious DILI cases that occurred. You have seen this table of moderate to severe liver injuries already, but the cases that occurred before October 1, 2017 are now in lighter gray font, while cases occurring after the protocol changes are in bold black font. But six of the 12 occurred after the protocol changes. The reason the applicant counted only three subjects with moderate to severe DILI after the protocol changes is that they did not include the 10 milligram arm, which had an additional three cases. 
in fact, in the in line two, the case in line two was in the 10 milligram arm and had a dilly more than a year after the protocol changes. Her peak bilirubin was 19.9, and as I said before, both the AFDA and HSAC felt that this was probable OCA liver injury. So even though the instant rate by patient year declined, we remain concerned that clinically serious dilly may occur under the mitigation plans that mirror the 2017 protocol changes. So I end where I started with some history. There were two primary lessons learned from triglitazone, which was one of the drugs removed from the market for fatal dilly. These lessons make us take pause because they ring familiar as we assess risk mitigation for OCA. One, monitoring and recommendations may not be well followed by physicians even after warning letters are sent to all practicing physicians. Of note, the risk of trogolizone injury spanned about two years, similar to OCA. Number two, some cases of severe hepatotoxicity occur rapidly within less than a reasonable and practical recommended interval for monitoring, indicating that monitoring would provide at best only partial protection, even if recommendations were followed. In sum, the Dilly fatality rate for OCA 25 milligrams is well above that of drugs removed from the market or not approved because of fatal Dilly. There are other cholestatic Dilly cases with severe jaundice in 747-303 that suggest the fatal case was not spurious. FDA is concerned about adherence to K for risk mitigation over long surveillance periods with frequent and multiple types of testing, frequent phone calls, complex action plans in the larger community setting. Now my colleague, Dr. Stewart, will speak with, about other safety issues. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Charmaine Stewart, and I'm the medical reviewer in the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. Dr. Hayashi just reviewed drug-induced liver injury. I'll be discussing other important safety concerns for trial 747-303. The discussion will focus on analyses for OCA 25 milligrams, the to-be-marketed dose, as OCA 10 milligrams did not demonstrate efficacy. In this presentation, I'll define the safety population, adverse events of special interest, AESI, and will conclude with a summary of the agency's safety findings. Safety population of 747-303 differed somewhat from the efficacy population and consisted of 1,968 subjects from the original submission, an additional 509 subjects from this submission for a total of 2,477 subjects. All 2,477 subjects had histologically proven NASH and had received at least one dose of the study drug. 827 subjects were randomized to OCA 25 milligrams, while 825 subjects were randomized to placebo. 825 were randomized to OCA 10 milligrams. The current submission includes approximately three times as many person years of exposure as the original submission. The focus of this review will be the OCA 25 milligram treatment arm and its comparison to placebo. Analyses of incident adverse events outcomes, that is first event, were estimated using incident rates, IR, for within arm estimates and incident rate differences, IRD, for comparing OCA to placebo. The incident rate of an adverse event of interest was calculated by dividing the number of subjects who experienced the event by the total number of person years of follow-up. The incident rate difference was calculated by taking the difference between the incident rate for OCA 25 milligrams and the incident rate for placebo. Analyses of safety outcomes are summarized on the basis of two follow-up windows. 
analyses of treatment emergent adverse events, or TEAEs, dyslipidemia, dysglycemia and pruritus utilized an on-treatment analysis follow-up window. The on-treatment analysis was defined as a follow-up window, including the time from randomization to the earliest of 30 days after treatment discontinuation or last contact date. Analyses of cholelithiasis with associated complications were conducted using an on-study follow-up window, which included time from randomization onto the last available contact date. In this portion of the presentation, I will focus on four adverse events of special interest, AESIs, cholelithiasis, dyslipidemia, dysglycemia, and pruritus. I will now discuss cholelithiasis and its complications. Cholelithiasis, although expected in this population, occurred more frequently in the OCA-treated group. Complications defined by the applicant included ascending cholangitis, acute cholecystitis, perforation, and others. For gallbladder disease and related complications, subjects randomized to OCA 25 milligrams experienced 2.5 events per 100 person years, which was twice as many as placebo subjects, resulting in incident rate difference of 1.2 events per 100 person years. To manage these complications, some subjects underwent additional procedures, such as multiple endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, ERCPs, an endoscopic procedure to evaluate bile ducts and pancreatic ducts. Finally, as shown in the last line, twice as many cholecystectomies were performed in the OCA-treated subjects compared to placebo-treated subjects. In summary, for every 1,000 patients treated with OCA 25 milligrams for one year, we would expect to observe 12 additional gallbladder disease and related complications, six additional cases of severe gallbladder disease and related complications, and eight additional cholecystectomies than would have been observed on placebo. These numbers would double if OCA treatment duration was continued for two years. We will now discuss dyslipidemia. LDL cholesterol was the focus of this discussion as this was the primary lipid abnormality observed with OCA use. Baseline LDL cholesterol was similar across treatment groups with a third of subjects having high LDL cholesterol values, defined as 130 milligram per deciliter or greater at baseline. Also at baseline, approximately half of the subjects were on lipid-modifying therapy, primarily statins. Lipid assessments were conducted during the trial at pre-specified time intervals, baseline, month one, every three months of the first 18 months, and then every six months thereafter. Alerts were sent to the site investigators when a subject's LDL cholesterol increased by 15% or greater over the subject's baseline. More importantly, sustained increases in LDL cholesterol occurred in 488 subjects treated with OCA compared to 204 subjects on placebo, which con constitutes more than two-fold increase in the OCA treated norm, yielding an increased rate difference of 33 subjects per 100 person years with sustained elevations in LDL cholesterol. Reflective of the increased rate of LDL cholesterol elevations was a greater need for initiation and intensification of lipid lowering therapy of subjects not on statins at baseline, roughly 60% of, of subjects randomized to OCA 25 milligrams required initiation of statin therapy, which was about twice as much as placebo subjects. In addition, 20% of OCA 25 milligram subjects, 
that were on statins at baseline required either an increase in their statin dose or were switched to a statin of higher intensity, such as rosuvastatin. This was almost twice as high as placebo subjects. The graph shown here plots the mean LDL cholesterol over time for all three treatment groups. Means of the OCA 25 milligram treatment group is shown on the blue line, and the placebo group means on the green line. At baseline, all three groups had similar mean LDL cholesterol. After four weeks, the earliest assessment of LDL cholesterol on treatment, subjects randomized to OCA 25 milligrams had an increase of LDL cholesterol on average 24 milligram per deciliter. In contrast, the subjects in the placebo-treated group had slight decrease in LDL cholesterol. Over time, LDL cholesterol in OCA-treated subjects declined, which was temporally associated with initiation of statin therapy. However, despite the pre-specified approach for monitoring and initiation or intensification of statin therapy, the mean LDL cholesterol in the OCA-treated arm remained higher than placebo at month 18 an absolute mean difference of 10 milligram per deciliter, and at month 48, absolute difference of 6 milligram per deciliter. In conclusion, subjects treated with OCA had higher sustained LDL cholesterol serum concentrations after initiation of OCA, which triggered initiation or intensification of lipid-modifying therapy, primarily statins. Despite additional lipid therapy, the mean LDL cholesterol remained higher in the OCA-treated group as compared with the placebo group. We will now turn our attention to dysglycemia. Dysglycemia is a common comorbidity in patients with NASH. Not surprisingly, more than four out of five subjects had diabetes or prediabetes at the time of enrollment in 747303. Enrollment criteria permitted inclusion of subjects with type 2 diabetes with hemoglobin A1c below 9.5%. Dosages of diabetes medications were to be stable for three months prior to study day one. Fasting plasma glucose and hemoglobin A1c were calculated at month one, month three, then every three months for 18 months, and every six months thereafter. Glucose elevations in type 2 diabetes were managed by individual site investigators according to the ADA guidelines. Safety monitoring included collecting adverse events related to hyperglycemia. To assess potential OCA effects on glycemic parameters, FDA analyzed fasting plasma glucose and hemoglobin A1c during treatment by baseline diabetes status. For subjects with normal glycemia at baseline, OCA was found to decrease the median time to incident prediabetes by approximately nine months compared to placebo. Three months for OCA subjects compared to 12 months for placebo subjects. At 36 months, many in both treatment groups had progressed to prediabetes with 86% of OCA subjects and 79% of placebo subjects classified as prediabetic. For subjects categorized as prediabetic at baseline, at three months, 21% of OCA-treated subjects and 11% of placebo-treated subjects met the diagnostic criteria for type 2 diabetes. At 36 months, the observed imbalance persisted, with 44% of OCA-treated subjects and 35% of placebo-treated subjects becoming diabetic. Among subjects who had type 2 diabetes at the time of enrollment in the initial trial, OCA decreased the median time to clinically worsening of glycemic control by two months compared to placebo. At 36 months, the majority of both treatment groups experienced glycemic deterioration. 88% of OCA subjects 
and 84% of placebo subjects. In summary, OCA25 milligrams accelerated conversion to incident diabetes and prediabetes and hastened loss of glycemic control in diabetic subjects. The impact of OCA-related dysglycemia on the clinical course of NAS subjects is unknown because there is not a known causal mechanism underlying the hypoglycemia. Finally, I will review pruritus. The applicant pre-specified the severity grading of pruritus as well as the interventions to manage pruritus. Grade one was mild or localized pruritus and was managed with topical therapies. Grade two pruritus was more intense or widespread intermittent with skin changes due to scratching. Grade three and higher grades of pruritus resulted in study drug discontinuation. Pruritus was the most common adverse event. All grades of pruritus occurred more frequently in the OCA arm compared with placebo. The incident rates of pruritus were 36.5 in OCA 25 milligrams and 10.2 in the placebo arm. The incident rate difference was 26.3 with 95% confidence interval of 22.7 to 29.8. The incidence of severe pruritus, which required drug discontinuation, was 2.3 events per 100 person years in the OCA 25 milligram arm. This was 20 fold higher than the placebo group. The increased incidence and severity of pruritus due to OCA can be characterized by the higher rate of treatment discontinuations treatment interruptions, and changes in dosing frequency, as well as the need for topical and systemic medications to manage pruritic symptoms in the OCA arm. As is shown in this table, in the lower portion of the table, more than a third of subjects in the OCA 25 milligram arm who had been categorized as less severe, grade two or less, pruritus, required additional medications to manage pruritic symptoms. In addition, although the protocol did not require drug discontinuation for grade one or two pruritus, 3% of subjects in the OCA arm discontinued from the study, even when the severity of pruritus was not considered severe, that is grade three. In conclusion, OCA 25 milligrams was associated with an increased risk of cholelithiasis, dyslipidemia, dysglycemia, and pruritus as compared with placebo treatment. Cholelithiasis was associated with increased morbidity, including an increased number of cholecystectomies, as well as an increase in the need for other interventions, such as endoscopic retrograde, cholangial pancreatography. Also, as previously discussed by Dr. Hayashi, cholelithiasis, when associated with biliary duct obstruction, may increase daily risk. OCA's effects on LDL cholesterol required initiation or intensification of statin therapy. OCA hastened the development of glucose intolerance, requiring earlier pharmacologic intervention to manage diabetes. More subjects taking OCA experienced treatment discontinuation and required additional therapies to manage pruritus. Thank you. At this time, my colleague, Dr. Mehta, will summarize the agency's presentation with an assessment of benefit risk. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. To wrap up, I will provide a high-level summary of what we have learned from the original submission and what we have learned from this resubmission. In the original submission, efficacy was established for the surrogate endpoint for, of improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. Serious risks were identified from ongoing trial 303, issues identified from 1,968 subjects with a total exposure of 2,395 person years. 
Weighing these risks against modest treatment effect on a surrogate endpoint, the FDA initially concluded that the OCA was associated with an unfavorable benefit risk profile. In this resubmission, our assessment of efficacy has remained unchanged. In the assessment of risks, the larger safety database now includes 2,477 patients with almost a threefold patient years of exposure, thus providing more precise estimates of the risks identified in the original submission. Our concerns regarding these safety risks also remain unchanged. Given these findings, FDA continues to believe that the benefit risk profile of OCF 25 milligram remains concerning. Revisiting the summary of efficacy that Dr. Hager presented earlier, the OCF 25 milligram arm demonstrated superiority to placebo on one of the two month 18 primary endpoints, which was improvement of fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. The estimated risk difference ranged from 8.6% to 12.8%. The OCA 25 milligram arm failed to demonstrate superiority to placebo on the other primary endpoint, resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis. The OCA 10 milligram arm failed to demonstrate superiority to placebo on either of the two endpoints. To place in context a summary of the risks observed to date, if we treated 1,000 patients with OCA 25 milligram for one year, that would translate to approximately 2.4 additional DILI of moderate or greater severity and 11 additional uh, DILI, additional patients with DILI of mild or greater severity. And to contextualize, 1,000 patients treated for two years would approximately double these additional events. Similarly, about 280 events of pruritus were observed of some of the patients had severe pruritus. Um, this is a symptomatic uh, patient uh, reported symptom, which is debilitating. About 200 additional patients with dyslipidemia, and there, were, there'll be, there will be additional cases of cholelithiasis and related complications, including cholecystectomy. I will pause here for a moment to allow you to think if six to eight million people are eligible to receive OCA and contextualize the safety concerns presented here. I will now summarize factors important to the benefit risk consideration of OCA 25 milligrams and their clinical implications. There is modest efficacy of OCA 25 milligram on the surrogate endpoint of one stage improvement of fibrosis with no worsening of NASH. There is uncertainty as to how these histopathologic responses may translate into clinical benefit for the patients because we do not have direct evidence to link these surrogates to clinical outcomes. An added uncertainty includes that OCA increases the incidence of dyslipidemia hastens dysglycemia. The primary driver for mortality in this population is related to cardiovascular events. Only a small subset of NASH population is expected to experience progression to cirrhosis, liver decompensation events, or liver transplant. The clinical benefit, that is trial 303, is still ongoing and collecting outcome data to demonstrate clinical benefit. Moving on to the risk considerations, a clinical trial is the most optimistic setting to monitor and detect DILI. Even in this setting, DILI occurred in the phase three trial with serious consequences. The applicant's proposed frequency of laboratory assessment may not be sufficient to identify subjects who develop DILI, especially given the long latency beyond one year. DILI was observed in the clinical trial subjects beyond year one. If subjects are followed every six months after first year, it is possible that serious delay events are likely to be missed. Cholelithiasis and its complications are associated with significant morbidity, need for hospitalizations, and additional procedures. Even after cholecystectomy is performed, subjects are at risk of developing additional complications of bile duct obstruction. And as Dr. Hayashi noted, which also increases the risk of DILI.
OCA treated subjects had more rapid progression to diabetes or prediabetes in normal glycemic subjects and acceleration of worsening of glycemic control in subjects with diabetes. Pruritus can be a debilitating symptom with many patients requiring symptomatic treatment or treatment interruption or OCA discontinuation. Additional medications required to manage lipidemia and pruritus can exacerbate the polypharmacy and potential for drug-drug interactions, as well as adverse effects associated with additional therapies. The substantial side effect profile of OCA, as demonstrated in the clinical trial, will require intensive management that goes beyond a single practicing gastroenterologist or hepatologist. Moving on to the treatment considerations. Currently, there are no biomarkers that can identify patients who progress to cirrhosis, especially if patient is receiving OCA, especially between stage three fibrosis and stage four fibrosis. Cirrhotic patients should not receive OCA because it lacks efficacy and there is no reasonable expectation of benefit. And it only exposes the patients to OCA-associated risks. Non-invasive tests or NITs can be used in the clinical settings, but they lack accuracy to distinguish between non cirrhotic fibrosis and early cirrhosis, that is cirrhosis in the absence of clinical signs or symptoms or radiological evidence. Therefore, it will be challenging to avoid treatment of cirrhotic patients in a clinical practice. This is the conclusion of FDA's presentation. Thank you for your attention. I will now turn the meeting back to Dr. Lebwall to proceed with clarifying questions. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, uh, and to all of the participants uh, in the FDA presentations. Please pull up slide five. We will now take clarifying questions for FDA presenters. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and the end of your follow-up question with, that is all for my questions, so that we can move on to the next panel member. A reminder, all of these questions should be to the FDA uh, presentation specifically. We'll start with Dr. Lee. Brian Lee, so the, I have two questions um, related to Dilly for Dr. Hayashi. Um, so, you know, you presented the, the proposed mechanism for the cholestatic DILI, which was related to increased cholesterol saturation and biolipogenicity, um, which, which seems like it's related to the gallstones, but on a microscopic level. So if it's not you know, acute and spontaneous and it's a buildup, is and you know, NASH is chronic and suspected to require lifelong treatment, is the risk of this cholestatic DILI expected to be stable across time based on this mechanism? or is it the risk actually anticipated to be cumulative and increase over time? And then my second question was, um, you uh, provided a historical perspective. So is there any precedent for other FDA approved medications with such rigorous lab surveillance recommendations? And you put up on your slide two, every, you know, every two to three weeks. Uh, thanks for the question. So first of all, I. I think maybe you're conflating the, the two, um, the gallstone problem that could cause bilirubin obstruction and the actual daily risk with OCA. We don't know exactly what's causing the daily without the gallstone and bile duct obstruction. The point of that slide was is that you can have an obstruction which would then increase the OCA exposure in the liver and then you are moving into the realm where but previously the patient was doing fine, but it's almost tantamount to a dose increase, and then your cholestatic delay would set in. But the mechanisms are not necessarily linked. We don't know that, um, and I didn't want to confuse you there. Um, did that answer your first question? Because that means that it's not um, necessarily a constant risk. It would be more of a 
intermittent risks if you're talking about building obstruction that may occur at any time. I see. So based, even based on the latency and the liver biopsy result from the patient who underwent transplant, we, we expect that the, the risk is stable for this cholestatic dilly across time. I guess so, because there were cases, in, even in the, the table of 12, that there wasn't a gallstone problem, but the latency was quite, wrong, quite long. Um, to answer your other question about, uh, you know, do, can I think of a, a protocol or a maintenance program that would be every two to three weeks with action plan that goes on for two to three years? I cannot. And I don't know if any of my other colleagues can, but I, I sure. I, so I have a colleague with a lot, a lot more experience here than myself coming to the podium. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Judy Rakusen. I'm the Deputy Director for Safety in the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition. So I think what you're getting to is um, in the time, you know, since 2007 when the FDA Amendments Act of 2007 was passed and gave the authority to the agency to require risk mitigation and <clears throat> risk evaluation and mitigation strategies there have been a handful of drugs that have been approved with these REMS programs that require uh, liver testing. Um, we can bring someone um, this afternoon to give you more detail on that. But in general, the drugs that have been approved with those kind of required uh, uh, LFT uh, liver testing, um, it's no more frequent than monthly. There are uh, drugs that are approved for much more narrow indications, and there's, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of structure around these REMS um, in order to, you know, ensure that these things happen, but uh, we can bring someone up this afternoon if there are more questions about that. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Uh, Dr. Coffey. Yeah, hi, Chris Coffey. Uh, my question is related to slide 102, um, <clears throat> specifically uh, more on the efficacy side for the um, primary fibrosis endpoint. There were two points made uh, in the table. The, the first, I mean, the second is clear to me that it's unclear what the benefit uh, for this endpoint um, would be. Sorry, um, yeah, yeah, would be uncertainty about what that implies to clinical benefit. But the first one where the point is made modest efficacy on surrogate endpoint, I'm not entirely clear I get the rationale for the statement of modest efficacy. So I wondered if, um, if, if um, the FDA could expand on why this is considered modest efficacy and what a meaningful, you know, a more meaningful efficacy that might be expected would be. Uh, this is Rebecca Hager, statistical team leader. Um, from the numeric end, I'll start, and then my clinical colleague will comment further. Um, so as I presented, the point estimates on this endpoint ranged from 8.6% to 12.8%, and I'll let uh, Dr. Mehta comment further. Thank you. So yes, there is modest efficacy. However, it's, what we don't know is what would this one stage reduction in fibrosis really mean in terms of the clinical benefit? Would that would that translate in less transplants or less decompensation? We don't know that because we don't have any clinical trial that has ever shown that one stage reduction is, is it would really mean uh, uh, translate into clinical uh, outcome benefit. Can I follow up? I, I, I completely agree with that last statement. I guess my concern is in the summary, modest implies somewhat suboptimal in terms of language. And, and to me, it seems like a fair assessment would just be say efficacy on surrogate endpoint, but uncertain about why it would lead to clinical benefit. So I, I'm more curious about why kind of classifying efficacy as modest as opposed to it was significant efficacy that may or may not translate to clinical benefit. Yeah, 
<clears throat> this is Frank Anthony, the, the director of the division. Um, I think, you know, modest, um, we would anticipate that a robust or a significant improvement would be more than what we're seeing at 10 or 11 percent. I mean, I, I think that's over placebo. There was some discussion today also, Dr. Coffey, about, you know, there is some degree of resolution and, and uh, of fibrosis even in the placebo cohorts, not only in this trial, but in the published literature. So, you know, taking those things into consideration, um, th this benefit based upon what we currently have from the data available to us uh, indicates that this will be modest. Uh, again, I think one of the issues that's come up here is that, as was mentioned by my statistical colleague, is that we don't have the clinical outcomes. And I would just remind you that we don't have clinical outcomes data for any of these because we don't have any treatments yet. I don't know if that answers your question. And no. I, I do want to add a little bit more that we, out of 100 patients, about 11 to 12 patients would see improvement in fibrosis with OC. So that's why we categorize it as modest. Thank you. Effect size or absolute risk difference. Thank you. Um, so next up is Dr. Chang. Yeah, Lynn Chang. Um, I had two questions. The first one is for Dr. Hager on slide 40. There was a difference in the fibrosis ratings um, assessments by the old method and the consensus method, where in the consensus method, 12 to 13 percent had uh, stage four. And I was wondering if you had efficacy and safety data uh, excluding those patients who, who would not be in the indicated population of F2 or F3. Uh, can we please bring up slide? Um, hold on. We do have results. Uh, the applicant did submit to us results for just fibrosis stage two and stage three patients at baseline. Uh, as determined by the consensus method. Um, so that would exclude those stage four patients. Oh, oh you're saying that the, the data they presented already excluded the, the F4? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying four. to find the results. They were very consistent if we just look at the stage two and stage three fibrosis stage patients at baseline by consensus. Um, could we please bring up uh, slide uh, 152? Um, so once that slide comes up, if we just look at stage two and stage three patients at baseline by consensus, the risk difference is 12.7% um, comparing OCA 25 milligrams to placebo. Um, and the second line has the other endpoint, which was uh, resolution of NASH and no worsening of fibrosis, so 5.2%. Yeah, Does that so, address your question? Yes. Uh, what about the safety, though? Um, so the safety was analyzing the whole safety population. Um, there, there, there was uh, increment in the adverse event as the fibrosis stage increase when we did the subgroup analysis for uh, by stage. So stage one patients had less of severe or more serious adverse events as compared to stage two, and then that further increased in stage three population. Um, we do have a slide. Um, we could pull that up. If... if you would please pull slide 180 or 181. One eighty and one eighty one. So here we can see there was increased incidence, so, uh, increase increasing adverse events as the patients moved as the as the fibrosis stages increased, uh, whether it was pruritus or gallbladder uh, related disease. If you could move on to the next slide, please. One eighty one. Uh, we see the same with um, 
we see we see the same with uh, other uh, even with death events that there was an increase in events of death rate at stage three and stage four, uh, so two and three fibrosis compared to stage one. The applicant does have in their brief uh, their briefing uh, package a table where they have shown this gradient across stage one, stage two, and stage three, and there is an increasing uh, adverse event by stage. Yeah, th this is helpful. It, it's still hard to look at the group as a whole and compare the way the, the safety and efficacy data was collectively versus maybe probably more for safety. It's a little hard to look at all these tables um, and to assess the safety aspect if you excluded the stage four patients. I don't know if that could so be stage presented four a little patients. more easily. I'm sorry, Dr. Chang. Stage four patients were not included in this study. In this study, there were stage two and three patients predominantly, 90%, and 10% stage one fibrosis patients were enrolled. But the, the slide 40 showed that 12 to 13% had stage four. Is that right? Right. So this is Rebecca Hager, statistical team leader. Um, so that was by consensus method. Uh, so some patients who were considered two or three by one rater um, were later considered stage four by consensus. Um, and so the, the point of showing that is that in practice, uh, that could very well be the case. So patients who maybe would have been stage four by a consensus method, which requires three pathologists, may be treated because in practice, even if a liver biopsy is required, it's very unlikely uh, that it would go through that rigorous consensus method. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question is for Dr. Stewart. You know, since there's concern about gallstones, um, I don't, if, if somebody had uh, at baseline gallstones, how did they do? on treatment? Because I don't think that was excluded, right? That, that wasn't an exclusion criteria. Um, this, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, uh, we have not really looked at... Um, yeah. So the patients with gall, gallstones at baseline were enrolled in the clinical trial. There were about... Um, I can't remember the exact number the applicant could clarify, but there were about 20 to 30% patients who had gallstones at baseline. And then few patients developed gallstones during the clinical trial. I was just trying to determine if, if somebody has gallstones at baseline, are they at more risk for adverse events? Whether we did not do that. Or... Yeah, we did not do that analysis. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are all my questions. Uh, next up will be Dr. Manon. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions and a comment. Um, so my first question is, you know, in, pre in preclinical models, rodent models, where OCA has been administered, um, there seems to have been a change in the gut microbiome and, and intestinal permeability and that's favorable. So it's Interesting to me to see that there is a dysglycemic as well as a dys um, a lipidemic effect um, in many of the people who received this, also the placebo. So I was just wondering, is there any data on changes in the microbiome or gut permeability in this study that could be correlated with um, adverse events? Uh, that's a great question, Dr. Min. This is Frank Ania. Um, so to start with, as you probably know, a lot of animal models that demonstrate effectiveness um, do not correlate necessarily with human subjects research. But to, to your point directly, uh, there are no data that we have uh, from the applicant about changes in the microbiota, if that's what you're asking, or permeability. And I don't know that that was obtained in their study that, they, that was reported and the basic science literature. I can't answer that for you, but. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate in many ways the gap between animal models and human experimentation. Um, my second question is, you know, given that the major outcomes here has been sort of non-response and now having a new appreciation for some of the time delay for the potential risk of OCA, would there be consideration of guidance for 
um, stopping this medication for just lack of response rather than waiting for, say, progression of fibrosis, where you could potentially mitigate risk, um, uh, you know, overall. Um, and we just, uh, you know, uh, wondered if that was sort of a consideration at all. So at this point of time, we, we don't know what would that no progression of cirrhosis translate into clinical um, benefit perspective. Uh, the data that we have reviewed so far internally uh, for the 48 or, or 18 months, um, there was no significant difference between the, the, the two, and the placebo and the OCA25 um, for no progression to cirrhosis. And Dr. Hager could uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, yeah, just to clarify, the uh, if we bring up slide 154, it's it's no worsening of fibrosis. So we, we don't have the data on progression to cirrhosis yet. That is still blinded. Um, so to get back to, I think, what your question was, we have, we have the month 18 data um, on a surrogate endpoint, and we are not sure how that would translate into clinical benefit. Um, so even if a subject did not show an effect on fibrosis, uh, you know, we don't know what would happen in clinical benefit. And we don't, also don't know the meaning if they do have an effect of fibrosis and what that would mean for clinical benefit. Um, but just uh, on this slide, this is presenting the no worsening of fibrosis endpoint at month 18 based on the consensus results. Um, so you can see for both ITT old and ITT histology. Uh, so this is like no worsening. Um, and the risk differences are in the last column, 4.5% and 1.1%. Thank you. And my only comment would be the closest thing to the monitoring aspect of this would be in inflammatory bowel disease when we start people on Imuran or 6MP and monitoring their LFTs and maybe amylase and white blood cell count fairly frequently for the first two to three months and then sequentially afterwards. And I would say that while it's very helpful, it is often challenging to make sure everybody's doing it on time. But thank you very much. Uh, just keeping track of the time, I think we'll take just five more minutes before we break. Um, so I'll ask, uh, we'll limit the questions to the three remaining um, uh, advisory committee members with their hands raised. We'll start with Dr. Assis. Hello, David Assis. I have a question for Dr. Mehta based on slide number six, if possible. Can you please pull up slide number six? Dr. Assis, please go ahead and um, speak sure. your question. So yes. Um, so I just want to return a little bit briefly. I apologize to the question raised by Dr. Coffey earlier, which is um, I understood from the comments uh, made by the FDA that there was underwhelming impression of the modest efficacy of the surrogate endpoint. But when I look at the draft 2018 guidance for industry, um, that seems to have been the roadmap for drug development. And so I, I maybe this is not easy to answer, but is there a sense now, a growing sense from the FDA or from others that perhaps the surrogate endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit are not stringent enough um, and that could influence whether or not accelerated approval is appropriate or not versus more traditional approval? Or once again, as Dr. Kofi also requested, is there a sense that the degree to which there was meeting of the endpoint number one was not sufficient? I guess we're struggling a little bit with the 2018 guidance. And that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Assis. We stand by our guidance. We do think that both these endpoints are uh, surrogate endpoints that we, we think are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. The question over here that we are asking is at that of the benefit and risk. So the approval of a drug is contingent on a reasonable benefit risk ratio. So that is where the concern is, and not necessarily, we are not questioning the surrogate endpoint. We still think that these surrogate endpoints would be are acceptable for uh, NASH drug approval. Thank you. I have no more questions. Dr. Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Peter Wilson here. Uh, I had a question for uh, 
Dr. Stewart, and it's related to slide uh, 86. And I think what I would be most interested in is seeing what happens with a higher dose OCA and the topper parts of the distribution on treatment uh, with the OCA. So we see a peak of a mean, I guess it's a mean, a little less than 140. But what about the higher levels? Uh, do they, we may be seeing a relatively uh, conservative estimate of the long-term rise. And the top quartile, for instance, might be cons considerably higher. And then the follow-up on that is uh, also related to uh, some of these patients end up going on statins. It's a dysglycemic question. I'll ask two at the same time. The dysglycemic question is uh, some patients go on statin, and that's going to adversely affect their lipids as seen in meta-analyses of multiple statin trials. So that may not be OCA. It may be statin effect. And that's, yeah. those are my two questions. Thanks. Hi, this is uh, Dolly Mestra. I'm an endocrinologist and I'm um, a clinical reviewer on the diabetes team in the Division of Diabetes, Lipid Disorders, and Obesity. So I'll take your second question um, with regard to um, whether, I think you, you, you said um, effect on lipids, but is your question that you're asking whether um, the initiation of statins had an adverse effect on the glycemia? I would expect that if statins got uh, added on to therapy, but you may have direct data from this trial. So. Yeah, so actually the data very clearly showed that um, within one to three months, we saw an acute abrupt rise in plasma glucose, and that change um, occurred, you know, greater in the um, OCA 25 milligram group than it did in the placebo. And as time went on, um, we did see that the uh, difference between those two groups lessened. But actually, as we um, had started off uh, the discussion, is that um, this entire population of NASH is um, at risk for dysglycemia. And so the lessening that occurred during the trial um, was as much related to worsening of the placebo group as it was mitigation of the hyperglycemia. So I don't, you know, given the timing um, of the hyperglycemia that was noted, I, um, it, it doesn't appear that the statins had an, um, an effect there. And as we followed it over time, um, I, I don't think that there was anything to suggest that when the statins were initiated, they had um, a, a significant impact. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Does yeah, that that's very question? helpful. Okay. Hi, this is Eileen Craig. I'm the acting team lead from the Division of Diabetes, Lipid Disorders, and Obesity, and I'll handle, handle your question about the LDL levels. So certainly on this chart, this is uh, slide 86, is the total population. In the background package, there were also slides that looked at uh, you know, different populations, patients who are not on statins at baseline, um, who did not uh, initiate a statin during the course of the trial, patients that did initiate a statin, and, and then those patients who are on a statin at baseline who either intensified uh, their statin therapy. Uh, this chart certainly has confidence in intervals, but I think to get to your question, I think the best data that we have that we have a slide for is um, slide uh, 198 which looks at post-baseline LDL categorical increases from this study. So if we could pull up that slide. And Can you please pull up slide 198? And so that slide, while we're waiting for that to be pulled up, will just show the different categories of um, subjects that had an LDL greater than 100, greater than 130, and one greater than 190. Uh, milligrams per deciliter across the three treatment groups of OCA10, OCA25, and placebo. Um, and as you would expect, the OCA25 has a you know higher number and percentage of patients who are at um, you know increased mm -hmm. thresholds. Certainly at the you know the 190 and 130. So hopefully that gives you some. Uh, information to answer your question. Yeah, that's that's a concern. 
that's what uh, we might have guessed. I might have guessed is that they're going to need more than statin. Probably they're going to need double uh, double lipid therapy, statin plus something else. That's we agree. That is a concern. Uh, we'll move on to our final question uh, by Dr. Raquela. Yes. Yes, it is Jorge Raquela. I have a question for Dr. Hayashi or Dr. Anania. Any data on hepatic organ concentration among patients with DILI uh, that would allow you to establish there is any relationship between the concentration, hepatic concentration and severity of the, the clinical presentation? And that indirectly provides some insight into mechanism direct, idiosyncratic, indirect? That's a great question. Um, we didn't have intrahepatic concentration of OC levels, at least not provided to us. I, I don't think the, at least not given to us by the applicant. But it's an important question. In, in the diagram I had, there was an arrow going to Dilly and then back to the liver, suggesting that once the Dilly starts, we, we do have some concerns that maybe it will stall the clearance of the OC out of the liver because you've created now cholestasis. So there is this concern I have that once the dilly begins, it may make it harder for the liver to clear that OCA out. But I, I, I get take your point, Dr. Gell, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know, Frank, do you have anything to offer? Okay. Okay. I just want to add Thank that you. it, I just wanted to add that um, although we don't have the PK data in, in another population, that's PBC population, but uh, it, it seemed like that the, even at the lower dose, at five milligram dose, Patients with child pu B and child pu C, or even child pu A with portal hypertension, started having a lot of uh, um, decompensation events or dilly. So that sort of goes into the goes into the the concept that probably the intrahepatic exposures, when they're higher, the liver does not tolerate that very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the questioners and answerers. We will now break for lunch. Uh, we will convene uh, in 33 minutes. That's 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Panel members, please remember there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the lunch break. Additionally, uh, you should plan to reconvene um, around 1.20 p.m., 10 minutes before we start up again, to ensure that you're connected before we reconvene uh, at 1.30. See you then, thank you.
Recording in progress. We will now begin the open public hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral argument to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the applicant, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the applicant's payment of your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee place great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for today is for this open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please speak only when recognized by the chairperson. Thank you for your cooperation. Speaker number one, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number one begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have four minutes. Yes, hi, this is uh, speaker number one. Can you hear me? Speaker yes, number ahead. one? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Abrams from Public Citizens Health Research Group. I have no financial conflicts of interest on this matter. Uh, Non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis with fibrosis, or NASH, as we've heard this morning, impacts millions of people uh, in the U.S. each year and marks liver disease that over many years can lead to transplantation or death. Uh, there are presently no FDA-approved pharmacologic treatments for this illness. Uh, diet and exercise um, induced weight loss and bariatric surgery are both used to treat NASH, but they have uh, challenges, of course. There are currently several pharmaceutical interventions in development for NASH. Today, you are discussing uh, obeticolic acid, or OCA, a synthetic form of uh, bile acid that is slightly different from the native substance that it aims to mimic. Uh, a single randomized placebo-controlled trial, that is trial number 303, which you heard about this morning, was initiated in 2015 to test uh, daily 10 or 25 milligram doses of OCA versus placebo as a treatment for NASH. That trial has since randomized 931 subjects into three equal groups uh, and followed them for 18 months for interim analysis to evaluate two pre-specified surrogate outcomes for the explicit purpose of seeking accelerated approval on OCA. Uh, those analyses plus supplemental analyses with uh, more statistical models and subjects and sometimes longer time horizons have demonstrated uh, only one small therapeutic effect so far, an improvement in fibrosis uh, that was observed in 23% of the 25 milligram patients and 12% of the placebo patients. No differences with placebo was seen with the 10 milligram OCA dose, and neither dose demonstrated efficacy in actually resolving NASH, the other pre-specified outcome. These findings were generally similar with the addition of more subjects and alternative histological grading. Uh, equally important, hundreds of observations from the post hoc uh, and main interim 18 month randomized trial demonstrated many adverse effects of OCA. Focusing hereafter on the 25 milligram dose, we've heard that there have been serious, of, uh, that serious adverse events, for example, occurred in 10.2% of subjects uh, taking the drug and 7.5% uh, of those on placebo. Treatment uh, interruption due to pruritus occurred in 20% versus just 2% of subjects respectively. Probable or possible drug-induced liver disease was identified in 32.1% versus just 7.4% respectively, requiring liver transplantation, as we heard, in at least one case where OCA was used gallbladder disease, 
bad cholesterol increases, worse blood sugar control, and more cancer and kidney injury all were evident with the OCA use versus placebo. Moreover, if OCA were to be approved to treat NASH, it would plausibly dramatically increase the, the need for liver biopsies, or at least uh, uh, liver assays on an ongoing basis. And the use of other drugs such as statins and corticosteroids which have their own adverse effects. Accordingly, the FDA's summary review has concluded that the clinical efficacy of OCA remains unknown and that wider use of the drug will require unrealistic metabolic monitoring and expose patients to numerous drug-induced uh, and other iatrogenic risks. The FDA further concludes that the existing data thus, quote, cannot justify OCA use in NASH subjects with stage two or three fibrosis, close quote. We agree with that assessment, and thus we encourage you, the committee, to vote today against approval of obeticolic acid as a treatment for NASH. Thank you very much. Speaker number two, please unmute and turn on your camera. Will speaker number two begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have four minutes. Uh, this is Wayne Eskridge. I'm the founder and CEO of the uh, Fatty Liver Foundation. I, uh, as a foundation, we get uh, contributions from <laughs> a lot of people, and that includes Intercept. Uh, I'm not personally uh, paid by them, but uh, they have contributed to our uh, programs over the years. <laughs> um, can I have the first slide? Um, to just to get you acquainted, <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> that's that's me uh, uh, and my wife. Um, before uh, I was. Uh, uh, identified. And I'm a typical guy, typical American guy. I gained a pound or two a year for 50 years and, uh, and I ended up uh, pretty big. <clears throat> now, I honestly don't remember <clears throat> ever having to lift my belly to tighten my belt, but clearly I did. But I had gallbladder surgery in 2010, and <clears throat> you can see that uh, my liver looked pretty ugly at that time. And uh, that, of course, started me on my liver journey. But I'm a classical NASH uh, patient. Uh, next slide. A couple of... Uh, Waypoints along the way. Uh, my, my, I had a biopsy in 2010. You can see I had stero stero uh, steatosis at that time. You can see chicken wire F2 um, in that slide. And then in, in uh, 20, and uh, now go back. <laughs> um, the 2015 slide is stage four cirrhosis. You know, I've got bridging cirrhosis. I am a fast uh, progressor. But the thing that I, that makes me uh, unusual is that I'm a near perfect patient because over the next uh, year and a half, I lost 30% of my weight. I stabilized my disease. I have tracked it with FibroScan and MRE and various other tests. <clears throat> and I am now, in fact, uh, a, a high stage two uh, fibrosis score. Next slide. <clears throat> the thing that from a, from a patient perspective that I think we all have to understand is the vast, vast numbers of people that, that we're facing. Uh, if you look at the, you know, this is fairly old data, but if you look at just the increase of hospital admissions as a result of NAFLD NASH, uh, you can see that, you know, we're going to overwhelm the uh, medical industry and you know, at some point in the not too distant future. And, and the reasons, of course, uh, the young lady there with a sandwich, yeah, those are our habits. We, we bring this on ourselves uh, very often with the way we've structured our, our disease or our, our food systems. 
Uh, the young lady there in the corner, you might think that I just think she's a cutie, but um, we see this happening to younger and younger people all the time. And it's also uh, significant that, um, that we have Lee Nash, which uh, she's an example of, uh, people that have, there's a, there's a significant number of people who have Nash who really don't fit the uh, overweight, uh, obese model. Speaker number two, we're now at time. If you could just wrap up your remarks in the next one to two sentences. Oh, my. Uh, next slide. <laughs> could I see the next slide? Um, I really wanted to get to this. What I want to say is that you need a lot. Uh, we're, we're developing a lot of tests. There's a lot of uh, coming things that are available to us. I've used all of these. These are my personal uh, measurements over the years. And we there's talk of requiring biopsy for this, uh, for this treatment. And I think that that ignores the fact that society or science is advancing so fast and we're getting better and better testing equipment every year. Thank you, and speaker number two. I, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to speaker number three. Please unmute and turn on your camera. Well, speaker number three, begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have three minutes. My name is Michael Battel, and I am the president and founder of the Fatty Liver Alliance. I have no financial disclosures to state. Our charitable organization is dedicated to raising awareness about NAFLD and NASH and advocating for access to approved treatments and care. As a NAFLD patient myself, a parent of a NASH patient and over 25 years in the pharmaceutical industry focused on liver health, I bring both a professional and deeply personal perspective to this committee. Physicians are accountable and responsible for patient care. Patients have the right to be informed about the risks and benefits of treatments. Informed patients working alongside their physicians and caregivers are capable of making critical decisions about their treatment paths. The arrival of new treatments like obeticolic acid is a significant milestone for NASH patients and their families. While many might view a 22% primary treatment endpoint success rate as underperforming, I reflect back on the early days of FDA-approved interferon monotherapy for hepatitis C and its low response rate of between 15 and 25% and how it was the building block towards the cure that we have today. Adverse events from treatment like pruritus and elevated LDLs will be manageable and can be resolved. However, we recognize based upon the data that OCA has caused drug-induced liver injury. It is our recommendation that because of for many patients, there is a serious and unmet need for treatment and that treatment may have side effects of concern. The conditions of approval for OCA should include limiting its use to centers of excellence where there's a high level of confidence that only the dedicated patient subgroup populations will receive the treatment and where they can be carefully monitored by specialists. With regard to liver biopsies, we randomly surveyed U.S. NASH treating physicians at the DDW conference just over a week ago, and 90% indicated that they felt non-invasive tests in combination with other diagnostics were an acceptable alternative to a liver biopsy outside of clinical trials. This is another opportunity to empower physicians and patients to choose what they believe is best for the patient's liver health. The choice to treat should belong to physicians and patients together. They will have access to all the available data, including risks and benefits to treatments, enabling them to make the best decisions for their health. An informed patient is an empowered patient, one who can actively participate in their healthcare outcomes. My daughter, Allison, faced her own difficult decisions when managing her NASH. She chose a challenging path, undergoing gastric bypass surgery, losing half her body weight, eliminating her NASH, but is now dealing with subsequent surgeries and health issues. It wasn't an easy journey, but it was her decision and she made her choice based on her options at the time. With the advent of new treatments like OCA, patients have more choices. Yes, these treatments may have side effects. Yes, controls will need to be in place to ensure patient safety, but they do offer patients and their families hope. They offer patients another way to take control of their disease and potentially improve their liver health and quality of life. Thank you to the GI Drug Advisory Committee for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts today. Speaker number four, 
Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number four begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You have four minutes. Yes, my name is Tony Villiotti. I'm a liver transplant recipient resulting from Nash cirrhosis and liver cancer and the founder of Nash Knowledge, a patient advocacy nonprofit. I'm speaking today as a patient and not representing Nash Knowledge. I, I do want to disclose that Nash Knowledge has received grants from Intercept, but will not benefit in any way from this meeting. Nash patients have very limited options in battling their disease. Light lifestyle change is usually seen as the best option, but it is most effective in the early stages of liver disease. This option is not effective for is not often effective for those with F2 or F3, because liver disease is typically asymptomatic and not diagnosed until it has reached a to the stage where it is too late for lifestyle change to be helpful. In addition, studies have shown that lifestyle change goals are seldom achieved, and it does not always work. In my case, I lost 15% of my body weight, but my liver disease continued to advance. This leaves the patient to watch their disease progress to the point where they need a transplant. That's what happened to me. Transplant is in no way an ideal, an ideal outcome for patients. First, not everyone who, who needs a transplant will get one. Second, a transplant brings its own set of, of issues. Post-transplant anti-rejection medications are hard on the body. Since beginning those medications, I have lost about 70% of my kidney function, and my type 2 diabetes has worsened to the point where I take as many as four insulin shots a day. The studies have shown that my experience is not unique. The lack of a medical solution for NASH is a serious and urgent unmet need and robs patients of a viable option. Patients cannot put their disease on pause while drugs are being studied. Absent a medical solution, patients will continue to see their disease, their disease advance and suffer adverse health consequences. Many will die. 2021 study by Dr. Samuel and others projected 18,000 people with F3 will die annually and another 15,000 annual deaths will occur from patients who progress from F3 to F4. With that in perspective, that means that the 30 patients will die during the course of this meeting. Stopping disease uh, progression or, or achieving a one-stage fibrosis improvement is very important, important to patients. This results in patients viewing risk far differently than the FDA staff. The staff use safety risk in absolute sense while, while, while patients view it in relative terms. OCA does not introduce risk into a patient's life. Risk is already there. Patients are living with the risk of deteriorating health and even death from liver disease. In a patient's eyes, the, the side effects of OCA are viewed as a risk that is a, a acceptable when linked with a drug that offers potentially life-saving benefits. There is no benefit associated with, with, maintaining, the, with maintaining the status quo, which is no drug. The choice between the two cases is an easy one for most, most patients. No drug is going to be a magic pill that brings NASH to a halt. NASH is not a one-size-fits-all disease. Different solutions will be a fit for different people. OCA may not be a solution for everyone, but will be a solution for many people. It is an important first step in providing a medical solution to those who advance their disease. I know there are concerns about potential side effects from OCA. We all see TV commercials where a sales pitch for a drug is followed by a list of, uh, of possible scary side effects. The choice is left to the patient in consultation with their doctor to weigh the risks and rewards of that drug. I implore you to give NASH patients that same choice. I strongly support the approval of OCA. Please do not let the search for a perfect solution stop the approval of a good solution. NASH and the patients deserve the right to decide, along with their doctors, whether OCA might help them. I would also add that a liver biopsy should not be a precursor to receiving OCA, as the current state of NITs provides sufficient guidance. I want to thank you for this opportunity to share my views. Speaker number five, please unmute and turn on your uh, camera. Will speaker number five begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you. 
My name is Donna Cryer. I am the founder and CEO of the Global Liver Institute. I have served as a member of the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease NASH Task Force, and I've been a guidelines reviewer for both AASLD and AIDS. I have no financial conflicts of interest. However, the Global Liver Institute, as the convener of the 80-member NASH Council since 2017, um, does have industry partners alongside major cardiovascular, endocrinology, obesity, and hepatology organizations, both patient and medical, as well as minority services organizations. I have also been in your seats twice as a voting member of FDA ADCOMS, including the initial advisory committee for OCA and have followed the data closely. I thank you for your time and attention and your questions. I'll speak uh, for the rest of my brief comments, particularly about the externally led patient-focused drug development meeting that GLI conducted with the community and consequence dis consequent discussions. First, um, we must recognize how many patients die every day due to NASH, how many have died since the CRL, how many will die before an outcomes trial is complete. Death is not a manageable side effect. OCA has not only met the FDA agreed upon endpoint, but the expectation for size effect or efficacy of the patient community for this first drug for the treatment of NASH. This is the beginning of an era, should you allow it, not the apotheosis. We look forward to drugs with many mechanisms of actions to address the heterogeneity that we see with on NASH patients. As the previous speaker testified, we deserve the right to choose. As for these side effects, I have experienced each of the side effects that have been discussed today before my descent into end-stage liver disease and transplantation, puritis, elevated LDL, dysregulation of my glucose, uh, cholestatic disease, and gallbladder removal. These are all manageable. Fourth, the patient community is aligned with the identification of appropriate patients for this particular compound. And this antifibrotic uh, compound is important. So I would ask that you vote yes, uh, that the benefits do outweigh the risks as the patient community has deemed. I would also ask that you vote yes, that we should meet this serious unmet medical need today. Thank you. Speaker number six, please unmute and turn on your camera. Will speaker number six begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have Thank you, committee members, for your attention to my testimony today. I'm Bruce Dimmick. I was compensated for being a patient representative of NASH panels for Pfizer, Bayer, and Salix. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. I'm before you today to relate why approving OCA for the treatment of F2, F3 fibrosis associated with NASH is so critical to myself and all liver patients. I've been dealing with my liver disease for over 11 years now. Without any prior weight or diet issues, I was unaware I, that I had anything wrong until early 2012. That year alone, I averaged a blood test every two weeks, imagings once a month, and three procedures that included two liver biopsies. Through these, I was diagnosed with liver disease. Since those biopsies, I've had two more. Out of the four, one was too fragmented to diagnose from, which led to another one, and the one that I had when I had my gallbladder out in 2019 showed no fibrosis, which turned out to be a sampling error. That points to the need to rely more on non-invasive tests to diagnose NASH. Only three years later, I was finally diagnosed with NRH, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, which is a very rare disease affecting approximately 5,000 in the U.S., and NASH, which led me before you today because for many of the years of my journey, I was told that there are no drugs available to treat any of my conditions, only some of the symptoms. It hasn't been until the last few years that patients were told that there were any drugs being investigated. And now that OCA is at this stage, there is an urgent need to approve this and give patients an actual treatment option. At one point during my journey, I progressed from F1 to F2 to F3 fibrosis in just a year and a half. And if this medication had been available then, my fibrosis may not have progressed to the point it has and could have forestalled or prevented my disease from becoming what it is today. When one is told that there isn't anything that can be done to treat their condition, it can have a detrimental effect on their mental health, which translates through the stress and efforts to manage their diseases to actual physical impacts that can lead them to get sicker as a result. Therefore, if the medication is taken by the targeted population, and even if there are possible side effects to this medication, it should be a decision that is arrived at between the doctor and the patient, as some help or hope is better than no help or hope. And in my case, my lipids are well controlled with medications. 
there is serious unmet need, and without treatments, one disease can get worse, meaning that patients then generally have to endure many more tests, procedures, and imagings that could reasonably be avoided if there was a treatment available to halt or even help reverse the progression of the disease. This burden is also borne by the medical profession as there are consequently more visits to offices, hospitals, freestanding facilities, and pharmacies. Threatened outcomes of not treating liver disease early enough can be liver cancer and or transplantation and or death. These are very expensive to deal with and the cost is paid by the health insurance industry, the patient, and or the public. The hidden costs are the time and or income that patients and their family lose when they go to the doctor for tests, imaging, and procedures. This can result in a drop in their productivity and can affect the efficiency of their place of work. This is assuming that their disease hasn't rendered them disabled and unable to work, like myself since 2012 due to my hepatic encephalopathy. If this issue of treatments of liver disease isn't addressed now, it will get exponentially worse in the near future, as it is estimated there are between 80 to 100 million people in the United States that have fatty liver, and it is further estimated that 25% of those will progress to NASH, putting a major strain on the healthcare industry and the economy as a whole. Uh, I urge you to vote yes, and thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you. Speaker number seven, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number seven begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have four minutes. Sure. Hello, my name is Gina Villiotti Madison, and I want to thank you for the time here today. I'm coming here today as a um, patient, a family member of a patient. However, I am also the executive director of Nash Knowledge. And as Nash Knowledge, um, we do receive grants from um, pharmaceuticals such as Intercept, but I have no um, personal or professional financial interest in the outcome of this meeting and have not received any funding um, personally um, or professionally for this meeting in particular. Um, the funding that we receive is purely for the work that we do to raise awareness out in the community. Um, I am going to be speaking from a, per a personal standpoint today on the effect that my dad's um, uh, liver disease journey and NASH journey has caused. However, um, it's hard to not bring the personal aspect into the work we do professionally as well. So I can speak really clearly that um, the lack of a medication um, and having a medication such as OCA available would strongly improve not just the quality of life for patients themselves and their caregivers, but for a family as a whole. Um, as a daughter of somebody who had NASH, it was just so troubling for our entire family to watch my father's health just continue to deteriorate. Um, my dad has five grandchildren and two of them are my children. And my son really, you know, the simplicity of a child, I think he just said it best one day. And he said, I just don't understand when Pap was so sick, he wasn't getting medicine. And now that he has had his transplant, he has a box full of medications that he has to take every day. And just kind of that simplicity of that from a child and just that confusion. And, you know, my dad, my pap is going through such a, um, you know, watching him just his health de deteriorate and him get sicker and sicker and knowing that there was no medication that he could take. And it was either transplant or death was going to be his only option. And once he finally got that life saving transplant and you think we're walking in the clear, yes, my dad's health has improved drastically from a transplant, which should not be the option for NASH patients. It should not be a transplant. But now as this young child, he's seeing my dad needing to take lots of these medications just so he feels healthy and sees that he's still not at full health. Um, so I really, really, really believe strongly um, that, you know, I'm, I'm here strongly um, in belief that OCA should be approved, that we need medication for NASH, that this really should be a decision that's taken upon um, the patient and their provider together to really weigh what are the risks and what are the benefits because um, we want our patients to be here to be able to make those decisions. Um, if we don't have a medication available, we're seeing more and more people die from NASH. And we, as I mentioned, it's hard to not take my personal and professional and kind of, you know, combine them together, but we go out into the community and we are at tables and we are talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. And I can't even tell you how many people have come up to us and told us that they have had family members who have had fatty liver disease that progressed to NASH to cirrhosis, and they have died because of lack of medication. So I just really, you know, strongly am um, um, encouraging you to really understand and think about that patient view and um, that, you know, patients across the board, you know, should be able to make those decisions for themselves and really be able to, you know, un, um, be able to make the decision if the risks of a medication 
medication, if the side effects of a medication outweigh, um, you know, the benefits that that medication would cause. This truly is an unmet need in the community. Um, we see it so more, and we're seeing the cases of NASH rise every day, and people are dying while we are waiting for a medication to get approved. So I just want to thank you so much for your time today, um, for letting me bring that family perspective, because this truly is a disease that affects the entire family. Um, and medications, and OCA in particular, you know, would just give better outcomes um, to family units as a whole. So thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Speaker number eight, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number eight begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have four minutes. Hi, my name is Beth. I am 62 years old. I live in New York City. I am here representing myself. I'm not being paid to be here. Although full disclosure, I was paid in the past, the last time being 2018 by Intercept as a consultant at various educational programs. Um, I was diagnosed with NASH stage two in the fall of 2017. And over the course of the next year, I was able to change my lifestyle, my eating habits, and I was able to, my liver is healing and the damage is and has been and is um, reversed. However, I feel um, because of personal experience, both my mother and my brother died from NASH. My mother in 94 and my brother in 2014. So when I was diagnosed with it, and I also believe that I was lucky to have had a primary care physician who was on the ball um, because I had absolutely no symptoms and no one had ever mentioned this to me at all. Um, so um, I was motivated because I knew you could die from it. And so also living in New York City, I have access to good doctors and to good food. But I know how hard it is for people to change. Um, I think that if a drug had been available to both my mother and my brother, they may still both be alive today. Um, and I know that also people in other parts of the country don't have the doctors that I have and don't have the access to the food that I have. So that's why I would urge you to approve it because if it gives anybody a leg up or, or buys anybody some time to make the more critical change. And also, I don't know other people's situations. In mine, in my case, you know, I don't understand the science. I'm a success story. I do know that I have to keep on it. I'm monitored um, all the time and I have to stay on top of it. I don't know what might happen. My mother was 67 when she died. My brother wasn't even 60 and I'm 62. So I don't know what the future holds for me, but uh, thank you for listening. I trust you to make the right decision. Speaker number nine, please unmute and turn on your camera. Will speaker number nine begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're representing for the record. You have four minutes. Hi. I'm Betsy Villiotti, and I'm the Vice President of Nash Knowledge. And yes, we have received a grant from Intercept, and my daughter and my husband has told you the rest. But I'm here today to give the caregiver's perspective. Um, I was my husband's caregiver, and I accompanied him to all his doctor's appointments, and I had to find liver-friendly recipes. And at first, Tony seemed to have no symptoms. But he was often tired and confused, but I thought this was just due to his dehydration or, or uh, dehydration and his age, of course. Um, then overnight, everything seemed to change for us. Uh, I was out of the house for about an hour and a half. When I came home, 
County was like trying to walk through a wall. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know where he was. Um, I thought he was dehydrated. I tried to give him a glass of water. He very angrily pushed my hand away. And um, he was rude and disrespectful. And Tony had never been like that in our nearly 40 years of ma marriage. Once I finally got him to the hospital, the doctor said that I was lucky I got home when I did because I could have found Tony in a coma or worse. Immediately, I quit my job. And from that day on, I never knew what Tony was going to show up. The one I married or the one being held uh, captive by this horrid disease. Tony became confused. He was angry. He was throwing things. He was depressed. A totally different person, dependent on me for everything and unable to control his emotions. One day, he's planning a trip for vacation after transplant. The next day, I walk in, hairs rolling down his cheeks, and he's writing his obituary. I became Tony's nurse, his mental health provider, his medical liaison, his chauffeur. I was unemployed, sole manager of the household, very stressed, exhausted, and sleep deprived. And because of the stress, I also started to develop my own health issues. I run a support group for NAFLD and NASH patients. And this disease is now affecting a younger pop population. Many are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. One person, when he could no longer work because of the disease, had to sell his home and move into an apartment that was affordable on his wife's income. Some have school-aged children, and when their disease had progressed to the point that they lost their job, they needed someone to move into the, in with them to be their caregiver, to run the household, and take care of the children. But imagine being a child and not knowing if your loving parent's going to show up or the one held hostage by their liver disease. As my daughter stated, this disease does not affect one person. It affects the entire family. Tony was lucky to receive a life-saving transplant. That's not always the case for everyone. As my daughter said, when we're out in the community at health fairs, we're always approached by people telling us stories of losing a loved one to NASH that progressed to, to cirrhosis. Some who have passed away were in their late 30s and early, early 40s. Um, we talk to hundreds and hundreds of people, and we hear the same story over and over. They had never even heard of NASH until they were diagnosed at stage F2 or F3, and then they progressed on to cirrhosis. Uh, some are now on the transplant list. Others had liver cancer that spread, so they're no longer eligible for a transplant. And sadly, many have died. But I just wonder how many more people need to lose a loved one while this very serious unmet need continues. I am respectfully requesting you to please approve the medication OCA. And thank you for your time. Speaker number 10, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number 10 please introduce yourself and state your name and the organization you're representing for the record. You have four minutes. Hi, my name is David Frank. Uh, I have no financial relationship with Nersep Pharmaceuticals. Um, I am representing myself and uh, a website that I run called Nash Aware to help raise awareness for Nash. <clears throat> Six weeks. That's how quickly mom went from being diagnosed with Nash to leaving us forever. Just enough time for the survival instincts to kick in. Enough time for a family not accustomed to failure to execute a plan of attack, to prepare for a transplant, to bring mom home for a time. And we thought a crash diet change and carefully administered medicine would provide a lifeboat to recover to learn a modest amount about bilirubin levels and cirrhosis and MELD scores and begin to hope that she could beat it. My name is David Frank, and in October 2014, my mother Geraldine passed away after a very brief and completely unexpected battle with late stage NASH. She was only 62 years old and had shown no symptoms until just weeks before being diagnosed. Like most people, my family and I had never even heard of the disease that took her from us. They call NASH the silent killer, and in mom's case, it was certainly true. She was never diagnosed with any form of liver disease at all before NASH. We had noticed some yelling of her eyes and convinced her to go to the doctor about a month earlier, but it took time to get an appointment with a specialist who checked her into a hospital upon the visit. She stayed there for a few days of testing and then was released pending the results of a liver biopsy. My family was concerned but optimistic based on the lack of other symptoms. 
Mom seemed totally fine. Of course, I now know that simply being overweight is one of the most crucial indicators of Nash. A few days later, I received a frantic call in the early hours of the morning from my dad. Something was wrong with mom. Luckily, I was only a few blocks away and raced over to find her in a dazed and confused state, aimlessly walking in circles and incoherent, a condition I later learned <clears throat> was due to her liver failing and not being able to cleanse dangerous toxins from her blood. She was rushed to a local hospital where the initial diagnosis was not good. The liver biopsy returned later that night and confirmed the initial suspicions. Mom had late stage NASH that had progressed to severe cirrhosis. There was no treatment. She needed a liver transplant to live. <clears throat> For a long time afterwards, I struggled with grief, guilt, and a complete feeling of helplessness. And so I started looking for things to do to help others. I researched NASH and other liver diseases and learned as much as I could. I found out that over 90 million Americans are afflicted with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that more than 20 million of them may have already progressed to NASH, most without even knowing it. I read about NASH becoming the leading cause for adults being placed on liver transplant lists, surpassing hepatitis C. I discovered that globally, nearly a quarter of the entire population of the planet might have some form of NAFLD. These numbers are simply staggering. Now combine those daunting figures with the one-two punch of a NASH diagnosis and remedies. Abysmal early detection rates due to a lack of efficient non-invasive diagnostic methods and a total lack of any viable treatments for patients that progress to NASH. Like mom, when you finally figure out that you have a problem, there is nothing you can do about it except hope to be lucky enough to get a transplant. I ultimately decided that I couldn't really read and learn about the disease that took my mom. I had to do something. I started out volunteering with the great folks at the American Liver Foundation and now serve on their board of directors. I also founded NashAware.com to help raise awareness and educate others, and have been tracking the progress of promising pharmaceutical treatments for years. As a patient advocate, I cannot understate the importance of having an approved treatment for NASH. In my many conversations with NASH patients, one of the most daunting psychological issues is that there is no treatment at all, leading to hopelessness and despair. Their GPs are mostly unaware of the specifics of NAFLD NASH disease progression and unable to provide support or guidance on how to manage it. They wait months to get appointments with the hepatologist, only to be told that there are no treatments and any trial spots are full. If they are late stage, they then wait for a liver transplant that may never come. When considering whether or not to approve this drug before the committee today, as well as any other future treatments that may come before it, the severe disease burden that NASH has on the nation must be considered when combined with recent advancements in early diagnostics. Pharmaceutical treatments will be life rafts for the enormous population of aging adults impacted by liver disease. Thank you for allowing me time to tell my story. Speaker number 11, please unmute and turn on your camera. Will speaker number 11 begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You have four minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Pachris. I was an investigator in the phase three Regenerate NASH trial whose data you looked at today. And I was also an investigator in the POISE trial using OCA and primary villicolangitis. I was also a paid participant in a mock advisory board uh, meeting that Intercept held in preparation for this meeting. I've been a clinician and a transplant hepatologist most of that time for 38 years at Scripps Clinic, and therefore I've seen uh, many, many, many hundreds or thousands of patients with end-stage liver disease during my practice. The prior epidemic we had was with hepatitis C, and the period we're in right now reminds me of when the first drugs were approved in 2011 for hepatitis C. The critical drug at that time was called telaprevir. It was an NS3 protease inhibitor, and we had to give it in combination with interferon ribavirin. It was a very toxic drug. It was difficult to give. It required careful monitoring. It was far from perfect therapy. And actually, we stopped using it two years later when better drugs were approved, and now we have fairly easy oral therapy for hepatitis C. Despite that, I treated over 100 patients successfully with telaprevir during that time, and I follow a number of them right now, and I know that some of them would not be alive had I not treated them when they did. So I see an analogy with NASH in 2023. I follow a large number of patients with advanced fibrosis with NASH, and we have no approved therapies for them. Those that are diabetic may be put on semaglutide, and that's 
off-label therapy for NASH because it's based on phase two data. And we certainly have a lot more data with OCA than we have with semaglutide. It doesn't look like semaglutide reverses fibrosis. OCA is clearly not a perfect drug. It's got toxicities and probably will be replaced by more effective, less toxic drugs uh, for NASH eventually when they're approved. However, OCA um, does reverse fibrosis, and we need to start treating patients now, I believe, rather than in a few years. Therefore, I urge the committee to approve OCA for NASH. Thank you. Speaker number 12, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Well, speaker number 12, please uh, introduce yourself. State your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You have four minutes. Hello, um, my name is Dr. Manel Abdul Malik. I uh, currently am representing myself. I'm a director of hepatobiliary diseases at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and the opinions I share are not that of my primary institution. I'm not paid by Intercept to be here today, nor do I have any conflict of interest. But by way of introduction, I've been in the space of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease for 28 years caring for patients with this condition at the time of first reporting that this does progress to cirrhosis. And over the past 28 years, I have in, uh, invested broadly in the clinical trials landscape and in a seasoned trialist. I've participated with the NASH CRN for 17 years of my career and was a leading investigator both on the Flint study, the Regenerate study, and the Reverse It trial, and am well-versed in uh, the side effects and management uh, of OCA. I'm also a uh, certified transplant hepatologist, and all the stories you heard today from our patients and patient advocacy groups are very real and very tangible. Over the years, there is not one day of clinic that I don't see now multiple patients with NASH-related cirrhosis. Every week, I have to experience telling a patient that they don't qualify for transplant, refer a patient to hospice or palliative care, or advocate for transplant listing or be managing focal liver uh, cancers at tumor board meetings. The epidemic of complications from cirrhosis and need for a transplant is escalating and the existing therapies with diet and exercise are not effective for patients with advanced liver disease. We've talked about many concerns that the FDA has in managing uh, OCA in real practice, but I can tell you as a hepatologist, cholestatic DILI is something we manage. In fact, it occurs with many drugs that are currently on the market, including ciprofloxacin, antibiotics, erythromycin, azathioprine, uh, and even recently approved drugs su such as imantinib for cancer. Now, one could argue that NAFLD and NASH are not cancer. However, when patients reach the terminal stages of their disease, their morbidity and mortality is potentially no different than cancer. They're looking at death, transplantation, or downstream medications to treat uh, uh, liver transplantation that do have side effects. And furthermore, when we do advocate for their transplantation, we have to do new and novel things like consider sleeve gastrectomies or bariatric surgery at the tra time of transplantation. This is not uh, a minuscule. So I would advocate that in the hands of hepatologists, we can manage, monitor, and treat cholestatic liver injury from an armamentarium of drugs. There was also concern raised about gallstones. Yes, patients with NAFLD and NASH and diabetes have gallstones, uh, about 20% in fact. What didn't get mentioned is what happens after bariatric surgery. The incidence of new gallstones after bariatric surgery is approximately 20%. And in fact, this occurs because of bile acid recirculation to the liver uh, and patients do develop gallstones and the need for laparoscopic cholecystectomy after Roux-en-Y gastric bypass approaches 
about 20 to 30 percent at one to two years. These are manageable sequela. And in fact, the incidence of post uh, uh, bariatric surgery, gallstones, and need for laparoscopic cholecystectomy exceeds that of what you saw today with a bit, a, a bit of cholic acid nearly tenfold. We've also talked about the dyslipidemia. I happen to be on the writing group for the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease Guidances. And I think now we could broadly say that all patients with NAFLD and NASH metabolic syndrome who are at risk for cardiovascular outcomes should be broadly put on a statin therapy without concern for use unless other side effects occurred. And so I think we have mitigation strategies in place that will help us management, manage dyslipidemia accordingly. As we are, also, time, I'll just ask you to wrap up your remarks in the next sure. one percent. The, the pruritus was very manageable in the overwhelming majority of my patients with topical therapies. And the new incident diabetes that we see actually if challenged with oral glucose tolerance tests, can be uncovered in the majority of patients with NAFLD and NASH. These are all manageable. And as was eloquently put, death is not manageable. And we need to curtail this huge epidemic that we're seeing. And OCA is one way to offset this rapidly rising curve. Thank you. As speaker number 13 has withdrawn, we'll move on to speaker number 14. Please unmute and turn on your camera. Will speaker number 14 begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You have four minutes. Hi, my name is Kimberly Martinez. I am Hispanic. My seven, I'm seven years post liver transplant due to NASH. I was diagnosed age 51. I'm speaking as a patient. My first point I like to make is Hispanic Americans are disproportionately diagnosed with fatty liver. My dad died of cirrhosis in 1998. My sister died of cirrhosis February 2020. In May of 2013, my older brother, Paul, had been on dialysis less than a year. I decided to be his living kidney donor. In May of 2013, I made lifestyle changes, ate healthier. I joined the YMCA. In seven months, I had lost 96 pounds. Uh, December of that year, seven months later, I woke up sick. I, I stayed in bed all day. When my brother came to check on me, soon afterwards, I vomited up a large amount of blood. I landed in the ER, where that night I met a lot of people in a short amount of time. I was emergently banded, admitted, and told by my doctor I had end-stage cirrhosis. In his estimation, I had two years to live. I was shocked. Uh, living with NASH, uh, NASH has many symptoms that lessen quality of life of patients. Fatigue was omnipresent, making tough to be there for my family. I would have insomnia at night, and as soon as the day began, I would want to go to sleep. My eyes were jaundiced. I suffered with ascites in my abdomen and around my lungs. My liver had trouble making clotting factors, so I bled easily. I had bruises. I was cold all the time, even in August, a bone chilling cold that constantly grated on me. I had malnutrition and I suffered muscle wasting. All of this affects your family and work obligations. There are many doctor visits, hospital stays, NASH can destroy lives and does destroy lives and families. The average age of a NASH diagnosis is between 40 and 59. The prime earning years, the years where families are still caring for children and in many cases as elders. Why am I in favor of approval of OCA? Of, uh, OCA? NASH is fast becoming the number one reason for liver transplant. Fatty liver disease progresses NASH many times with to no obvious symptoms. Many primary care doctors don't take fatty liver as seriously as they should. Without a drug therapy to treat fatty liver, doctors have a hands-off approach of advising lifestyle changes and losing weight with no follow-up with anyone that could help patients learn to make the necessary lifestyle changes. A drug therapy, along with lifestyle changes, will be a vast improvement of what is available now. OCA should be approved to begin to meet the serious unmet needs of more than 80 million Americans with fatty liver. It's a tool that can be safely utilized for fatty liver patients under the scrutiny and care of the patients and the doctors. Having effective drug therapy for fatty liver and NASH will help keep more liver disease patients from ending up needing a transplant like me. 
are dying too young, like many of NASH patients I personally know. It will lower the numbers of NASH patients on the transplant list, not only freeing up donated livers for patients in need, but making it possible to have more living donors from the ranks of the patients that will be successfully treated er at earlier stages of NASH, like me. Please don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. With proper guidelines, the drug therapy OCA can be the first shot across the bow of this deadly disease, NASH. Thank you for your time. The open public hearing portion of this meeting is now concluded, and we will no longer take comments from the audience. I would like to thank all of those uh, participants in this open public hearing who've uh, contributed such value to this hearing, and I hope that you understand our efforts to uh, stick to time and appreciate your cooperation with that. Before we move on to the charge of the uh, to the committee, the applicant has requested additional time to clarify some additional items that were raised. For that purpose, we will give the applicant five minutes to present, starting now. Thank you, Dr. Weppold. We appreciate the opportunity to clarify a few questions that arose during the uh, following the FDA's presentation. First, wanted to clarify that we as the sponsor can and will mod uh, monitor which physicians and control which physicians are able to prescribe OCA for NASH if we are to receive accelerated approval. We've shown our ability to do this through PBC, which although is a rare condition, we can control the number of the physicians and make sure that these are at centers of excellence. These are hepatologists and specialist gastroenterologists. Uh, we have already identified those patients and looked at the numbers of subjects who are under their care um, who could be identified using the non-invasive test strategy that we delineated earlier. And that number of subjects is no more than 700,000. So again, because of the uh, known hepatic safety that we are very, very concerned about and want to make sure that the appropriate patients are being identified, the appropriate physicians are being identified to work with those patients, uh, that that is administered safely. I want to then turn to Dr. Tom Capoza uh, and our uh, external physicians who can walk quickly through how the patients that were identified as potential drug-induced liver injury could have been mitigated through our planned uh, hepatic safety mitigation strategy. Dr. Capoza. Thank you. If I could have slide one, please. As a reminder, during our presentation, we uh, proposed a sequential non-invasive test algorithm that would identify patients. Uh, in addition to that algorithm, we included several upper boundary labs, including platelets, albumin, and direct bilirubin. And so using that as a framework for identification of patients, we see that in the group of three that had early onset of lab abnormalities from table 12, two out of the three of those patients clearly had evidence of cirrhosis with probable portal hypertension at baseline. And those two patients would not be uh, within the, the target population. They would be off label and thus would not receive OCA in, uh, uh, in the community. The, uh, the other patient, as you see, uh, did have excursions early that uh, resolved with discontinuation of the investigational product. If I could have slide two now. The second group of patients are those that had excursions in the one month to one year time frame. As you see on the top line in pink, that is the liver transplant case. I would uh, note that uh, there were more than uh, diclofenac as confounders, including allopurinol and amlodipine. Several other patients uh, look to have baseline cirrhosis if we use an NIT algorithm, which also would be uh, contraindicated in terms of therapy. And that other patient actually was not NASH, it was probably alcohol-induced steatohepatitis. If I could go to the last slide, please, uh, slide three, with the greater than one year, we see that there are two more patients that had evidence of cirrhosis that would have had their drug either not initiated or stopped once that was identified. So we do believe that using a non-invasive algorithm, we can clearly identify patients that have high risk and either not initiate therapy or immediately interrupt therapy, which when done will, will mitigate the injury and, and, and is reversible. So earlier there was a question about uh, risk of gallstone, um, gallstone related complications in patients who had gallstones at baseline. If I can have slide two up, please. 
So here we see that the the relative risk for those patients who had gallstones at baseline was actually no different um, than people who did not have gallstones or gallstone status not known at baseline. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Darren McGuire, Dr. Darren, Darren McGuire, Professor of Medicine, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. I'm a general cardiologist and I've spent the last 25 years doing cardiovascular clinical outcomes trials in diabetes, lipids, and obesity. Um, I want to just follow up a little bit on Dr. Wilson's last comment about um, the treatment implications of the rise in, uh, in the LDL cholesterol. If I can have slide three, please. You saw this slide in the core presentation. I think two really important take-home messages here. And the slide on the right represents the patients in 303 who were initiated on statin therapy during the study. And I'll remind you, as is in the FDA briefing document, the median time to initiation is 177 days or roughly uh, six months. And so patients didn't immediately come onto statin. And what you can see in this, uh, unlike the overall population that got back toward baseline at month 18 with the initiation of statin, that accelerates the resolution um, to get back to baseline at month, month 12. And the panel on the left is the most reassuring data that I've seen in this in this presentation with with regard to LDL cholesterol. Um, this was a randomized prospective uh, trial of four, three different doses of OCA and placebo who were treated for four weeks. And then everyone independent of LDL cholesterol was initiated on 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, including the placebo group. And what you can see is there's an immediate, immediate drop resolution of the excess LDL cholesterol. And in fact, an excursion below baseline um, to a very small, uh, somewhere around 10 milligram per deciliter contrast with placebo that occurs within eight weeks and is sustained out to 16 weeks. And so this is just 10 milligrams of atorvastatin. We would use 40 milligrams at a minimum and probably, probably 80 milligrams for most patients with NASH and comorbidities for cardiovascular risk. Thank you. And, and with that, it's time. Uh, thank you for these clarifications. We will now proceed with the charge to the committee from Dr. Frank Anania. Division Director of the Division of Hepatology and Nutrition, and on behalf of all of my colleagues here at the Food and Drug Administration, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to all of the participants, the study participants in 303, the applicant and all of its speakers, and the passionate hearing that we heard from the American people today. Most of all, I want to thank the advisory committee. We appreciate your service and we know how much time it took to get here today and how much work you did in preparation. As AC members, you have been selected by the FDA to advise us with your best scientific expertise, and you were selected based upon that expertise and your stature in the field. We will review once again the topics that will be laid before you in this final segment of the agenda, in which you will discuss several questions that I think are important following today's discussion. There will be two voting questions. One is a yes, no question, and the other is a choice, a multiple choice question. Before I turn the meeting over to you as a committee, I wanna make a few comments about advisory committees. Just as a mind to the committee, the applicant, and this public listening today, that advice is exactly that, and it is non-binding to the agency, and any regulatory action taking on this product will be at the discretion of the Food and Drug Administration. Now, there are a number of things in which the applicant and the agency concur, and I want to go over those first so that we can put the benefit risk into context. To begin with, we agree with the applicant and with the patients who spoke passionately today that NASH is clearly an unmet medical need and that specific pharmacotherapy as yet has not been approved in the United States. We also agree with the applicant that there are somewhere between six and eight million Americans that would be eligible for this potential treatment should it be approved. We also concur with the applicant that in general, as I think everyone saw today, the efficacy statistical analyses are relatively the same by the applicant and the agency. However, a couple of things to keep in mind about this. NASH is a chronic illness. 
and therapy will be at least for several years, if not lifelong. It is like the conditions in which it travels, type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and the like. We cannot be sure that the treatment will be for lifelong. Another question that has come up about the progression of fibrosis. In the ASLD guidance for caring for patients that was recently updated, the guidance notes that the rate of fibrosis progression and hepatic decompensation varies from individual and depends not only on fibrosis baseline severity, but also on other factors, including genetic, individual, environmental, as well as other comorbidities that the patients may have. Now, we recognize the spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, including NASH, is common. And while some patients do progress with cirrhosis, NASH disease progression is, as I indicated, invariable and can be slow. We are not yet sure who progresses faster compared to others. In some cases, the progression to cirrhosis can take years. I remind also that the spectrum of disease, except for those that are cirrhotic, the number one cause of death is related to cardiovascular disease and the development of non-hepatic malignancy. I also point out that in all mouse trials, cardiovascular outcomes, such as in this trial, are limited by the number of subjects enrolled and the scope of the trial. Now, the proposed indication is written here, and you heard it today, that the applicant wants to apply for approval under the accelerated pathway to use 25 milligrams of OCA to treat adult patients with pre serotic NASH. Just a point of clarification about the FDA guidance that was published in 2018. The guidance denotes that treatment indication is for patients who have F2 and F3 fibrosis. That is to say, patients with NASH in the absence of fibrosis, stage zero, or minimal fibrosis, F1, we do not concur, should be treated. I also want to point out another issue that was brought up today, and that is that the dose of the drug, 25 milligrams, is two and a half times the dose that has been prescribed for the drug that was approved for primary biliary cholangitis. As has also been pointed out, the disease for which this drug has been approved affects about 200, 225,000 Americans. The treatment indication for this condition, NASH, would be somewhere between 6 and 8 million Americans. Now, Dr. Mehta reviewed the initial complete response that we made when the applicant submitted its application in late 2019. As you heard today, OCA 25 milligrams met one of the two surrogate endpoints likely to predict clinical benefit. That is one stage reduction in fibrosis and no worsening of NASH. And that treatment difference was 11.1%. However, OCA 25 milligrams did not meet the second endpoint, NASH resolution and no worsening of fibrosis. And as we heard before from both the applicant and the agency that the 10 milligram dose did not meet statistical significance on either surrogate endpoint. Now, at the time the initial application was reviewed, key safety concerns were demonstrated uh, as we show here today, and I'm not going to go through all these. You've heard about them. Following review of, the re of this application, in the revised application in December 22, the conclusion of the review team at that time felt that safety was another a major serious concern. And this slide summarizes what was relayed to the applicant uh, in their initial CR letter that was sent in June of 2020. Now, in comparison the findings, what is the issue for, I, for the charge today to the advisory committee? You heard a lot about benefit risk on behalf of my colleagues who spoke to you from the agency. Benefit risk is what we need to assess to, uh, to consider approval of any agent. The original submission, as we heard today, showed efficacy that we reviewed for you and the uh, applicant reviewed. 
and that serious risks were identified at that time. And at that time, the agency concluded that there was an unfavorable benefit risk assessment. <clears throat> in terms of the resubmission, the efficacy in general has not changed in large measure from the original submission. However, because as was stated both by the applicant and the agency, there was more safety data to, to, to allow us to do more investigations and analyses. And you can see at the last line of this slide I made that the larger safety, safety database provided us with significant patient exposure compared to the initial application. Now, Dr. Mehta presented this slide to you, and I'm not going to go through all of the details, but I want to make a few points about it as I uh, close the day and turn that meeting over to the chair and to all of you. This summarizes some of the key adverse events that the agency considers considerable, and the calculations are for you to, to, to review. Now, because the initial application in terms of benefit risk was assessed to have modest benefit because it was a surrogate endpoint, and compared to all of the safety issues, the FDA, in its complete response letter of June of 2020, recommended to the applicant to withhold resubmitting their application until they completed the ongoing trial 303, which would yield clinical outcomes data related to benefit. The applicant chose to resubmit this application without these clinical outcomes data. The FDA's ability to assess clinical benefit compared to risk, therefore, is unchanged from the initial submission. I would also like to point out that since there are no drugs approved for this indication on the accelerated approval pathway, that the surrogate endpoints have not been verified yet as having clinical outcomes or clinical benefit, excuse me. This resubmission included the added person years of safety information from the ongoing trial 303. So the additional time and additional events provide more clearly the clinical risks that have been outlined for you today in the population to be treated. Therefore, while the efficacy data have remained unchanged, and we don't dispute those, the safety data in this resubmission provide more certainty and not less on the safety risks associated with OCA 25 milligrams. This slide was shown to you by my colleague, Dr. Hayashi, today. The most concerning safety signal is DILI. OCA has a DILI fatality rate that he pointed out to you that is far above other programs for which the drugs were removed from the marketplace. Now, the members of the review team have had considerable deliberation on DILI risk and are concerned that this risk in clinical practice would be difficult to mitigate and manage in the nearly six to eight million people that could be potentially eligible for this drug. Importantly, as stated, that the drug will be taken for a prolonged period, perhaps long, for a prolonged time. I also want to make a comment about the NIT data. To our knowledge, the use of NITs or any risk mitigation strategy based upon the law enacted by Congress in 2007 would be difficult to, uh, to take care of an 8 million patients and would put a great strain on the healthcare system and the providers, not to mention that the inherence, as Dr. Hayashi indicated, would be far more difficult as treatment period ensued. So about the benefit risk, we are certainly concerned that the OCA risk has been magnified here because of the uh, report by the sponsor, by the applicant, excuse me, that the risk to NASH patients with compensated cirrhosis may be higher because they demonstrated no efficacy in one stage reversal of stage four fibrosis to stage three. So there is no benefit to a compensated cirrhotic to take this medication. The applicant also acknowledges that once a patient becomes cirrhotic, therefore, the patient should be withdrawn. And this is in, 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 mid, in, in, in line with the safety labeling change on the drug at 10 milligrams 
for PBC. Now, respectfully, let's talk a minute about the non-invasive testing. While the agency has come to recognize that non-invasive testing is a good tool to identify patients who have NAFLD that may have NASH and that could be eligible for treatment, we do not concur respectfully with the applicant that these tests are ready for prime time use because the data are not available. And I would add to the committee and to those listening today that this is the reason why we have not yet accepted NITs to gauge efficacy in market applications. The data are not available yet. They're preliminary. In fact, the guidances that were quoted by the applicant from the AGA, the ASLD, and other societies indicates primarily utility of non-invasive testing for screening patients in primary care settings to send them, therefore, to hepatologists and gastroenterologists. Therefore, with the additional data that we have been provided in this resubmission, and considering the entire OCA development program for NASH, the FDA remains concerned about the overall benefit risk of the agent. Now, I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Boal and to the advisory committee. We are anxious to hear your thoughts, and we want to thank you very much for your attention. I will not read the questions again. I think they have been reviewed uh, for you and for the sake of time. And I turn the meeting back over to the chair. Thank you very much for your attention. The committee will now turn its attention to address the task at hand. The careful consideration of the data before the committee as well as the public comments. We will now proceed with the questions to the committee and panel discussions. I'd like to remind public observers that while this meeting is open for public observation, public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. After I read each question, we'll pause for any questions or comments concerning its wording. We'll proceed with our first question, which is a discussion question. Discuss the strength of the available efficacy data on the histopathologic endpoint, a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit in NASH patients with stage two or three fibrosis treated with OCA 25 milligrams. Before we get into discussion, I'd like to know if there are any questions about the specific wording of the question. If there are no questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we'll now open the question to discussion. I encourage panel members to use the raise hand function. As a reminder, uh, this discussion really is only for panel members voting and non-voting. Um, if um, there are specific questions directed at FDA or the applicant, we may ask uh, them to respond, but this really is for the panel members themselves. So um, feel free to start using that function and we'll start um, on this uh, discussion question number one. If there are no uh, hands raised quite yet, why don't I kick things off? One thing that I, I noted was that when, um, you know, moving from um, smaller sample sizes to larger sample sizes, and also from the initial histopathologic grading system to the consensus grading system, it appears that the effect size is shrinking somewhat. Um, it's settling at um, not quite 10% in terms of the difference between OCA 25 milligrams and placebo. Um, and actually when comparing um, that to phase two data, the effect size uh, back then was, was larger yet. So I'm wondering why even before this is let out into the world, we're seeing um, uh, a shrinking uh, efficacy. Um, just, just a comment out there. Um, Dr. Uh, Solna, I see that you have your hand raised. I don't know if that's a response to this question or if you have this. You know, it's similar. I, as Steve Solga, I thought I'd just jump in and kickstart conversation. Um, I, I'm actually pretty positive about the, the efficacy data for stage two, stage three fibrosis, but in NASH. And, and I don't think the NASH part has been discussed so much. We heard presentations about the utility of non-invasive testing to identify the F2s and F3s. 
but not whether it's Nash versus not Nash, then we, we recognize that there is an, an enormous number of people with fatty liver who may be at F2 or F3, but they're not at super high risk of progression because they don't have Nash. And we don't have a, a, a net for Nash that we have confidence in. So I, one of my concerns on, on potential approval is that, yeah, there may be efficacy for fibrosis in the highest risk patients, Nash patients, but very rapidly, I think who's going to get treated with this would be a bunch of people with fatty liver who do have the fibrosis, but may not actually have more uh, likely to progress the NASH component. And, and that's not something that was really discussed in the, the NIT um, the conversation this morning, or I don't think it's, I, don't, I haven't heard it since. Dr. Uh, Dr. Floyd. Hi, this is James Floyd. I just wanted to comment that I, I agree with the FDA's characterization of um, evidence of modest benefit that's quite uncertain because in contrast with things like lowering blood pressure or treating LDLC, where treatment effects on these surrogates have reliably reproduced and translated into treatment effects on clinical outcomes, we actually have no idea. We might hope or expect that it will but we don't, and that's no one's fault, but it does factor into the great uh, amount of uncertainty about the treatment effects on clinical outcomes, um, which the sponsor and the FDA are doing this the right way. Those events are accruing and we will have an answer at some point. This isn't a situation where it's impossible to collect those data for you know logistic or operational reasons. We will have those data, just like in the early days of the HIV epidemic, you know, we investigated various surrogates, but we also collected clinical outcomes data. And when those data came out, they verified, you know, you know re reduced suppressing viral load as a validated surrogate. So I think that evidence will come, but at this point in time, this is a very uncertain efficacy assessment. And I agree with FDA. Thank you. Yeah, I'm reminded of this um, quote often um, attributed to Adam Sifu from Chicago. A surrogate endpoint is something a patient didn't care about until a doctor told him about it, right? Um, there are certain well-validated surrogate outcomes. This one has a good amount of observational data behind it, but in terms of as a tr uh, target of a treatment, we're not there. Um, and so while we have an effect size, how to interpret that effect size in light of uncertainty regarding its connection with the ultimate outcomes, including the primary endpoints of this trial, um, we have to use our best judgment. Dr. Lee? Just a comment on, you know, the, that this is a surrogate. So, you know, surrogates are not events. And in this case, I think we're, we're really conflating. Um, we have, sorry, risk of conflating what we've seen from observational studies. So I think that the clinical benefit from, you know, fibrosis is really related to that. We know that fibrosis is associated with clinical events. We know that in natural history studies or weight loss or bariatric surgeries, that reduction in fibrosis reduces the events, but those studies, those mechanisms affect different pathways. So, you know, for example, bariatric surgery or weight loss, they improve the lipid profile, they improve the diabetic profile. Um, and that, you know, mediates the, the mechanism for the event. So, you know, actually in this case, we're actually going in the opposite direction for some of these pathways. So I think that needs to be considered when we're, when we're trying to speculate as to what the surrogate means in terms of clinical benefit. Dr. Assis. Uh, David Assis. Um, I agree with the FDA's um, assessment of a modest uh, uh, effect as seen in this surrogate um, endpoint. I think an additional concern that I have, which I think was highlighted earlier, is that there, even if this is correct as an um, efficacy, which I don't doubt. Um, as far as a reduction of the surrogate endpoint, I do worry that in real practice with a potential approval that only a minority of patients would truly undergo the histologic assessment upon which this was based. I think the NITs are you know, very promising and um, tool. And as I think was just mentioned at the preceding talk are used for screening and for categorization, but as a measure of response to therapy, there is some concern that in real world the histologic assessment pre and post will just not be done. And if it is done on eight or 9 million people, there is a risk of um, um, 
some morbidity from that alone. Thank you. Theo Heller. I'm afraid we might be having trouble hearing you. Maybe if you, um, if we can have AV work with uh, Dr. Heller, uh, we can come circle back to him. Uh, Dr. Saja. Mark Saja. I'd also like to express some concerns uh, similar to the others about the surrogate uh, endpoint and the importance of the efficacy achieved in that. Uh, NASH is not just fibrosis, uh, as we've talked about. It's other factors as well, other components as well. And in fact, fibrosis is really a secondary effect to hepatocyte injury and cell death and the inflammation that occurs in this disease. So although I think you know, the applicant has done a good job in addressing the surrogate given to her, them, uh, we have to consider the possibility that the surrogate is not a good one. And several other things have been mentioned in the questions. I think uh, Dr. Jorge Rockla mentioned the fact you may reduce fibrosis but have no effect on portal hypertension, and therefore reducing fibrosis will have no clinical effect on the patient. We may eliminate fibrosis, but again, liver injury and inflammation are going on, continuing to go on. And for that reason, uh, the patient develops liver failure. And again, eliminating fibrosis has no uh, important effect. Patient may die from their cardiovascular disease, obviously, as well. And again, we wouldn't expect a reduction in fibrosis to affect that. Uh, and I'd like to highlight what one of the other uh, uh, advisors mentioned. I was, I was bothered by the fact that the applicant three or four times in the application compared this treatment to uh, bariatric surgery. And in bariatric surgery, in many of the studies, it was greater than an 85% resolution of NASH, as well as an effect on fibrosis. So I think it's really unfair to compare that and say, well, we eliminated fibrosis in bariatric surgery that had a clinical outcome that was beneficial. Therefore, this is a similar situation. I think the situation where you just have an effect on fibrosis is very different. Thank you. Thank you. If I could actually ask a question um, to the sponsor, um, and if we have the ability to call up slides, uh, CC59, I believe, is the slide that would be relevant to this question. This touches on um, efficacy to some degree. This was not the primary um, histologic endpoint, um, but it was another endpoint basically ignoring steatohepatitis, looking just at fibrosis, showing that those who got OCA 25 milligrams had a higher proportion um, of individuals who had um, improved fibrosis. Um, uh, and 17.6% had a worsened fibrosis stage. I guess my question is, um, among those who started at F3, what proportion of OCA 25 milligram patients worsened by one stage, i.e. F4, and really for safety purposes and futility purposes should stop the drug? So in those patients who were F3 at baseline, about 15% worsened while on OCA 25. So a majority of these patients, uh, a slightly greater percentage than were F2 at baseline. Um, we do have the opportunity to address um, other ways to assess NASH and specifically steatohepatitis. Um, that was the original primary endpoint in the Flint study, as I think was referenced earlier. And we did look at uh, steatohepatitis not using the current guidance, as I think has been addressed. There are still uh, new data that are emerging in the field of NASH about the overall importance of fibrosis, which I think has now been very strongly associated with those uh, outcomes, and the but that the underall uh, uh, overall damage is is initiated by steatohepatitis. So we do have global assessments of steatohepatitis that I think I could ask Dr. Sanyal to speak to on the um, both from the Flint phase two study and on this study as well. 
Director. Thank you. I think for now, um, we'll okay. continue the discussion among advisory members, okay. but if yeah. any advisory panel members have questions specifically for the applicant, um, by all means, we'll ask you to reply. Um, I, I see that um, Dr. Hunsberger from um, FDA uh, requested to clarify comment. Actually, uh, Dr. Hunsberger, I'm from NIH and part of the advisory committee. I'm not from um, Forgive me. FDA, so just clarify. Um, so I, too, am worried about the, uh, the, the translation of a, a surrogate endpoint to the clinical benefit. I mean, we've seen it in many different situations where it just doesn't translate. And typically, you would need a much bigger effect on a surrogate to, to see anything on a clinical endpoint. Um, and then I'm also worried about in the real world where you wouldn't have this close monitoring likely that your your benefit would be reduced and we wouldn't even know it. And, the, and then finally, um, what I would really like to see if, if you know, the, that slide C, C59, if you would do a combined endpoint of either worsening or having one of those bad safety events that, that could easily wipe out any, any benefit that you saw if, you, if you're saying that the, you know, all you want to do is slow progression. If you do a combined thing of, of safety and, um, no, no progression. I think you would wipe out everything. So, so I, I agree that with the FDA that using the surrogate endpoint is, is um, probably not strong enough data. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coffey. Yeah, hi, um, Chris Coffey. I, I, I just wanted to to make a comment on kind of the last discussion. I agree if you put the risk benefit ratio in this, but I mean as written we're just looking at the available efficacy data. And I did want to make a plug. I don't think the surrogate endpoint in and of itself, if there was no risk concern, is as negative as the conversation has went, right? I mean, if there was no safety concerns, I think given the data that we've seen for efficacy, this would be acceptable. I mean, there's an FDA guidance document that supports this as a, you know, a, as a surrogate to be used for this purpose. So I did want to just come back to that where I think um, and, and some of this may get to the wording of the question that, you know, um, maybe maybe we should have clarified. But if you just look at the available efficacy data by itself, I think it's pretty promising. It's when you get into the risk benefit discussion that it becomes a bit more complicated. Thank you. Dr. Rakella. Mute. Yes, um, I. You know, I, I think as uh, described, it's a modest improvement and um, progress, but it's progress. I mean, we can say it's 8% to 10% uh, of improvement of what we had compared with the uh, control group. What, what really worries me, not only on one side, whether this improvement will translate in improvement of uh, better clinical outcomes, as was outlined by Dr. Anania and the FDA group. <clears throat> but also, uh, the concern I have is about DILI in these patients. And, uh, and even with the close monitoring that uh, has been suggested that will be impact heavily in the practice of several groups because of the frequency of tests that have to be done, uh, and they may still occur. And, uh, and I would like to know more about what, what is the mechanism of this cholestatic delay these patients have. And that's why I was asking the question about concentration of OCA in the liver, because it, it seems to be a correlation with the, the dose that we use, that this would be more serious in those with higher dose with lo versus lower dose. Uh, so that would point towards a direct toxic effect versus idiosyncratic, which would be unexpected, probably immune-mediated, et cetera, we don't know. So that, that, that is the concern I have. And, and, and the fact that the, that is happening in these patients, and only you need one patient in your practice to, to occur, and, and your enthusiasm will fade away very quickly. Uh, whether you can rescue the patient with transplantation, as was done with these uh, with the cases we discussed, um, and and although the, the presentation by the applicant uh, was well, very well done in terms of showing that some of these serious uh, delay who have been prevented by the, the the monitoring that has been suggested, 
So on one hand, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that there is progress in what we had before these studies, that there is a recorded modest, eight to 10%, and, and, and that progress has a price, which has to do with Dili, and, and that Dili can be very severe, and I, I, I would need to know more about it, how unpredictable it is, how real is the situation this uh, side effect would be prevented by a mitigating policy as suggested, and and my my enthusiasm is is tampered by that in terms of the the, the occurrence of Dili, and and then I would say maybe waiting as suggested until we get the longer follow up in this uh, the, the study three hundred three would be wise. We'll learn more how much of this impact in fibrosis will translate into a better clinical outcome. And also we know we know more about DILI, uh, hepatotoxicity, the drug-induced liver injury in this case. Thank you, Dr. Akella. And I suggest we expand our discussion of DILI in the next um, discussion question um, shortly. Um, but while we're focusing on efficacy, and I, I appreciate that, you know, the, the, it's sort of a... Uh, um, two-sided coin, because our assessment of efficacy does depend on how concerned we are about toxicity. Um, let's continue this discussion for question one. Dr. Lee. Just a brief comment that I, I do think it's really important to um, assess risks when we're thinking about this question, because in the end, the clinical benefit will be measured by reduction in liver-related events and all-cause mortality. And if we're seeing in this population that the majority of deaths will be from cardiovascular disease, cancer events, and liver-related events, then if the main risks and safety signals have been DILI um, and worsening cardiometabolic profile, I think we have to consider those risks in this question. Yeah, point taken. And you know, fortunately, um, the primary endpoint of the trial will will shed more light while we're so still driving in this heavy fog. Um, I'll, I look forward to more comments, uh, Dr. Manon. So I think apropos of that last comment, uh, for me, you know, one of the big shadows kind of over this conversation, in my judgment, is the mortality data that was presented by FDA. And so my question is, um, those deaths, were they all within the context of phase four data? What was the dosing of the OCA? What was, um, were these in the context of other trials? How many of these were with off-label use? Those kinds of things. I'm just trying to see how the, that risk would relate to the trial we're talking about now. Thanks, Dr. Manon. Now, um, if FDA would like to um, respond to that question about overall mortality and the new, just the raw numbers, even if not percentages, just raise your hand um, and we'll, um, I'll, I'll recognize you. Dr. Marr. Um, this, is, this is Ruby uh, from the FDA. So the, the data on death that has been presented in the briefing document, those patients were dosed um, in the in the 303 trial. They were dosed with OCA 25 milligram. Um, in the the Japanese trial, there were no deaths. In the Flint trial, there were two deaths again. OCA 25 milligram dose. So all the trials we had OCA 25 milligram dose. Could you please pull up slide 190? Thank you. And. Uh, this is not phase four program, uh, Dr. Manon. This is phase three programs, uh, a phase three trial still going, um, data from phase three trial. The phase four trial is still ongoing. Would the sponsor like to uh, address specifically Dr. Manon's question about overall mortality? I think, I believe we understand the question is the overall mortality in study 303, which was presented as eight patients in placebo, nine patients in OCA 10, and 10 patients in OCA 25. But I'm, I'm not sure that that was the question or whether this was specifically regarding the either 
I, I apologize. I don't understand if the question was overall deaths uh, in which we saw no evidence for excess cardiovascular deaths, um, or if it was specific for hepatic concerns. This is Ruby again from the FDA. It's slide 190, 190. And then the death, the difference in deaths that we had was at, at our end because we included all the patients on study. That's the analysis we used. There were 17 deaths in the um, OCA 25 milligram treated patients across the whole program, which included the phase three trial, the Flint trial, and the, the 747209. And if you were to look at only 303 trial, there were 14 deaths. Um, in patients dosed with OCA 25 milligram compared to placebo, there were 10 deaths in that arm. Um, again, the cause of death it was difficult to ascertain, except that there were two patients who died because of acute on liver failure and in the, the whole program, and then one patient from trial 303 who died uh, in, uh, because of ACLF. Now that that's been clarified, thank you uh, by the agency. Would the sponsor like to respond to these specific data? Yes. So a majority, if not all, of the deaths that have been reported are in patients who were either in retrospect considered cirrhotic. So in particular, those patients from 209, which did enroll patients who had more advanced cirrhosis, um, or in uh, study 303, when we've looked at the non-invasive tests, or at the month 18 biopsies, where it was very clear that those patients had evidence of cirrhosis either on biopsy or at baseline non-invasive tests. And when we've looked specifically at those non-invasive tests, we actually found that they were more sensitive in detecting those patients with cirrhosis who we have recommended be contraindicated uh, both for lack of efficacy and for a potential increase. Um, once we get to Dilly, I would love the opportunity, if we could, to have Dr. Paul Watkins address some of the mechanistic questions that were raised, maybe more appropriate in the next question. But yes. Just yeah, perhaps during um, the yeah. second discussion, if a panel member wants to um, ask specifically about that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marr, you've been very patient. Oh, thank you, uh, Jackie Marr, San Francisco. Um, I'm trying very hard to keep my focus on the question at hand, which is really the strength of the available efficacy data with, in the absence of a consideration of toxicity. And I think in that context, we have to acknowledge that the applicant has actually met the appropriate criteria by the FDA that they have achieved a statistically significant improvement in fibrosis without a worsening of NASH in this patient population. I think where it becomes much more nuanced is how strong is, is this data? It has met statistical significance, but is that degree of statistical significance, <clears throat> excuse me, which we've um, sort of averaged at about 10%, enough to translate into biological efficacy over a longer term? And I, for one, uh, struggle to determine whether this degree of improvement is going to be sufficient to predict an overall clinical benefit over a longer period of time. I would uh, you know, love to hear whether the statisticians have a comment about this or whether other clinicians would like to comment on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cheng? Lynn Chang, uh, UCLA. Uh, I I agree with what Dr. Coffey said and Dr. Mar was alluding to. This uh, endpoint was pre-specified. It was in the guidance. The sponsor uh, addressed this endpoint as uh, in the trial, and they did meet the endpoint. So just based on meeting the efficacy data that was described, and you know. Um, required by the FDA was met. Now, the question is about predicting clinical benefit. I think the issue probably is, is this is a large group of individuals and there's, there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of comorbidity, there's other medications. And I'm sure what I would think what's gonna happen is that the, it will have the efficacy based on this histopathologic endpoint will predict clinical benefit in a subset of individuals. Uh, 
And I don't know who that subset is, but it likely will be a certain subset, but it will probably be very complex on who and all the factors that are, are involved in it. And that's, I think, the problem of trying to determine uh, the clinical outcome and also how are you going to use it in clinical practice, because we don't know that information. But I think it's definitely promising, and I am sure that there will be some patients with clinical benefit. Um, so that's just what I want to say about the efficacy data question. Thank you. Um, I see there are three more hands raised. Um, and uh, after that, I will, I'll attempt to summarize the, the, the group's uh, feelings about this efficacy question before moving on to the, the next discussion question. Dr. Saja. Mark Saja. I'd also like to agree with Dr. Meyer. I'm concerned with the degree of effect in terms of it only being 10%. I'm also bothered by the fact I think we have to consider what that 10% is based on, and that is a liver biopsy. And certainly a liver biopsy is a gold standard, and I think the applicant, applicant has done a tremendous job in uh, performing study 303. It's a beautifully performed study. But we have to take into account the fact that a liver biopsy is a very random test. So it's a very big organ, it's a very small piece, and there can be a lot of artifacts. So, for instance, someone had asked, why did some of the NASH patients improve? Well, maybe they didn't, uh, who were not treated, who weren't placebo. Maybe they didn't improve, but it was simply an artifact, again, of two different biopsies from two parts of the liver, which showed different uh, levels of disease. Uh, the second part of the problem with the liver biopsies is, is the interpretation of them. It's not, it's not easy. So I think we saw that in two instances, one with the consensus uh, re-evaluation of the histology, a number of biopsies changed. Suddenly there were some F0s and there were some F4s. So, so clearly, you know, disagreements, mistakes, whatever had been made in the initial assessment. And even in the consensus uh, evaluation, 50% of the time, the two pathologists did not agree on the staging of the fibrosis. So my point is not only is the number numerically low, but I think we also have to consider that there could be inherent artifacts to the total reliance on a liver biopsy. Hopefully they balance out in the two groups, but we have no way of knowing that. Thank you. Dr. Heller. Let's see if second time is a charm. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, great. So two things. The first is that I think three things. I think that the, the applicant did meet the endpoint that was laid out by the FDA. I agree with that. The second thing is that I think a comparison to hepatitis C in the early days of hepatitis C is not fair because those 5% that Dr. Hofnagel cured are not the same as at 11.1% here. These patients are not being cured. I think it's an important distinction. That leads straight into the last point. I'd like what worries me is sustainability. They admit that even if we accept everything being reliable in this very well executed study, do we know that this will be maintained over time? And if we look at bariatric surgery, to use the analogy in a different way, people gain weight again over time. So again, I worry about the long-term sustainability, and I worry about the lack of validation of NITS as a measure of disease progression on therapy. I understand Bovino. I was there. I understand the fact that you can make an Aubrey cutoff of five increase, but I don't know where the evidence is for that on treatment. So I'd like to see data that would kind of show that this is sustained, particularly as patients are not being cured. Thank you, Dr. Heller. Dr. Solga. Hi, it's, it's Steve Solga. I, I agree with the concerns raised by many members of the committee, but I, I, I do think it's, it's reasonable to um, return to one of sponsors' talking points from this morning. There were a lot of patients that did not meet the end point, but they did not worsen. Um, and sometimes stability uh, in a disease process is a meaningful victory in its own right. Um, and in no uncertain terms, it, it appears that people were more likely to progress to F4 when they were on placebo than when they were on treatment. Therefore, uh, I think that, that the advocacy signal uh, is present and, and it's something bigger than 10%. Thank you, Dr. Solga. So if I can attempt to summarize, it sounds like there's broad consensus among this advisory group that uh, this surrogate uh, 
histolo this histologic input as a surrogate endpoint um, is acceptable as, as FDA had previously outlined. And indeed, the sponsor met it. They did meet statistical significance. Um, and actually, if you look beyond their um, pre-specified analyses and you look in other ways, non-invasive biomarkers um, and non-worsening, um, or stability as a desirable outcome, um, they they made it there too. At the same time, there's a broad sense here that uh, this efficacy data is problematic and can't be looked at in a vacuum in light of loom looming safety concerns. Um, there remains uncertainty about how and to what degree this efficacy data will translate into clinically important outcomes. There remains uncertainty regarding pathophysiology even. Uh, they did not meet the other primary endpoint relating to a resolution or diminution of uh, steatohepatitis. And uh, what, what are the long-term implications of that? Will it be, as was asked, uh, a subset of individuals who uh, will uh, ultimately respond well. And the flip side of that is, will we one day identify a subset of individuals for whom this drug should not be given because of safety concerns? There's also concern about reliance on the biopsy because of its patchy nature, differences in inter-rater uh, uh, um, scoring, uh, and the fact that it does not correlate perfectly uh, with these clinically uh, important outcomes. So in light of these looming safety concerns, our enthusiasm for the efficacy data is tempered. With that, I suggest we move on to question two. I'll ask that we uh, project that question, and I'll read it aloud, first asking if there are any questions about the specific wording of that question, that discussion question. While we're waiting for it to be projected, I'm going to go ahead and read this question. Question two, discussion. Based on the data presented concerning cholestatic drug-induced liver injury, DILI, in OCA 25 milligram treated patients, discuss, A, whether periodic liver enzyme monitoring could adequately mitigate the risk of DILI, B, the frequency of such monitoring, and C, what stopping criteria should be developed to aid clinicians' decisions to discontinue treatment? I open this uh, before we go and open it uh, to discussion. Are there any co questions specifically about the wording of the question? If there are none, we will now open the question to discussion. As was the case for question one, uh, this is uh, open for any panel member. Uh, please use the raise hand function um, and uh, feel free to kick off discussion. Uh, if you have specific questions for either FDA or the sponsor, please address it to them. And uh, in that case, they'd be permitted to um, respond. So feel free to raise your hands and ask questions about any and all of uh, these items related to monitoring for safety. I see Dr. Rakella has his hand yes. raised. You know, I, I may be out of order in what I'm going to say, but the, the, the point made regarding the previous point, the, we discussed the previous question, is that there is a segment of patients that do not progress, and that would be also in line with a good response. That was the implication of the discussion we had. Do we have a comparison of the proportion of patients who stabilize and do not progress in the treatment group versus the control group? I, I don't recall to have seen that, the, if that data is there. I was hanging from the previous discussion that I, I'm asking now. I'm not sure if the sponsor agency has um, an answer to that question. The point was made by the applicant. Yeah, would the sponsor like to um, uh, address this question? The applicant, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
sorry, but waiting to make sure we were on. Uh, so yes, I think we did review that. Uh, Dr. Caposa reviewed that in his presentation on the proportion of subjects who showed no change on histology. And then he was able to show through the non-invasive tests that those patients who were on um, OCA 25 versus those on placebo had changes in fibro scan and in ALT. If we could have those slides and I'll have Dr. Caposa review those data for you. Thank you. If, if I could have the uh, slide from my core presentation on no change in fibrosis with the ALT and AST reductions. I, I, I think that is uh, the, uh, the question at hand is that patients who had no evidence of change in their fibrosis stage after month after after 18 months within that group when we looked at other markers like liver stiffness yeah slide 2 please and ALT we do see reductions in in liver stiffness in the OCA 25 milligram group despite having no change on histology after 18 months and and as well on the right you see that we see reductions in ALT on OCA 25 uh, again in patients with no change and in both cases uh, greater to to a greater degree than on placebo which suggests that these patients are experiencing some improvement, whether that be through liver stiffness or hepatocellular injury, and that over time with a, another data point, we would expect that these patients could actually achieve a fibrosis benefit. Thank you. And yeah, the, the question I have, uh, can you speculate why that's uh, not reflecting improvement of NAS, not for the activity score? Yes. Um, Dr. Sanyal will address that question for you, please. Uh, could I have slide one, please? So this goes to actually how the pathologists evaluate NASH. In the NASH Clinical Research Network, which has a dedicated committee of pathologists with arguably the most experienced NASH pathologists in the United States, we do not evaluate NASH in the way the FDA specifies. The FDA definition requires NASH resolution to have a ballooning score of zero. In a landmark study by Brunt, where they had a number of pathologists evaluate a bunch of uh, biopsies, they identified about several hundred, or I think thousand cells that they called ballooned, but there was only one cell that all of them agreed on. So there's tremendous variability. So the presence of NASH is really determined by an overall global assessment of the histology. Now, if you look at this slide on the left are the data from Flint. This is reviewed by the NASH CRN done completely independent of intercept. And you see a significant improvement in NASH resolution. And now it's defined differently. Now in study 303 in the original uh, assessment by histology, you see when the pathologist looked at it in the same way, which is a global assessment, there was a significant improvement in OCA 25 milligrams. Then we look on the right on the consensus method and we also ask them to give a global assessment. And then once again, there is a significant improvement. And you can see 23 and I can't read it. Is it 23 or 25? 25. Uh, yeah, I'm getting old. I can't see very well anymore. Uh, but anyways, but you can see they're virtually on top of each other. So, you know, we've been saying that there was no NASH in minute and we sort of blew off that it has no effect on disease activity. That is actually incorrect. It is scientifically and factually incorrect. Thank you, Dr. Sonny. Although it does seem that placebo is catching up in every subsequent uh, trial that placebo uh, response rates for NASH is also increasing. Dr. Floyd? Thank you. Yeah, I'll just comment on the, the question. Um, I'm not a hepatologist. I'm a general internist and drug safety scientist, and I have some familiarity with REMS programs. And I'll just say that I'm not convinced that based on what I saw from the trial, what I know about DILI, the long latency, the variability of presentation, that any kind of practicable monitoring could actually mitigate this risk. Um, I'll save my comments for what I think of the safety signals for the later questions. But if, if the FDA is even considering an approval with monitoring, I think you have to look at elements to assure safe use. And that's a, 
aspect of REMS that probably some advisors aren't familiar with, but I think anything that's kind of voluntary and not monitored closely is going to be wildly unsuccessful. And even with a registry, you know, with verification of monitoring, I still am doubtful that you would prevent all the dilly that, that could occur, but I just need to bring that up as a consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Dr. Asis. Yes, hi, uh, David Assis. Um, just building on the question by Dr. Rokella, as well as uh, what was just mentioned, both for safety, but also monitoring for improvement. This, the applicant brought up some data a few minutes ago on transient elastography. Can I just ask a question about the um, end of study analyses? Because this has been referred to a few times that there is more data to come. I have the uh, addendum here or the appendix to some of the data from the trial design for Generate. And is it correct that um, transient elastography will only be measured in a small subset of patients who um, complete the study? And if so, that would unfortunately represent a missed opportunity to look at the correlation between improvement, lack of improvement, or progression of transient elastography in some of the events that we're looking to avoid when it comes to safety, but also benefit. I have a question for the applicant in that regard. The sponsor has that uh, information. They can respond. We do have that information. Um, so we are conducting transient elastography. Are we on? Yes, we are conducting transient elastography or fiber scan at every site at which it is available. So we do have that um, as we shared many of the patients who had been identified as having liver injury were identified when we went back and looked at those baseline assessments uh, were identified as having more advanced disease by TE. Um, if I could have slide one, I can show you those data. These are blinded data, not by treatment group, but by looking at baseline uh, non-invasive tests. So as we said, we have been collecting those data. The study was begun in 2015, late 2015, early 2016, so quite a while ago. Um, and we have been adding those assessments as more has been learned about the non-invasive tests as Dr. Lumba walked through. But you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, transient elastography um, was successful in identifying those patients who were at increased risk. And even more importantly, the combination of FIB4, ELF, and TE, two of these three non-invasive invasive tests so that we have at least two for every patient um, was able to identify those patients who were identified as uh, in table 12 of the FDA's briefing book as having significant liver events. Um, so just to, to round that out uh, for our patient uh, risk mitigation, number one would be identification of the most appropriate patients by use of non-invasive tests which as you can see here and in the Dilly cases that we reviewed would have eliminated 11 of the 12 cases. Thank you. But just to clarify, some materials out there seem to suggest it's not in every patient. Is transient elastography being checked in every patient at the end of the study? It's in every, in every patient at which they have a fiber scan. Yes. So a majority of patients have TE. Thank you. Thank I you. see FDA has a response to this question as well. We had response to the prior question asked by Dr. Raquela. If you could please pull up slide number 155, please, from the FDA slide deck. Rebecca Hager, statistical team leader. Uh, just to orient to the slide, uh, we have results for some additional histology data. This is in the ITT histology population using the consensus method. So just to direct you to the table, look at the second half of results uh, with uh, results for steatosis, lobular inflammation, and hepatocellular ballooning. And if you look at the last column, that has the risk differences for OCA 25 milligrams uh, compared to placebo. Um, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Mehta to discuss those. So Dr. Mehta, before you go ahead, I just want to 
remind the panel, we're really supposed to be focusing on toxicity and safety monitoring, but I understand that you were asked this question. So what, why don't you wrap this up and then we'll, we'll um, pivot back to that. Sure, we just wanted to um, state over here that the difference in NAS score seems to be coming predominantly from steatosis. Uh, lobular inflammation and hepatocellular ballooning, the difference, this difference is very small. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could ask um, for uh, the AV um, uh, folks to call up slide 55 from the FDA deck, um, this really uh, is, you know, comes to the heart of the question about Dili. Um, this was that bar graph that um, was shown first by Dr. Hayashi and then Dr. Anania, and it's very striking. And it was shown early on, no one will accuse you of burying the lead. Um, these are extraordinary differences. Um, but after mulling this over and thinking about um, this dramatic um, gulf between OCA-25 and these other drugs, I, I, I came to remember that for these other drugs, they were being tested in people without pre-existing liver disease. And OCA specifically is being given to people who are at high risk for hepatic decompensation and, and have chronic liver disease. I guess what I would ask FDA to to comment on here is, you know, now that we're looking at a drug specifically for this indication, um, where um, the population uh, target population is more likely to develop any kind of liver injury and decompensation to begin with, should we be comparing this drug to drugs that were not used uh, in that kind of population? And should the threshold perhaps be different when considering Dili? I have to raise my hand. Or... Uh, this is Dr. Hayashi. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. You're asking us to basically have a different fatality tolerance for different baseline diseases. My answer would be I would have great reservations about that. Um, when those three drugs pulled from the market um, or had problems post-market, there was a fair amount of fanfare, and I don't think it mattered that, oh, they were diabetes patients or, oh, they were NASH patients. Um, I think the point is when you get these Dilly fatalities happening post-market, I think the impact, the, the underlying disease becomes, I think, less important uh, is my opinion. Um, and I don't think, well, I, the agency would, it would have a hard time adjusting fatality tolerance by different diseases across the board. And it's more about risk and benefit. If, you know, if there's great, great benefit, then, then the, the tolerance can be thought about, but, but not so much the underlying disease, no. Be my answer. Thanks. I don't know if um, Ruby has anything. Yeah, I, this is Ruby Mehta again. I do want to add that in a clinical trial, we had the placebo arm and the treatment arm. So we identified the differences at a population level first, and then we honed down at a and did a qualitative assessment, and we were able to identify these elevations or these fluctuations are not 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 uh, even the mild delivery were, were not just elevations. Uh, moderate to severe is, is a different story. Um, so it would be problematic if OC was approved because the physicians would have difficult time to distinguish between the fluctuations versus who is the patient who's progressing. And this is the very reason we want you to, we want the uh, AC committee to opine and we are seeking your advice on the cholestatic delay and the risks associated. And can we in the in the marketing, uh, in the post-marketing period, can we identify this? Thank you. Dr. Lee. Brian Lee, so to um, just try and focus on the question, the, the first one was whether in periodic liver enzyme monitoring can mitigate the risk of TILI. And I think the sponsor showed pretty compelling data that once they increased the frequency of monitoring and had very strict stopping rules, that they were able to significantly reduce the DILI events, and that 
when they were able to catch early events, withdrawal of the drug did lead to improvement in the cholestatic dilly. So I think the answer is yes. Dr. Hayashi um, proposed that two to three weeks monitoring would would be a proposal. I think that frequency would be very challenging in the post-marketing world, especially if we think that most patients will be on this drug for years, really. Um, Another stopping rule that's important is progression to cirrhosis, so F4 disease. I think the sponsor has really intimated that non-invasive testing would be the most reasonable approach from a feasibility standpoint. But I think that's very, um, uh, it, may, it may be early is what I would say. I don't think that there's sufficient data to support um, longitudinal use of NITs, particularly on intervention that is expected to affect both fibrosis and hepatitis, the discrimination of F3 versus F4. Um, and you know the sponsor did show themselves that the sensitivity is very low. So you could have many negative results and actually um, miss cases of progression to cirrhosis. I think that there would need to be some type of different um, stopping right is monitoring for cirrhosis, if that were the case. Thank you. Dr. Wilson. Yeah, Peter Wilson here. So I had the same question Benjamin Liebwall had about what is the fair comparator? So I'm wearing my epidemiology hat. In a Ron Sanyo's uh, New England Journal article, which was sent to us in advanced materials, in his figure two, death from many cause and hepatic decompensation events, you can start to get some sort of feeling for the event rates. I don't think there's a way to pull this up, but those of us who had the advanced materials, it's about for hepatic decompensation at four years. Uh, for the F3 level, it's about one in 100. For the F0 to 2, it's about one in 400. And then from death from any cause, F3, it's about the similar number of cases, but we don't know what they died from. And F0 to 2, it's 11 cases. F0 to 2, it's 14 cases. So it's not easy to get there, but these numbers are much higher for patients with 0 to 2 and F3, who you would think would represent the people who are in the trial. And this was the, the paper that was Prospective Study of Outcomes in Adults with NAFLD and it's based on 1,700 adults. So many of us have this uh, sent out to us ahead of time. And so they're much higher, exactly as you said, Dr. Lee Waller, they're much higher. And um, I think we have to think about zero to two and, and level three patients is not the same as the free living person, for instance, who might have been put on troglodyzone for diabetes management. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. I, I wanted to build on the comment that you made, um, Chair, because I think it's an important one, and I've struggled with the same thing. You know, in a vacuum, if this weren't a therapeutic for liver disease patients, you know, one or two dilly fatalities would be a non-starter. We wouldn't be discussing this in an advisory committee. And honestly, I can't think of a time the FDA has approved a drug in the last 20 years where there's been even a single fatal Dilly case. The the difference is that these are um, patients at high risk of cirrhosis and decompensated events. Um, you know, one thing I learned many years ago, actually from John Senior, when reviewing Dilly cases for diabetes drugs, is that it's very very hard to do causality assessments. I've tried to do them. FDA has done them in this study. The sponsor has, but there's still uncertainty. And the best tool we have is randomization and actually counting events. Um, I don't think we can actually weigh the magnitude, the absolute magnitude of the dilly risk until we look at the potential benefits in terms of clinical events. You know, are we seeing reductions in hospitalizations, variceal bleeds, you know, ascites requiring their um, therapeutic paracentesis? And until we have counts of that, I don't see how we can weigh this really uncertain estimate of dilly events, which are quite serious and can be fatal or lead to a transplant. And right now, I, I think we have to be conservative. I mean, if you're talking about millions of people with NASH who could go on this drug, 
one in a thousand could get severe dilly. I mean, you're talking about a new epidemic of liver disease as an adverse effect of a drug. So um, I'm even a little surprised at seeing this at advisory committee, but just thinking about how to weigh this drug versus others with liver signals, I don't see how we can do that until we see benefits in terms of tangible clinical events. If you're preventing 10 you know, cases of ascites and variceal bleeds for every 100 patients on this drug, and you have one dilly per thousand patients, sure, we can weigh that and say the benefits clearly outweigh the risks. But with histologic evidence as the evidence of benefit, I just, I don't see how you can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. Um, Ms. Hugik. Yes, thank you. So we're talking about risk and um, monitoring. And I think something that came up from Dr. Sawney this morning um, was related to the um, advanced uh, enhanced pharmaco co-vigilance proposals and the risk management and the piece that we haven't talked about today on consumer representatives. So I feel like I need to represent the voice of the patient um, is that that piece of it. So, you know, the faster things can be identified, the sooner that we can stop it. The, the patient plays a role in that. And I just want to keep that on people's minds. We didn't really talk at all about what that looks like for this, but I do think that, you know, whether it's a website or a patient assistant program, having those things in place so that if six to 8 million people start taking this drug and we, you know, we, we don't really know there's so much uncertainty. Um, I just wanted to put that out there so that we're thinking about it. Thank you. Um, we'll take two more uh, comments. Uh, first, it'll be Dr. Assis, and then it'll be uh, uh, Jennifer Schwartzman. David Assis from Yale. Um, specifically to the questions asked here, I do have concerns that periodic liver enzyme monitoring could adequately mitigate the risk of DILI, the latency. And I think we've known from PVC studies that there can be a, an effect of bile acid retention that I think can be very difficult to predict. I think it's we don't have enough data on the frequency of monitoring. And I think we also didn't hear enough um, because there just is no data about what type of stopping criteria regimen to um, come up with. And so I think those are concerns. And to the point about these patients having pre-existing disease as a hepatologist, if a patient has stage two fibrosis um, with NAFLD, um, that's very different from being on the verge of a liver transplant. And so I think our risk tolerance needs to be adjusted for the severity of what we're talking about. Um, and that I think has to be important. And we saw some events which did not occur in placebo. So that's another effect that needs to be um, kept in mind. Thank you. Ms. Schwartzat. Hi, Jennifer Schwartzat, and I'm the patient representative. I'm coming at it from a totally different perspective because I am the patient. I represent patients, um, and I um, was really impressed with those that spoke earlier. Um, I'm really struggling. I'm not a renegade. I'm not a major risk taker, so I'm struggling between the benefit and risk assessment. But it struck me when you put up the slide, the slide 55, that predicts the daily fatality rates. Um, they're concerning, for sure. Very concerning. But what are the predicted fatality rates for um, people who are not treated for NASH, who are not treated for the fibrosis? Uh, they've got to be way higher. So to me, if I, I'm lucky that I'm not in this predicament right now, but I could become that. Um, so for me, I would rather have the risk of a daily reaction, an adverse reaction, um, knowing that, you know, all the things that we have discussed could happen to me, um, versus, you know, dying from untreated, um, liver disease. Um, and when it comes right down to it, I have most of those things that are the adverse uh, events and I live a perfectly wonderful life with quality of life, with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease. I have mitochondrial disease. It affects your entire body, you know, so every organ system is affected, um, which is what also likely causes the NASH. So I can live with those factors. I can live with all those adverse events, but you can't live if you're dead. So you know, I, I'm really struggling with the, the benefit and risk, but I think we really need to think about that. 
Um, I also do think, and I, if I did take the drug myself, I would want very close monitoring. I would want them to find out if this is not the drug for me. And if I had to stop it, at least I tried. It would be something trying. And hopefully we'll get more medication soon that will be um, a better option. But at least this is an option. So I wanted to make sure that I stated this because um, to me, the benefit outweighs the risk. So, thank you. Thank you. For your perspective. Uh, if I can attempt to summarize um, the, the panel's uh, impressions, and I would say that there's far from unanimity, um, my, my attempt would say that um, the monitoring program that was set up does appear to mitigate um, in part risk of Dili and has been associated with a reduction in events, but does not entirely eliminate the concern that the panel has about safety. Um, particularly with regard to the question of frequency of monitoring, there's concern that what's suggested by the sponsor might not be adequate, particularly in light of the fact that Dili um, may occur lo a long way out from drug initiation. Um, and might and cholestatic liver injury may occur pretty rapidly after even one normal spot check uh, of liver enzymes uh, and bilirubin. With regard to the question of what would be a tolerable risk of DILI, the agency's approach is that DILI is DILI. And um, fatal DILI is something that is uh, uh, really a showstopper. And um, there was some... Um, of feeling among the advisory committee that perhaps in a drug for chronic liver disease, where um, those not exposed to drug are also at risk for severe liver related outcomes, um, maybe that should be a different consideration. At the same time, um, ultimately there was concern that given how common NASH is and the burden of disease, unleashing a, a medication that has a non-trivial risk of DILI, including even fatal DILI, can have public health implications. Um, there's uncertainty about whether non-invasive monitoring will be adequate to um, uh, identify those who progress to um, F4, to cirrhosis, in whom um, efficacy would no longer be applicable and whom there'd be substantial safety concerns. That would be my um, overall summary of, um, of this discussion question. What I would suggest now is that before we Apologies. Uh, this is Michelle Berry from the sponsor. Um, given that so much of the assumptions around DILI have been based on the assumptions that this is a classic small molecule DILI, and unfortunately, because we didn't receive the FDA slides until about 20 minutes before the presentations began this morning, we didn't have an opportunity for Dr. Paul Watkins to address what we do understand about liver injury related to this molecule. And we would appreciate a short opportunity for Dr. Watkins, five minutes, please, to just I would, explain. I, I would suggest that before the break, we give Dr. Watkins two minutes now to present, uh, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. If Dr. Watkins, you are uh, available and you uh, are able to present on that short time scale, I'd appreciate it. I am Paul Watkins. I'm a clinically trained hepatologist professor at University of North Carolina. Uh, with a very long-standing interest in mechanisms of drug-induced liver injury. I direct the Institute for Drug Safety Sciences there, which has been dedicated on finding mechanisms and understanding how that can predict uh, liver safety liability of new drug candidates and how to manage that liability when it exists. <clears throat> it's been brought up as this an idiosyncratic toxicity. That's what the Dillon Network um, has been doing for 20 years. And I have chaired or co-chaired the uh, steering committee and also chaired the genetics committee since the inception. And what we've learned is that um, idiosyncratic DILI, which is usually small molecules, but not entirely, generally involves an adaptive immune attack on the liver. That is, you know, cytotoxic T cells honing into hepatocytes and killing them or cholangiocytes and killing them. Um, these are, tend to occur after months on treatment, um, and uh, once you initiate the immune attack, uh, removing the drug doesn't necessarily make the injury go away. And in fact, about 20% of patients with idiosyncratic DILI still have evidence of ongoing liver injury at six months. The value of monitoring, you cannot predict which patients are going to get there, although genetic risk factors are slowly being defined. 
And actually, the value of liver chemistry modeling has, uh, mo you know, monitoring has never been really um, adequately uh, figured out in that case. Oka is different. Oka is a, is a lipophilic bile acid that, and, and as a class, is known to be directly toxic. So even in phase one human uh, volunteer studies, they saw as they increased the dose, they saw they saw toxicity. And it is eliminated in bile um, so that uh, it is possible to identify patients' uh, susceptibility factors. So obviously a stone in the biliary tree will prevent the elimination of OCA. And if you continue to take the medicine, it will go up. If you have cirrhosis progressed on to it, you have global liver dysfunction, the, uh, the values would go up. And also functional obstruction. In other words, situations in which... Um, bile production is reduced. And, you know, uh, staph sepsis was probably part of the mechanism for the patient with the, uh, that needed the transplant. The point is, it's not an idiosyncratic toxicity. Removing the drug at the earliest detection of a problem um, and allowing the, um, the liver exposure to go down below the threshold limit um, is an, a rational plan for uh, monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Um, uh, so uh, what I suggest we do now um, is that we take a 10 minute break. Panel members, please remember there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topic with anyone during the break. We will resume at um, 4.05 Eastern time. Dr. Lebo. an opportunity to respond before the break. So if we've not yet gone on break, um, and if FDA is interested, is the FDA interested in providing a 60-second um, response to Dr. Watkins? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, the point's well taken. It's, it's, a lot of dilies are partially idiosyncratic, but partially dose-related, and this one may be, have a fair factor of uh, dose-related. But I think it only strengthens the concern about um, the OCA concentration exposure going up, and you cannot predict a bile duct obstruction with a stone. And you cannot predict this patient occasionally passing a stone or sludge and you may never even know it. They may have some doll pain. But during that time, during that time, the OC exposure in the liver will probably go up. And therefore, your dilby risk will go up. So I take Dr. Watkins' point, but in a way, it only strengthens our concern that over a long period of time, all the construction can happen without any notice. And then dilby will happen right upon that, right on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayashi. And now, as promised, we'll take that um, break. We'll convene at 4.05 Eastern Time.
move on to the next question, which is a voting question. Dr. Jessica Su will provide the instructions for the voting. Hello, Dr. Lepwal. Um, thank you. Um, before we begin the vote, I just uh, wanted to relay a request from the sponsor to um, have another minute for a final statement. Um, again, up to you as your discretion as the chair. Um, I just received this, so did not have a chance to relay it to you um, uh, until this moment. Um, so sorry to put you on the spot. Um, why don't we give the sponsor 60 seconds, no more. Okay. Thank you very much. So very quickly, just wanted to reiterate that we're willing to limit the population to optimize benefit risk to those patients who are at highest risk for progression to cirrhosis and are happy to work with the agency to continue the stringent monitoring that we've shown we can implement successfully in PBC. As has been acknowledged, pup, uh, we have met twice the endpoint specified in FDA's guidance for accelerated approval for products at NASH and would carry forward to outcomes should we be granted accelerated approval. We've also stated publicly in the absence of accelerated approval, it is not clear how continuing the study to outcomes would be economically feasible for this small company. Thank you. Thank you. And now back to Dr. Sa. Thank you, Dr. Labois. Uh, this is Jessica Saad, uh, DFO speaking. Um, questions three and four are voting questions. Voting members will use the Zoom platform to submit their vote for this meeting. If you are not a voting member, you will be moved to a breakout room while we conduct the vote. After the chairperson has read the voting question into the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, we will announce that voting will begin. A voting window will appear where you can submit your vote. There will be no discussion during the voting session. You should select the radio button that is the round circular button in the window that corresponds to your vote. Please note that once you click the submit button, you will not be able to change your vote. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Please note there will be a momentary pause as we tally the vote results and return non-voting members into the voting room, into the meeting room, excuse me. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I will read the vote results from the screen into the record. Thereafter, the chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You should also address any subparts of the voting question, which includes the rationale for your vote. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? All right, I don't see any hands. Since there are no questions, I will hand it back to Dr. Lebwal and we can begin. As there are no further questions, we'll now begin voting on question three. Um, I'll read the vote question, uh, and then I'll ask if there are any questions about the wording. Given the available efficacy and safety data, do the benefits of OCA 25 milligrams outweigh the risks in NASH patients with stage two or three fibrosis? Are there any questions from the panel members about the wording of the question? Uh, Dr. Coffey. Yeah, my question is with the last part, the stage two or three uh, fibrosis, just um, in, in kind of getting clarity specifically for the risk aspect of it, because one of the key points in the FDA presentation was that there may be difficulties in ensuring that only stage two or three individuals are identified to get this. So I, I guess to, I'm just seeking clarity on when it says with stage two or three fibrosis, is that definitive stage two or three fibrosis or stage two or three fibrosis as it would be implemented here? Would the agency like to respond? Yes, this is Dr. Anania responding to you. Um, patients, with stage, patients with stage three or two fibrosis, Dr. Coffey, will be as they have presented today. Okay, thank you. Dr. Cheng? Yeah, um, and it's not really about the wording, but I, I have to say it's it, it's a little challenging to vote on this when we don't know what if if it does move forward, we don't know what the safety monitoring aspect is. And if 
what would be decided would be something that would be acceptable to the committee. I, I'm just having trouble with that because we don't know if it goes through what will happen. Do you know what I mean? Like if if there was a very good mitigation strategy that people felt comfortable with for the safety of the patients, then it may be a different um, tendency to vote versus not at all knowing what would happen. Uh, would the agency like to respond? Yes. Thank you for the question. So you have the you have the option of abstaining from the vote, first of all. Yes, no, or abstain. Uh, secondly, the question is written with both issues in mind. Uh, that's why you are here, right, that there's a benefit risk assessment. And so we are asking you as an expert to vote on the data that has been presented in both the efficacy data and the safety data and answer the question yes or no. But again, you can abstain if you'd like. Thank you. If there are no further questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we will now begin the voting on question three. We will now move non-voting participants to the breakout room.
ayes and two abstentions. Dr. Lebois. Thank you. We will now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. You may also concisely include the rationale for your vote. We'll start with Ms. Hugik. Joy McVeigh Hugik. I abstained. Um, I don't take lightly um, the, the serious unmet medical need, um, especially after hearing from so many passionate patients and family members this morning um, and being one myself. But at the same time, there's just, I feel there's too much uncertainty um, as it relates to safety concerns and lack of clarity when it comes to monitoring should this drug get approved. So I had to abstain. Dr. Marr. Jackie Marr, I voted no for a couple of reasons. Although I acknowledge that the uh, applicant has met the primary endpoint for efficacy, and I would like to be very optimistic that this will translate ultimately into clinical benefit. I remain concerned that a drug such as this will be able to be restricted to a prescription by only experts who are willing to take the necessary steps that are required to mitigate risk. And I also am concerned that the high prevalence of uh, biliary disease in this population is going to raise the bar for potential for risk of drug-induced liver injury, which could be both sudden and severe. Thank you. Dr. Coffey. I voted no. Um, although the efficacy data look promising, I think the risk benefit ratio and the challenges to mitigating the risk are just um, too substantial. And without uh, the clinical data, it, it's very difficult to put that in full context. Thank you. This is Benjamin Lebwal. Uh, I voted no. Um, this pivotal phase three study has a primary endpoint of death um, and other important outcomes, including a high MELD score, liver transplant, and decompensation. Um, right now, we're seeing numerically more deaths uh, in the OCA 25 milligram than placebo. Um, we have a promising um, outcome with regard to a surrogate endpoint, the degree to which that promising surrogate endpoint will ultimately uh, yield um, uh, benefits in terms of the primary endpoint of the study remains marred in uncertainty, uh, particularly regarding uh, the concerns re related to DILI. Um, uh, at this point, I do not believe that the benefits outweigh the risk. We're keeping in mind that this is a surrogate endpoint among people who are asymptomatic uh, at baseline. This is a serious disease. However, the bar needs to be quite high when considering that fact. Next is Dr. Floyd. I, I voted no. Um, for this drug, we have clear evidence of safety risks, uh, including for very serious safety concerns with DILI, but we have only evidence for potential efficacy on a surrogate. And it's impossible in my mind to ensure a uh, good risk benefit profile based on this surrogate endpoint data. And we need to see the full clinical outcomes. Thank you. Dr. Manon. Uh, I voted no. And for many of the same reasons, I was very unimpressed with the um, efficacy signal and coupled with some of the doubts about measures and how to mitigate risk uh, and coupled with the background potential dilly fatality, I just didn't think it was it was uh, ready for prime time yet. Dr. Saja. Mark Saja, I voted no. Uh, although I think the applicant met their endpoint, uh, I was concerned about the minority of patients that were positively affected by the drug. I was concerned about the inadequacies of the surrogate in that it may not reflect a clinical outcome. And I was convinced that there was good evidence of a number of uh, side effects. I'm concerned how those will be managed once this drug is released to the general population. And in particular, I was concerned about a lot of the side effects that we didn't talk about that much, but ones related to the metabolic syndrome, uh, particularly the effects on lipids uh, and glucose. 
Thank you. Ms. Schwartzot. I voted yes. This is Jennifer Schwartzot. Um, as a patient and a patient representative of my community, I want this option to be available, even if under limited use. I do have concerns. Um, OCA is definitely not perfect. There are many uncertainties. There are risks. Um, but even as a non-risk taker, um, the um, inherent risk of the disease itself um, is way scarier to me than the risk of the adverse events. So that was my thinking on that. I do feel that the company has been very responsible so far, and I encourage them to continue to do that and to limit um, the availability. Thank you. Dr. Wilson. Uh, yes, oh, the video, come on. It won't come on. So no video, Peter Wilson here. I voted no. Uh, I had uh, concerns about the fibrosis, the dilly, the gallbladder outcomes. And I wasn't so concerned about lipids and, uh, uh, and the glycemic, but I think that would involve increased care by experts in lipids and glycemic control, especially endocrinology. And that may be an unanticipated extra need uh, for such patients. Dr. Assis. David Assis, I voted no, largely for the reasons already stated. As a hepatologist who takes care of patients with NAFLD, it is a complex issue and it's painful to do not have therapies for patients. But given the question, as was stated, I think that the potential risks are outweigh the potential benefits. And the company, I should just add, did a laudable job in the um, studies thus far and did meet the endpoints. But I think if you were to upscale this much beyond what was done in PVC, there is a potential for risk and that risk uh, concerns me too much. Thank you. Dr. Solga. I don't embrace these drugs readily. I'm a very slow prescriber by nature. When I read the FDA briefing packet, I, I figured there was no way I would vote yes on this. Um, I guess I was just feeling oppositional today or something. At some point during the day, I, I felt like I, I, I flipped a bit, in, in part because um, of the lack of options. And, and you know, the analogy to, to, to glutazone, the thing is, is to glutazone had there are many, many ways to, 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 to manage diabetes, you know, and uh, there are many instances in the world. There isn't another way to, to, to manage this issue. And I think in liver clinic, a lot of what we do is, is really managing anxiety. You know, folks come in, they're, they're super wound up. Um, when I manage fatty liver, I, I tell people to encourage healthy lifestyles go for a walk, and, and I try to reduce their concern over this. Many of them have done their very, very best, um, and a small minority of patients, this drug might help, and they would sign up for the, the liver monitoring, and it would get done. So I, I, I guess I feel like ultimately what flipped me into the yes at the moment is that doing like individual patient agency is more important to me now than it used to be. Um, and, and maybe that's a COVID residue. Um, and, and so empowering folks to have the potential option is important. Um, but I do share the rest of the panel's concerns. Dr. Cheng. Yeah, I was struggling through this one, but just looking at safety and efficacy, I, I did feel that they met their endpoint that was pre-specified and listening to the patients and recognizing there aren't options, as was mentioned earlier, and that you can have progression and death from this disease. Uh, but I felt that the efficacy outweighed the safety probably in a select group of patients, but there are probably other patients where it's reversed. So that's where I struggled because I do think that efficacy could outweigh safety in some patients. The problem is, as someone mentioned before, there's uncertainty. I just struggled. That's why I gave it an abstain. Dr. Lee. So Brian Lee, I voted no. I thought that the sponsor addressed the high admit need and did meet their clinical endpoint. I still do think that the, you know, the surrogate is an important surrogate, but I thought that the magnitude of what they demonstrated was unimpressive. And I'm concerned that the predicted effect on clinical effects, events, sorry, would be attenuated. 
I was especially concerned about the risks and how they would translate to the post-marketing world with less monitoring and longer follow-up. And I thought that the risk mitigation strategies seemed impractical and inadequate in this post-marketing world. Dr. Heller. I've heard it not. I agree with what, a lot of what has been said. I agree that the applicant met the criteria for efficacy, modest or not, they met it. And my concerns also to all the risks mentioned, to the fact that they're asking for accelerated approval. This is not whether or not we approve. The, the option of continuing with the study is still there. Whether they do or not is up to them or their finances. And I think that in a controlled setting of a clinical trial, we'll get definitive answers to a lot of the questions we're answering, we're asking, and we would not get it easily any other way. Dr. Raquel. Oh, Dr. Raquel, you're muted. Uh, I, I voted no. I, although the, the applicant fulfilled in the trial the, one of the criteria of endpoint the, of if efficacy, but I will eagerly await the clinical outcome data and also a better definition of the incidence mechanism and clinical outcome of TILI associated with OCA. Dr. Hansberger. Sally Huntsberger, I voted no. Uh, for many of the reasons everyone else did, it, uh, given the safety concerns, the surrogate endpoint isn't quite strong enough to be able to outweigh the safety concerns. And so I think we have to get the, the clinical efficacy data to be able to understand how to use how to use the drug, and what populations it might benefit, and how you would actually monitor and select patients. So I think without that clinical efficacy data, you, you don't know how to use this drug or, or who it might benefit. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. And so to summarize, if I may, um, the majority did vote no. Um, the panel expressed laudatory words for the sponsor um, and acknowledged that they did meet uh, their primary endpoint. At the same time, those voting in the majority noted that there remains some uncertainty about the meaning ultimately of this surrogate endpoint and how it will translate to uh, clinical outcomes, particularly in light of some safety concerns that have come up. The minority of voters who voted for a yes uh, or abstained uh, noted that it would be helpful to have options um, in this area, particularly um, for subgroups who may benefit, and particularly in light of the great unmet need in this disease area. The broad consensus is that we do eagerly await uh, the full outcome data from the ongoing trial. And so with that, we'll now move to question four, also a voting question. I'll ask for it to be displayed. Uh, Dr. Lepwal, I apologize for interrupting. This is Jessica speaking, DFO. Um, just really quickly, I was informed before when I read the vote totals into the record that uh, the audio had, had partially cut off my statement. So um, just to ensure the public is aware, uh, the vote totals are as follows. There were two yeses, 12 noes, and two abstentions to question number three. Um, Thank you, Dr. Lovewell. And uh, we can wait for question four to um, be brought up for display as Dr. Lovewell has requested. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, if we can now display question four um, and I will read the question. Um, and after I read it, I'll ask if any panel members have any particular questions or comments about the wording of the question. So I'll start reading question four. Clinical outcome events in patients enrolled in trial 747-303 will continue to be captured to evaluate clinical benefit in support of a future application for traditional approval. At present, which of the following would you recommend? A, approval of OCA 25 milligrams at this time under the accelerated approval pathway based on efficacy data on a histopathologic surrogate and available clinical safety data, or B, defer approval until clinical outcome data from trial 747-303 are submitted and reviewed, at which time the traditional approval pathway could be considered. 
Are there any questions or comments from the panel about the wording of this question? Please use the raise hand function. If there are no further questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we'll now begin voting on question four. We will now move non-voting participants to the breakout room. Voting has closed and is now complete. The voting results will be displayed. There was one vote for A, 15 votes for B, and zero abstentions. Dr. Lebois? Thank you. We will now go down a list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote in the record. You may also concisely include the rationale for your vote. We'll start with Dr. Floyd. Sorry, uh, this is James Floyd. I voted no for the reasons I stated earlier. Thank you. Dr. No, I voted for B, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Just to clarify, Ms. Hujik. Yes, this is Joy McVeigh Hujik, consumer representative. Um, I voted to defer approval, um, again, it. it the unmet need and the lack of options weighs heavily on me. At the same time, it's just too hard to predict clinical benefit, the surrogate endpoint at this point. And I do want to state that I hope the sponsor will continue on and have the resource to bring this to the traditional approval process, because I do think once we have more data, we'll be able to lessen that uncertainty and um, hopefully make a better decision as a committee. Dr. Assis. David Assis, I voted to defer approval for traditional approval process. I think we've struggled with this question and the burden and the risks all day, but I think this also illustrates precisely the value of traditional approval processes for points in which we have this uncertainty. And I think this makes a strong case for traditional uh, methodology for a situation like this. Thank you. This is Benjamin Lebois. Um, I too uh, voted to defer approval. 
Um, one comment that really stuck with me from the open public hearing was that we need a medication for NASH. And I agree, the unmet need is real and growing, but given the real possibility that the primary endpoint, the clinically important endpoint uh, from this trial may not be met, the known safety signals that we're seeing, including effects on lipids, gallstones, possibly glycemic effects, the DILI issue, um, and in light of the relatively modest effect size of the surrogate outcome, I'm concerned that acting now may lead to a reversal down the road, which will not benefit the millions of Americans who are looking for our guidance in identifying safe and effective therapies. Perhaps OCA might turn out to be such a therapy, but I advise to wait. Dr. Marr. Jackie Marr, I also voted B. Dr. Levwell stated it very eloquently. I uh, have made my choice for many of the same reasons, so I will yield to the next voter. Dr. Lee. Brian Lee, I voted B. Um, really, I'm just concerned about potential harm. I think it's best to be prudent um, in this scenario. Dr. Coffey. Uh, Chris Coffey, I voted B as well, um, much for the same in the previous. I think given the risk benefit observed here, the clinical outcome data will be critical in making a more educated decision. Thank you. Dr. Manon. Uh, I voted B as well, again, for many of the reasons already stated, and I'm hoping uh, maybe they can roll in um, lack of progression as well as with uh, re reverse of uh, some of the fibrosis and things. Dr. Raquella. I think you, Dr. Level, said it very clearly. I endorse that statement. Ms. Schwartz. Up. I am the only one that voted for A, but I am the patient representative, so I come from a different perspective. This did very, uh, really weigh on me, though. I could not make up my mind back and forth. Um, but I kept thinking about the patients who are waiting for this, who are in trouble now, and how long it will take. So that was where my thinking came from. But I do see the benefit of further study. So that was my vote. Dr. Hunsberger. I voted B for the re reason stated that we just have to have the clinical outcome to understand the, the risks. Thank you. Dr. Cheng. Um, I voted B, defer approval. Um, I'm very open to having a risk mitigation strategy. I've used elocitron, different disease and other drugs, and uh, it, it seems to proceed well with close um, close guidance. But I, I think the issue that I had was uh, the members of the committee raised the issue that they weren't sure what the best way of uh, monitoring the patients and that you would have to do it frequently. And I thought that was going to be difficult to do in a large group of patients. So I felt that was a big challenge and that it was going to be more risk. So that's why I voted B. Dr. Heller. I voted B. Um, for all the reasons stated, and I would eagerly anticipate the results of the study and what the endpoints, if the endpoints are met, it would be very exciting for this huge unmet need. Dr. Solga. There's really nothing more to add. I'm really very interested to see if they're able to continue the study to see if the surrogate endpoint um, proves to show real benefit in a couple of years. I think a lot of this discussion is about whether or not the, the guidance provided in the 2018 documents is really useful, you know, or, or the one-point fibrosis is just inadequate. Dr. Wilson. Yeah, Peter Wilson, I also voted B to, to, to defer, and I share Dr. Chang's concerns that we really need the clinical data, and this may come down to some subgroups, and we need all those subgroups. We need, uh, we need the full outcomes. Thanks. Dr. Saja. Mark Saja. I also voted B uh, for the reasons I stated under question three. Uh, but I hope that further studies might uh, prove that this is, uh, therapy is a valid one for a very important disease. Thank you. 
And if I can um, summarize, I think many of the points raised um, sort of go back to uh, the other voting question. Um, but really, um, I, I get the sense from this panel that there uh, is an acknowledgement of, of a great unmet need and an acknowledgement that um, this surrogate outcome may indeed translate into um, patient important outcomes and, and their primary point ultimately. There was also um, great enthusiasm for seeing this full study in its entirety in terms of um, seeing that endpoint so that this um, uh, drug can potentially be considered once that happens. Before we adjourn, are there any last comments from the FDA? We would like to thank um, the advisory committee meeting, meeting uh, panel members and the members of the FDA, the applicant, and the members uh, online who have joined us for um, joining us today for the meeting. Thank you for a very fruitful discussion. The, we, we will take these points back and um, think how to proceed further. Thank you. And I would like to thank the FDA I'd like to thank Intercept Pharmaceuticals, the public, the open public hearing presenters, um, and this panel. Um, it really has been a privilege to uh, serve as your chair. Uh, we will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you.